were into the overpowered male protagonist going back in time, grinding his cheat cultivation system, and killing monsters with one punch, then you are in the right place. This is Kong, a broke loser. When humanity is invaded by monsters, people unlock skills and defend their lives against it. He uses magic skills like acceleration, explosion, mental attacks, and frost arrow. But despite fighting his backside off, he isn't strong enough. He even fails to protect his beloved and his best friend. The entire world population was wiped out. And he, the last survivor, gets stabbed by an S-rank demon. But a miraculous chance gives him cheat cultivation and also the power to go back in time. So, this time around, he vows to get his revenge on the demons. Inside a destroyed city, swarming with monsters, our main protagonist was nonchalantly walking, and even the monsters were afraid to attack him. As he continued walking, he finally found that stupid player whom he was searching for. Unfortunately, he was now turned into the monster's lunch. When the monsters were busy eating, they noticed someone standing behind them. However, our boy Kong was not even concerned about the monsters. In the next instant, the monster quickly charged at him. However, Kong did not move even a single inch from his place, and with a devilish look in his eye, he activated skill addition and multiplication, beheading all three monsters with a single swing. Then we see a giant wall, resembling the walls of attack on Titan. Our boy knocks on the door and is greeted by his best friend, hard mode player GM. After entering inside, Kong reports that the one he went out found in the city, but GM looking around did not find him. Our boy revealed that he was eaten by a wolf-like monster, which shocked his best friend GM. Jian was concerned that wolf-like monsters were very powerful, so we must send a team to deal with them. But our boy reveals he killed them all, and Jian was now relieved. So he asked how are you so powerful despite being from easy mode. Jian kept asking, but Kong did not bother, and they went back to the cafeteria to have some lunch. While they were enjoying the delicious potatoes, someone was already causing trouble outside. Both Jian and Kong were interrupted by this event. Turns out a hard mode player was going nuts outside. So GM asked for Kang's help once again to sort this mess out. Kang loved potatoes, so our boy was pissed that someone interrupted him while eating it, seeing everyone clinging to life desperately. The hot-headed guy could not believe that this is Earth. So to stop him, people started to call Kang for help. An older guy tried to stop the hothead explaining that this is indeed Earth, but in return, he received a knockout punch from the hothead. Even Kong did not like this behavior, while Jim told him to have fun. Now our boy steps in, telling the crazy hothead that he was indeed on Earth, but the arrogant guy was not having it. Kong realized that this guy had gone nuts after seeing the current reality of Earth after coming back from the labyrinth. As he wasn't listening, Kong told him to cut the crap and sent him a battle request. Knowing that our boy was from easy mode, the arrogant guy mocked him, saying how mere easy mode challenged me, a hard mode player. But Kong reiterated, are you gonna fight or just talk all day? In the next instant, the hothead was fuming, and the arrogant guy took his sword out. Then he charged his blade with powerful skills, ready to attack Kong. Using his maximum power, the arrogant guy went straight for the head. But our boy activated skill complete nullification of the first attack, taking zero damage. The arrogant guy was shocked that he could not believe his attack did zero damage. Then our boy Kong, like a badass, said, is that it? Are you done now? And Kong grabbed his sword in return and he threw a punch. The arrogant activated the skill sturdy, so the receiving damage was halved. As our boy only dealt mere 49 damage, the arrogant guy who was flinching before was now confused. But in the next instant, Kong activated the skill's attack addition and attack multiplication, attacked the hothead with just a tap. As a result, the hothead smashed into the ground, even breaking the floor in the process. Turns out he had received 9604 damage. So after our boy Kong knocked him back to his senses, he started to cry. When the world was peaceful, suddenly one day the sky split apart, and monsters spilled out like crazy from there. And humans were given a final choice, easy, normal, hard, and solo mode. And the players that entered the labyrinth after making a choice in difficulty could only return after clearing the labyrinth. And meanwhile, the earth was on the verge of ruins and began to be overwhelmed by monsters. But our boy said it out boldly, what else can we do? We must save the world. After that, Kong went back to eating his delicious potato. Then Jim noticed that another player had come back today while Kong had finished his potato. Turns out, it was Waifu San, who had returned after clearing the labyrinth. Our Waifu San was looking cute with her very healthy pair of watermelons. Later that day, our boy Kong was invited by Waifu San inside her chambers. While inside, Kong noticed all the artwork there, and like a naughty teacher in her chair, Waifu San was waiting for our boy Kong. So when Kong inquired why Waifu San summoned him, 
She replied that she heard you defeated a hard mode player today. She showed her system window, saying no matter how many times I hear it, I cannot believe how an easy mode player defeated a hard mode player. Her system window displayed her overpowered stats and also that she was currently scared. Looking at her system window, Kong asked her, are you trying to brag? Then Waifu San got up and asked our boy to show his stats. Compared to her stats, our boy had very low stats in comparison. She remarked, Oh, look at that, your stats are too cute. Our boy had extremely low stats because after you clear the labyrinth, all of your stats are fixed, and hard mode players easily have 10 times greater stats than our boy Kong but none of them could even scratch Kong due to his skills. Waifu San told our boy to hold still for a moment. She then activated all her skills, at maximum damage and attacked our boy. But Kang's skill, complete nullification of the first attack, activated, and the wall behind was destroyed in the process. Our Waifu San said she just wanted to check if the rumors were true. She then asked if you have more than 200 skills, right? To which Kong said, yeah, around 230. Our waifu San regretted that she should have explored the labyrinth like Kong to unlock all skills, and as she sat down, she told us that we might have been able to win if you were from solo mode. Since our Kong had low base stats, he could not properly utilize all his skills. Slightly pissed, our boy asked why are you bringing that up now? To his horror, waifu San revealed that the fourth is about to begin. In the first wave, humanity lost soul, and to everyone's shock, half of the hard mode players died in the second wave, and after the third wave, the entire human civilization was reduced to a city. Meanwhile, Kong asked Waifu San how many monsters will come in this wave, Waifu San replied, two S rank monsters, several hundred B rank and A rank monsters, and an apostle. Waifu San asked our boy to take care of two S rank monsters, while she will deal with the apostle and the rest of the monsters. Kong replied, are you crazy? Two S rank monsters alone? Do you want to send me to death or what? But Waifu San added, I need to fight the apostle, and you are the only one capable of fighting S rank monsters. Then our boy left Waifu San's chambers. Outside, everyone was freaking out as the fourth wave was about to begin. But Jim was dealing pretty well with this situation, as he had already expected death. They observed that even the hothead was traumatized from this news. Then a series of lightning broke out indicating the arrival of the monsters, and it had started, all kinds of monsters came pouring out from the crack. Back at the top of the wall, Jim thought that it was nuts, as Kong was to face two s rank monsters. Then without missing a beat, Kong activated Large Leap and jumped straight to the sky. While mid-air, he activated Complete Surveillance Skill, which helped him find the two s rank monsters, and then landed right between them. This time, Kong was not messing around as he said die you ugly monsters. Now we are about to witness the strongest player from the easy mode versus 2s rank monsters. The first monster was a defense type, having a ridiculous 148 million HP, while the other monster was a long range attacking type with above 1 million HP. So our boy decided to take on the octopus like monster first, but the monster created green lasers to counter attack Kong. However, Kong had intended to isolate the two monsters by forcibly initiating a battle with one of them. Then our boy activated addition, and the current attack was doubled. He also activated multiplication, the current attack was now squared. And then with a serious look, Kong engaged in a life and death battle with this S rank monster. After squaring his current attack twice, Kong dealt a staggering 92 million damage twice to the S rank monster, and after landing some additional hits, he defeated the S rank monster. But at this point, Kong was barely standing and already used all of his trump cards since he had no mana left. From now on, he could not use any skills, so his strategy was simple, dodge, attack, and repeat. So with his life on the line, he let out a loud battle cry, and little by little, our boy managed to bring down the S rank monster's HP from a million to around 100,000. After fighting for days, the monster was covered with wounds and blue blood. Finally, Kong became victorious against both S rank monsters, a system notification declared, gods of all the dimensions cannot hold in their astonishment at your feet. Fully injured, Kong limped his way towards Waifu San and his friend, but on arriving, he only saw nothing but his dead comrades who were defeated brutally. Now, he froze in a place, staring at his best friend's dead body. Jim lay there with his broken sword, resting in peace. Even our Waifu San could not survive against the Apostle, as she lay there lifeless. And in front of her, a hellish red aura started to conjure something. It was the Apostle that killed everyone, and it said, you will die soon. But our boy Kong was not having any of it, so with his last strength, he managed to stab the Apostle. Screaming as loudly as he could, he said, 
come at me, you son of a gun. However, our boy Kong stood no chance against the apostle and got violated instead. So, this is how it ends, he thought to himself, and a system alert showed. Your HP has reached zero, skill fortitude is automatically activated, you will be forcibly kept alive for one minute. Kong lay there helpless, as he was about to die in a minute, while the apostle changed its focus to waifu san as if it already knew our boy was about to die anyway. Damn it, Kong lay there hopeless. It would have been different if I had not chosen easy mode, then we could have survived. However, Kong thought there is no point in regretting as I am about to die anyway. But then he noticed something shiny that our waifu san was protecting with her life. So with his final breaths, our boy started to crawl towards waifu san. Little by little, he crawled his way forward. This totally pissed off the apostle, who shouted, stay where you are, human. But there was no stopping him as genius Kong activated the skill last chance. One skill may be used without any restriction. Then he said, time stop, and he activated the skill simple time stop. Time within a 100 meter radius has been stopped for 2 minutes. Finally, touching waifu san's hand, our boy used appraisal. The item our waifu san was protecting was Uroboros Bezor. It can turn back the time of one person, once. Even Kong was shocked as this item could actually turn back time. And when the duration of the time stop skill completed, our boy Kong bid farewell to the apostle, turning back the time. Then he saw his child self, afraid and weak, sitting in a corner. After getting daily beatings from his parents in his childhood, he thought he had no worth. This weakness inside him had led him to choose the easy mode, but this is not the case anymore. And after that, Kong wakes up in his old apartment. The regression was a success. He then checked his phone to see at what time he was sent back to. Turns out it was the last day of the year 2019, an hour before the new year. At this time, everyone was outside celebrating the new year. This was also the time when the Earth's downfall would begin. However, Kong was busy enjoying the taste of pizza as he was tired of eating only potatoes, and only two minutes left before monsters start ramping on earth once again. Then the fireworks started exploding, and everyone was happy, clearing the new year with their families. But this was the final moment of happiness for everyone on earth because at exactly 12 am, monsters started to invade earth from a split in the sky. The monsters were terrifying, only hard mode players could take on these monsters. Meanwhile, our boy was waiting for the system window to appear, as people were running for their lives. A system window appeared in front of all. It said, your world is going to be destroyed by the invaders. The weapons of your world will be of no use against them. But do not worry. A merciful being has shown pity on you. It has decided to give you all a chance. Select the one you wish to choose and enter the labyrinth. Clear it and gain power. So every person on earth was given four choices. Easy, normal, hard, and solo mode. This time around, our boy Kong decided to choose the most difficult solo mode. While in the easy mode, there is abundant food and rest areas that even frail and ordinary ones can clear. In normal mode, the food and rest areas are lacking, it is difficult to survive but you can clear it if you don't fall into despair. In the hard mode, where food and rest areas are almost non-existent, monsters will throw their lives just to kill you, unless you acquire some safety you will die a horrible death. Finally the solo mode. You will not meet anyone else that came from your world and only things you see are hostile monsters and NPCs. Our boy obviously chose the solo mode, and he is making his way inside. As soon as he entered, in the community window, there was already a post. Someone from solo mode had posted a message saying what is this. Our boy gave a good luck message to that player, and closed the system window, as there was no point in talking right now. In the next scene, we see our waifu San had told Khan not to mess with the gatekeeper in solo mode, else he will beat you up. This gatekeeper is casually sleeping on the floor right now. Our boy is slightly afraid of this gatekeeper, because this guy had a crazy aura which was even more powerful than waifu San's. The gatekeeper introduced himself as Brockman, the guardian that protects this place and also your guide. Then he says the one who failed his attempt becomes the gatekeeper, ironic isn't it? Now he says, your world is currently being destroyed by the invaders, and this is your opportunity to save the world. As he explains, he wonders why our boy is so calm in this situation, he should have been freaking out right now. First, he had thought beat up this guy and reveal the information, but Kong was not showing any response. He then explained that it was the labyrinth and you can call it a tower or whatever you want. There are a total of 100 floors and big changes occur every 10 floors. You will have to manage food and water by yourself and this is all. Our boy then asked is that really it? So the gatekeeper yawned, 
Do you want me to explain every floor in detail, or what? Kong did not ask any further questions because our waifu San had told us before that the gatekeeper will beat you up if you keep asking him more questions. Then the gatekeeper said. At least I will teach you the basics. He then took out his long spear from his inventory. Even Kong was amazed at his stance and the aura coming out from that spear. With a whoosh, he then attacked our boy without even giving him any warning whatsoever. But the spear had stopped centimeters before it hit our boy Kong. Then he withdrew his spear and without any explanation told Kong to take it. This gatekeeper gave a rusted sword to our boy which had plus one attack. Then Kong remarked just a rusted sword, gatekeeper was thrown off guard saying do you want a golden weapon or what the gatekeeper thought for a second which our boy noticed too asking what is it he replied it's nothing then he threw a worn wrist protector with plus one defense it can block at least a beast's bite all right that is all from me go inside quickly to which our boy replied yes thank you finally our boy was going inside the tower the gatekeeper thought something was off with that guy just now in his life he had seen all kinds of players who were called geniuses but no one was able to clear the labyrinth. But this guy just now, he was a bit different, a crazy genius perhaps. Finally, the gatekeeper remarked it will be good if he survives. In the next scene, the system window opened automatically. It said this tower was created by a great magician long ago and there is rumor a wish will be granted to anyone that clears the tower. In this tower, terrifying beings move silently and living beings die. Everything here exists to oppress you, but on clearing it, you can save your world, and after entering Kong was covering his face from the bright light, he had finally reached the first floor of the tower, and the main quest had now just started, so he was making his way down a narrow passage, as the first floor quest started. While chatting, Waifu San had told our boy that she had bought this black bracelet from the shop in solo mode, it gave her 50% damage reduction. She then said that if Kong were to buy enough items from that shop, he would surpass Waifu San in strength, but due to lack of sufficient gold, she was not able to buy more weapons from that shop. Then back to the present, our boy Kong is standing in front of that shop's door. Inside there is an old man with white hair holding his cigar. A system alert notified Kong, you have met the lost king, who is quite handsome not gonna lie. The handsome old man asked our boy what is your name? He answered, I am Kong and you are the shopkeeper? The old man rudely replied what if I am? Looking around, Kong said it's just that there is nothing in the shop, to which the old man responded brat, if I wanted to display all my items, the entirety of the floor would not be enough to hold it. Then he added, I don't have any intention of showing my children to you. Our boy came back with a quick-witted response a shopkeeper who does not sell items. Then why are you here? The old man slammed his desk saying do you think I am here because I want to be? I lost my kingdom because of this insanity and I am suffering here for nothing. He then added anyways I don't want to show you any of my children, but if you can show me what you are made of then that may change the story while pointing to another door. He said go and come back alive then I will show you my children. However, our boy was not pleased so he asked is that all I have to do? The old man gave a disdainful look at our boy saying, you are an odd one. Then Kong asked once again well, do I need to clear the tower for you to show me your equipment? The old man replied no it is not that. So with Kong bid farewell to the old man, the shopkeeper was thrown off guard. Usually people first entering are timid and afraid. Why is this guy so confident? But that old guy stretched saying well it should not matter since he won't come back alive. In the next scene, Kong has already made his way inside, and a monster with glowing red eyes was sizing him up from the dark. This monster was a giant rat, like the ones you see on New York tunnels, but fast. In the next instant, the giant rat charged at our boy with its quick speed, straight up biting Kang's legs and dealing 10 damage. Even our boy was caught off guard with its speed. Even in the easy mode, a group of players was needed to defeat a single giant rat, so the big rat was easily able to dodge Kang's attacks. It stepped back and glared at our boy from a distance. In the past, the strategy to defeat a big rat was to tire it out and kill it with a group attack. But looking at his current stats, defeating the big rat seemed next to impossible. Even our waifu San had run away when she first encountered this big rat, because the big rats were notorious for finishing off players in the solo mode. This was the reason why the old man was so confident. Our boy smirked, realizing that, among the players who passed the first floor in solo mode, no one was able to defeat the big rat. So, without hesitation, Kong tried to slay the big rat, but it was fast, and easily dodged all the attacks. Then like a madman he tried to finish it off within one blow, but with its quick reflexes, the big rat barely survived. Since Kong is slower than the big rat, 
He tried to attack it by predicting its movement. The big rat was sweating balls, afraid of our boy. Kong then closely observed how the rat was going to move next. He noticed that it contracted the leg muscles and inflated its chest before moving. This time around our boy was very close to landing a hit but missed it. The big rat was now terrified as one mistake would mean game finish for it. Then Kong noticed that it cannot jump really high, so it might aim for the bracelet that he was wearing. Then the big rat jumped at our boy, but Kong managed to block it with his bracelet. Our boy finally got the hold of the big rat, it was a checkmate. Then he smashed the big rat on the floor, and stabbed it non-stop. While Kong went back to the shop, the old man was still looking down on him, but what he just saw left him completely speechless. Our boy had brought the big rat meat saying I have returned old man. From the community board, we found out that this player from solo mode was scolded by the shopkeeper. Even Waifu-san added, why does a shopkeeper act like this? It was so rude. Our waifu was so pissed that she wanted to stab the shopkeeper with a sword, but she could not do that because she would get beat up instead. However, in Kang's case, the old shopkeeper was surprised as he said, you survived? Our boy casually replied, did you want me to die or what? Then he placed the big rat leather and the meat on the shopkeeper's table. Shocked, the old man remarked, you killed one, not even managed to run away but killed? The old shopkeeper noticed how neatly the rat was killed without creating a mess, and all this was done by a newbie who just entered the tower. Since Kong met the requirements of the old shopkeeper, he agreed to open the shop for our boy. Then the old man asked, what do you want? Our boy Kong replied with a shield. The old man asked, why would you need a big tower shield of all things? Kong replied that he was just thinking of crushing rats with them. The old shopkeeper graciously replied, good answer, and shouted in a loud voice, golden door. Even our boy was surprised at the spectacle. He took out a bulky tower shield and said, what about this one? And then gave it directly to Kong. He currently had 243 gold, but the shield cost 500 gold, so he thought he would come later. As he was leaving, the old shopkeeper told him to wait, where are you leaving? Then the old man threw the shield at him, saying, don't worry about the gold, it's on me this time. The shopkeeper then took out potions as he had around 250 gold coins. The table was now filled with all kinds of potions and equipment. Looking at him, the shopkeeper added, don't make a fuss when I'm trying to be nice. Can I do you a favor? The shopkeeper then told him to think of it as an investment. There were all the items that our boy could currently buy. First, he looked at the health recovery potion that restored 50% HP. The potions were an essential tool that one needed to clear the tower, but this is not what he needed this time. From the knowledge of the past, he knew that the potions and elixirs were needed on the upper floors and not on the lower floors. And this time around, his eyes caught some bow and arrows at the back. Since he definitely needed a way to attack from a distance, with a bow and arrow, that should be quite easy. Then he took out all the golden coins from his pouch and said, I want that bow and arrow. The old shopkeeper was fully turned on from his decision, even blushing right now. Looking at the excitement of the old shopkeeper, even Kong wondered seriously what the hell was going on. Then the shopkeeper warned him that in the tower, your health will not recover. The shopkeeper revealed that there is something called the spring of life, where you can recover your health and you can use it an infinite number of times as long as you do not leave the said floor. He was surprised when the old shopkeeper even marked the location on his map. Waifu-san was also told about the location of the Spring of Life, but she was insulted a bunch of times while doing so, and the shopkeeper told her nasty things as well. He pondered, so what changed the shopkeeper's behavior? A difference in their methods? Waifu-san could not kill the big rat and ran away, but he did not run. He killed it and came back. He thought that maybe this difference changed his attitude towards me. Meanwhile, he had already defeated yet another big rat, and as a result, his interception increase skill was activated. Back when he killed the first giant rat, he was bombarded with system alerts. Aside from all the basic skills, he even had skills that he earned on 20 and 40 floors on the easy mode. He did not even think that he could have obtained these skills on the first floor. Then he noticed the soul skill, interception skill at 100% proficiency. His soul had experienced a higher plane of existence. Every time his higher dimension soul won, it would steal opponent's power. This is the skill he had unlocked when fighting with s rank monsters. Then he remembered that in the past when he escaped the tower, he was able to learn this skill, but it was sealed back when he fought the s rank monsters. That time, after defeating both s rank monsters, this skill was sealed, but perhaps it increased as he went back inside the tower. He realized that this was a skill that he kept with him even after time was turned back. So in the next scene and according to the mark on his map, 
he went toward the spring of life, but on his way, a big rat had been waiting for him all along, another big rat, he thought that it was common for a big rat to appear around the corridor, then, the system alert notified him that he was in a difficult situation because he was surrounded by the big rats, as he was surrounded by the speedy giant rats, the two rats from behind him started showing a form of aggression, but he was not afraid, and he prepared himself for battle, now the big rat from the front started to charge at him, somewhat easily, he managed to deflect this little monster back, meanwhile, the two rats were already closing in on him from behind, as a result of fighting bravely in a difficult situation, he unlocked the skill Unshakable Mind, then he managed to squash both of the rats on the wall with his shield, eliminating the duo with a single attack, the only remaining rat now started to shiver in fear, finding itself alone, the big rat in a fight or flee situation decided to attack, charging towards its death with no hesitation, he managed to kill it with the pointy part of his shield, then in the next scene, he opened the door that led to a pleasant environment, as he went inside, a system alert notified him that he had entered the resting area of the tower, your enemies cannot enter here, and the peacefulness in this place makes you lazy, he also got the first discovery bonus that increased his intelligence and mana by two, most of the areas of the tower contain monsters, the exceptions are the shop and this spring, a type of safe zone, after drinking the water from the spring, he recovered to his best condition so he decided to rest here, after resting for the day, he opened his system window to see if something is up right now, then he started to browse through the community board, the red vest guy was asking in the community board if he was supposed to enter this tower, while the anxious girl posted, does anyone want to clear floor 1 with me, similarly, a bald guy was asking, does anyone know what the first monster is, as he had thought, most of the messages are by solo players, people from other modes can meet and talk to each other, but solo players can only communicate through the community board, then he started to browse through his community board, he smiled reading the message posted by our waifu san, she was asking how she was supposed to do this, waifu san was the strongest player in his previous life, and even she was confused at the start like this, he then thought about her status window back then, she might have been a scaredy cat who hid her true nature until the very end, while considering everything there, he decided to write something from his system window, then we see that our waifu san was shocked by something in the community, the red vest guy was also surprised, this was because our boy kong had posted solo mode, floor 1 clear method in this community board, then he closed his system window, wondering how everyone would react, among 10,000 people who entered solo mode in the past, only waifu san was the single survivor from the solo mode, summoning a sword, he said, now let's get started, then he took out the big rat meat, looked at it for a second to think if he could eat it or not, then he ate the uncooked raw meat in one go, he kept on chewing it even if it tasted disgusting, then the system alert warned him, you have food poisoning, the food poisoning decreases your HP for 2 days, and if you don't eat cure potions or health potion, you will die, it was a nightmare for beginners, but after drinking from the spring, he returned to the best condition, once again, he took a bite out of the meat of the monster's balls, this time around, nothing happened to him, then again, he took another big bite and was affected with food poisoning again, and drank the spring water once again, he was now starting to get full, then the system alert chimed in, it said, you have suffered through so many diseases that a resistance has formed, you have obtained the continuous conditional activation skill diseases resistance, so from now on, he could just eat monster meat without worrying about food poison because of this disease resistance skill, then to obtain another skill, he started to go inside the spring, at this point, he was about waist deep into the water, and now he was completely inside the water, while holding his breath, he dived balls deep inside the water, a system alert then warned him, you are unable to breathe right now, as he was about to suffocate, he remembered this was the most painful way to pass away, then, after going through a near death situation inside the water, he obtained a skill on breath and line of death in return, what he just did was no joke, he was drenched with the holy water when he looked at his new skill, the skill on breath allowed him to hold his breath for a long time, currently, it was about twice his normal time, he also noticed the other skill he unlocked, called line of breath, surprisingly this skill was already at 54% proficiency and it can detect when he was close to death, he realized that this skill had the same proficiency as his past self, maybe he inherited all his past life skills, but that was not the case, so he remarked, I don't know why this is, since unexplainable things happen all the time in the tower, 
he did not want to think about each and every detail. Then he summoned his sword from his inventory, because there were more skills, which were yet to be unlocked now. The guy with the red vest was thinking Kong is just insane, so he asked if this was actually the correct method. Our boy Kong responded saying, high risk, high reward. Haven't you heard that before? The red armored guy was twitching reading this response. He was now frustrated, yelling, how am I supposed to do this? But Waifu San consoled the red vest guy, saying, you are not the weird one, and beside that weirdo, no one else was able to get the skill. In the next scene, he activated the skill on breath and started performing combinations. By swinging his sword, he was trying to stack this skill with a new scenario to unlock a brand new skill. The ability to endure for twice as long while in an unbreathing state was obviously limited to when you are completely still. So by attacking multiple times in an unbreathing state, he earned the special active skill unbreathing attack. Another system alert informed him that he was able to learn more than 10 skills, earning him the title of skill player. Then looking at his sword, he remarked, not bad. Just like predicting the movements of big rats, he could predict the movement of humans also by changing the tempo. Unbreathing attack is a skill that would let him freely change the tempo. Then he looked at the system window to check his current stats. His current agility was 21, which was already faster than Waifu San's 14 when she cleared the floor one in the past life. Now he had the idea to create his skills first. Main skills were usually worth more than 10 basic skills and were able to overcome large stats differences. For example, skills like addition, multiplication, attack nullification, and time stop were considered main skills. And having just one main skill would give you an overwhelming advantage over your opponent. So that is why the methods to earn them are peculiar, like complete surveillance could only be obtained after evolving detection skill three or more times. Meanwhile, a big rat had already appeared and it quickly charged at our boy Kong. It was even able to bite his leg in the process, but for some reason, he let the rat bite his leg. This resulted in a considerable drop in his HP. He was bombarded with continuous damage notifications. As the big rat continued feasting, the system alert warned he was on the brink of death. But with a serious look, he waited, saying a little bit more. And when he was in danger of dying, he immediately tried to smash the big rat with his shield. His line of death and calm mind skills proficiency had similarly risen. The rat once again charged at his foot. However, it was blocked by his shield. And finally, he had earned a special active skill block. It was actually good, but not the one he was looking for. And while in the danger of dying, he continued to fight the big rat. Then we go in for a quick flashback about the skill endure. This skill nullifies damage that would result in death and all damage taken afterward for a set period of time. Nobody in the past had obtained this skill beside him. Even his best friend and waifu San were curious how in the world he managed to obtain the skill endure. The ways of learning skills within the tower were simple and already set. You can receive them from someone else, or if you achieve something others could not, you are awarded a matching skill. And finally, you can try to reproduce a similar effect to the skill. The fight with the big rat was still going on in the present with Kang's HP on the verge of dying. He then reveals to us that, in order to unlock the skill endure, he would have to nullify an attack that would lead to death. Then he closely observed the big rat that was about to kill him. All this time, he was just blocking all the attacks that would lead to his death. And by using his shield, he kills the big rat and the system alert confirms this, that by blocking multiple attacks that could have led to death, he had earned the continuous activation skill endure. He had finally managed to learn a main skill, while the big rat was screaming on the verge of death. This was a skill that could save your life, so it would be a waste not to do it because you were scared. While he had told this method to earn the skill endure to his waifu and bestu, they called him a crazy genius, as this kind of response was common. But this is the tower, if you don't risk your life, then you will get nothing. Then he drank the water from the spring to recover his HP wondering if there were another skill to learn right now. He opened his system window, while thinking, he concluded that there should be a couple of skills to learn as he previously had over 200 skills. Suddenly, an old man shouts, so there was a prior visitor. He had encountered a person searching for God. Our boy Kong immediately summoned his shield, since the monster could not enter the safe zone. This guy must be an NPC. The old man approached him fearlessly, as he took his defensive position. This old guy asked him if he was an adventurer, he replied affirmatively, that is correct. Waifu San previously had said that while resting on the floor one of solo mode, some night grandpa had appeared. He was already panicking as he could not remember correctly what Waifu San had said. In the very next instant, 
the grandpa knight was already about to smash him, while right in front of his face, the knight told him to try and block this, the attack was so powerful that it was like facing a truck head on, he could not believe the sheer strength of this incoming blow. The line of death has been triggered. Consequently, Kong blocks the punch with his shield. The impact he feels is tremendous. Following this, a new skill is unlocked, and his power increases by one. In a fraction of a second, Kong spots another punch approaching him. Realizing the power and skill difference between him and the men, he knows he can't avoid the punch. The punch is so strong that Kong ends up flying and crashing into a wall. While it would have caused 100,000 damage, his defense reduces it to 30,000. Kong is shocked by the old man's power. Furthermore, he realizes that not only monsters, gatekeepers, and other solo players are absolute monsters in terms of power. Impressed by Kang's skill, the old man praises him, mentioning that he was worried about Kang's abilities. Kong, determined, replies, I can't just get beaten up by you. The old man adds, I didn't want to kill you, so it was not a lethal attack. He continues by saying, you have the ability to endure the attack even if I attacked you seriously, so there should be no problem. He commends Kang's skill when stepping into the line of death, calling it incredible. That was actually a good skill. To be honest, I was worried you were weak, but you are actually good. You have overflowing passing skill. The old man asks, what's your name? Kong replies, Kong Tae Sam. The old man says, it's an honor to meet you. I am the one who seeks God, they call me Ainsar. Li Tae was looked down upon, by this man. Puzzled, Kong asks, why are you attacking me suddenly, are you a bully? The old man replies, I may be a holy knight, but I don't bully anyone. He adds, I attack people to evaluate them, to see if they can survive and if I should acknowledge them. He continues, Kong, you have passed the evaluation. Curious, Kong asks, what kind of god are you looking for? Intriguingly, there are many gods in the labyrinth. Various gods test the players and grant them wishes. However, since gods only exist in solo mode, most were not interested. But soon, Li discovered how terrible gods were. The old man replies, the more people know about our gods, the better. He explains, the god I serve is the god of love, called Lebaninov. She is very kind and used to bond with those in love. Sadly, there was no goddess loved more than her, but that world was destroyed, and I am the only one who still remembers her. Kong asks, did you come here to find her? The old man replies, yes. Li has mentioned her to Kong. Furthermore, she was badly injured and devastated when Li found her. Kong ponders, should I tell the truth or let it be for now? The old man inquires, do you have to hurry down this place? Kong responds, no, not really. My purpose is not to clear it but to become the strongest. Seizing the opportunity, the old man offers to teach him Lebaninov's skill. Kong accepts it and asks, what's the price? Curious, Kong asks, is this an apology? The old man replies, not exactly, but I offer it because you deserve it and thought you would need it in the future. Realizing that obtaining a new skill with one attack is much easier than risking his life for a single skill, the old man says, that's a relief, I almost made myself an enemy of God. Let's get started, the old man says, hit me with your shield now. In the labyrinth, there are numerous skills, but the basic ones can be acquired effortlessly with a single motion. For example, if you wield a sword, you gain swordsmanship, if you use a shield, you acquire shield proficiency, and if you opt for a spear, you obtain spear mastery. The moment you wield these weapons, you gain the respective basic skill. The higher your proficiency, the greater your knowledge and utilization of the weapon. Virtually all players possess these basic skills. Then, there's a skill that amalgamates all these basic skills. While it may not sound flashy, it's arguably the best. An old man referred to it as the Iraq weapon art, and even the goddess personally praised me for it. This is the skill I'm going to teach you. Kong took a deep breath but underestimated its value. The old man asked, do you think it's useless? Kong replied, yes, because nothing changes when skills are combined. It might be different if it were a primary skill, but due to a system error, combining weapon-based skills seems meaningless. The old man then asked, how much bonus attack power do you have? Kong replied, just one. The old man smiled and said, how cute. You should have four in total. Kong added, I have my basic attack power, so that should be right. The old man underestimated and said, attack me with all your might. The old man, with his hand on his head, complained, did you really have to hit me in the head? Kong replied, my bad, lol. He then instructed Kong to hit with his fist, resulting in two damage. The old man asked, do you get my point? 
Kong inquired, so, what you're saying is that damage dealt varies according to the weapon. The old man replied, yes, that's why adventurers use weapons. If you wear a gallant with 50 attack power and a sword with 20 at the same time. If you attack with a sword, you'll deal 20 damage, whereas with gallant, you can deal 50. There's no way you can deal the combined damage of 70. Kong remarked, isn't it obvious? If it's like that, why wouldn't everyone carry multiple weapons? The old man explained, that's why we only focus on one primary weapon to improve its proficiency. Isn't it inconvenient to use only one weapon in battle? That's just absurd. In a battle, your life is on the line, and you should use every part of your body. Kong asked, but when that happens, due to the system error, you end up dealing low damage, right? The old man confirmed, yes, but our church, which serves the goddess Labinovov, doesn't like that. My body is my weapon, and my weapon is my body. After years of research, I finally developed the Iraq weapon art. Not only does it allow you to combine basic skills, but it also combines the total attack power of your equipment. Kong was shocked. The old man continued, in other words, if you have a sword with 20 attack and gallant with 50 attack power, you'll deal 70 damage no matter where or what you hit. Kong asked, what about the range of application? The old man explained, it doesn't just apply to weapons but to all parts of your body, whether you hit with your hand, bump with your shoulder, or kick. Doesn't this mean that your whole body becomes your weapon? With this art, you can use all the equipment that was previously considered useless. It might not seem like much, but as you progress through the labyrinth and obtain higher grade equipment, Kong realized the tremendous potential of this skill. It can even be considered a primary skill, the old man stated. I understand how patient you are, but this is something an ordinary adventurer can't acquire even if they work their whole life. Are you interested? The old man asked. Kong replied, yes, of course. The old man instructed Kong to relax his body. Like other skills, this one was created by himself, making it easy to pass down. With his proficiency at 100%, Kong could receive it without any issues. The basic skill was now combined with the Iraq weapon art. Basic skill, swordsmanship combined with Iraq weapon art. Kong felt various techniques and information rushing into his brain. He had never thought he could acquire a skill this easily. You received the skill from the creator of the Iraq weapon art. You have acquired the highest level skill, Iraq weapon art. Highest level skill, Iraq weapon art. Proficiency, 1%. It was a skill that dealt with both weapons and the body. It can even be considered a main skill. It deals with both weapons and the body. It is still in an immature state, and there's likely to be a loss in the transmission of power. The old man gives Kong a ring and tells him to train every day for better results. Faded ring. Attack power plus one. It looks like it's worth a lot and has been worn for a long time. Kong says with gratitude, it's more than enough. In the past, I would have discarded it, but it's worth much more now. The old man says, I have given you everything I could. But since you can't go to the third floor right now, it's much of the same path. Wanna try sparring with me and test your skills? Kong accepts. They start sparring. In the labyrinth, all actions are evaluated. If you look carefully at any seemingly useless room and find something, your direction proficiency increases. If you constantly block attacks, your shield proficiency increases. That's why fighting against the strong is meaningful in itself. Kong, did we fight for two whole days? Passive skill, continuous battle. Proficiency, 3%. A battle can last a long time, and you won't get tired easily. Thanks to this skill, Kong could fight an S-class monster for two days. He had given up on solo mode because he could only acquire this skill by fighting other players. The old man commends Kong, for a first floor player, you possess unbelievable skill and sense. As I expected, my eyes don't deceive me. The old man continues, then promise me two things. Since you have learned Iraq weapon art, you can teach it to anyone, but if they are worthless, then never teach them. If you violate this, then I'll find and deal with you myself. The second one is, if you discover anything about goddess Labinovov, let me know but I doubt we can meet each other again. The old man says, I'm not expecting it either, but let's hope for a miracle. For Einzhar to succeed in finding the goddess, either she would not have died, or she would have died with Einzhar. In other words, unless a big variable occurs, Labinovov must be killed by someone before he finds her. Kong can't decide whether to tell him about the goddess or not, yet he asks, do you want to know the location of the goddess? The old man replies, yes. Kong says, I know where she is. The old man is baffled. Meanwhile, Kong reveals he knows where goddess Lebaninov is. The old man warns him to stop joking with him. 
Even after wandering around for eons, the old man could not find a trace of the goddess. Nevertheless, the old man could not believe that a mere first floor player could know the whereabouts of the goddess. Kong had already anticipated this kind of response from the old man, so he said, Old man, you can trust me. There's an item related to the labyrinth in my world. With powerful hand gestures, the old man shouts, Nonsense. There's no such thing as a map for the labyrinth. However, Kong calmly replies, A map for the entire labyrinth does not exist, but a map to a specific entity does exist. The old man could not hold back his tears anymore. There was hope that he could finally meet his beloved goddess once again. With a sincere look on his face, Kong reveals, my lineage has the information about it, and we had already deciphered the location of the gods. Kong managed to hide his secret from the old man and told him the location of the goddess, the 78th floor in the Omniversal Library, the 24th secret room. The old man is stunned, his eyes filled with tears of hope as he realizes the Omniversal Library is the place he has not thoroughly explored. Excited, the old man grabs our boy Kong, saying that he was truly grateful and had never felt this indebted to someone before. Kong notices the old man is squeezing a little too hard, and his shoulders start to hurt. The old man apologizes. It seems he lost control over his emotions for a moment. Kong asks the old man if he was going to leave right away. But the old man says first he needs to prepare as the 78th floor is a dangerous place. The old man thanks our boy Kong from the bottom of his heart and offers him his dusky ring, which increases health by plus 20. The ring is given to priests in certain sects, and there's only one left in existence. Kong realizes that to get an item of this quality, you would need to be on at least the 30th floor on easy mode. Yet, he is getting it on the first floor in solo mode. The old man adds, normally, I would not have considered giving it to a first floor adventurer. However, I see you as an exceptional one. The old man bids farewell and heads towards the divine being with a kind of a scary look on his face. Can he find the goddess? If he does find her, would she be alive, or is the goddess already dead? Regardless, it will be a long time before I meet the old man again. Kong is killing monsters on the deist floor, his agility has now reached 25, and even the big rat is easy to deal with. System notification, you have triggered soul boost, the gap between your soul and your opponent is too large. You have gained nothing from the opponent. As Kong takes his foot off the rat, he realizes that he cannot gain more stats from the first floor. He would now move to the second floor. But before Kong moves to the next floor, he has a place to visit. There's a place in the labyrinth called, the secret room. There is at least one hidden in each floor, and a large reward awaits those who discover it, magic staff, ring of levitation, permanent stat boosting potions. Only one person can enter the secret room, and the competition was fierce when it was in easy mode. As Kong is poking his fingers through the labyrinth walls, he realizes it all depends on luck and experience more than skill. But this is solo mode, here, Kong can get all the secret rooms. Monopoly it is then. As Kong wonders if the location of secret rooms is the same as before, he opens a door. While the labyrinth's difficulty map is different by difficulty, it had the same basic structure, so there was the same feature in the secret room. Kong has finally found it, the one piece of this world, the secret room. Only one entrance exists, and inside is an entirely empty room. A room most players ignore and pass by because it seems pointless. The secret room was in such a place. Kong then starts pushing the bricks in order to activate the secret room. Kong presses, rotates, and extracts, doing all kinds of things to the poor bricks. If there is no change, he moves on to the next brick. Kong thinks to himself it is better than the room where he had to endure for a week with nothing in return. Proficiency in detection has increased by 5%. As Kong rotates a brick, the walls break down. He is the first to discover the secret room and has received the title, Adventurer. Intelligence has been permanently increased by 3. Kong notices the secret reward for the secret room. He then looks around, goes back to the labyrinth, where he notices a rat sleeping peacefully, minding his own business. The poor rat squeaks as Kong steps on him. Kong grabs the squeaking rat by the tail, and as the rat squeaks his final squeak, it gets thrown into the secret room by ruthless Kong. The poor rat triggers a weight trap and gets hit with a fireball and arrow. Kong notices the trap is not that difficult and passes by the poor rat's body. He then grabs the incoming arrow by his hand. Since Kong only had like seven arrows, he decides to steal the arrow from the traps. Kong is catching the arrows left and right. He notices that it is getting tougher by the minute. Buying all the arrows from the store would have been a waste of money. Free stuff is never easy to come by, huh? Says Kong, grabbing poison arrows by his hand, 
paralysis arrows, and all sorts of arrows flying towards him. He was delighted with all the free arrows and then went back to the first trap once again. The arrows come flying in once again, and we see a satisfied Kong storing about 100 arrows in the inventory. No one cheats the system like our Kong. Kong now finally decides to head towards the treasure chest. Kong could easily block the arrows with his tower shield and run, but this place is a maze, so Kong decides to show a near-perfect execution. Kong perfectly dodges all the arrows, and as he reaches the ninth brick, nine arrows are shot towards him from the back. Kong activates breathless attack. He has freedom of breath for the next 10 seconds. Kang's proficiency of vision has increased by 2%. As Kong is moving forward, more arrows are flying towards him from all directions. System alert, you heightened your senses in a crisis. You have obtained a special active skill, sensory enhancement. Kong blocks the arrows with both of his hands moving forward. The arrow arrives at point-blank range, which is impossible to dodge. You have activated deflection, the next attack will be deflected. Finally, Kong takes 8 damage from the arrow. He ignores the damage and keeps on moving forward, grabbing and dodging arrows, and finally triggers the final trap with his feet. Kong is shocked as hundreds of arrows come flying towards him. Even the ruthless Kong is rattled at this point. As he realizes that he would not be able to dodge all the arrows, he then uses his hand as a shield and takes a lot of damage. His blood is dripping down the floor, and Kong is bleeding. Your health is continuously decreasing. System alert, you have experienced terrible pain. You have gained a special active skill, pain reduction. As Kong stops the bleeding with some bandages, he has only 54 horsepower left. Kong notices a lever and pulls it down, which disarms all the traps from now and for the reward. It looked like a magic item. He takes the staff out of the chest, realizing that it is an item available on the 10th floor even in hard mode. It's the Staff of Flames, a staff used by novice wizards that can cast a basic magic fireball. Even at the start, the Staff of Fire is of much higher value compared to other items. Kong wonders if it is an average reward for solo mode. As Kong makes his way outside the secret room, the angry wife of that sleeping rat appears for revenge. Kong deals with the angry rat with a swift kick. The rat wants to have another go at our boy Kong. System alert, despite being incapacitated for a long time, you had no issues in your actions. You have obtained a special active skill, unyielding will. Kong stomps the rat with his feet, makes his way towards the sanctuary, and sips the healing water, returning to perfect condition. Kong sits down and looks at his new skills, special constant activation skill, pain reduction, and sensory enhancement. These skills might not be useful now, but as their proficiency increases, they would exponentially improve. Special activation skill, unyielding will, no amount of wounds or injuries can break your fighting spirit, you can ignore injuries and fight for 10 seconds in combat. Finally, the staff, the biggest gain from the first floor, the fire magic staff. Basic magic fireball, mana consumption 3, and proficiency 1%. Kong realizes that he has gotten everything that he can from the first floor and decides to descend to the second floor. The structure of the labyrinth is simple, each floor has a staircase leading to the next floor, guarded by a boss. The player needs to defeat the boss and keep moving forward. In the next scene, we see Kong standing in front of the big red door, ready to face the boss of the first floor in solo mode. As Kong makes his way inside, we see the mother of all rats. Kong moves towards the floor boss with no hesitation at all. A giant rat has appeared as it lets out a big squeak. The giant rat used to be the floor boss of the 10th floor in the easy mode, and it had taken out lots of players in the past. But considering everything Kong has experienced in the first floor until now, he was not surprised. Kong brought his tower shield out, ready for the boss battle. The giant rat was not something a first floor player could defeat, that is why Li Taeyun had to resort to trickery. The method she used was simple, knowing that the labyrinth boss could not leave its chamber. Filling the rat room with oil and setting it on fire was all it took. A pretty logical approach, given enough time. Considering she was the only player surviving the solo mode from Earth, Kong thought her strategy was near perfect. But from his previous experience, Kong knew it was not the fight the labyrinth wanted. Kong was ready to face the giant rat with his staff and shield. The giant rat charged at our boy Kong, and he activated a fireball, dealing 14 damage to the giant rat. To become stronger, he knew he had to show a flawless fight. As the rat was engulfed in flames, Kong checked for the burn status. Assessment successful. The giant rat is burning. Kong then took out his bow, and fired a poison arrow at the rat, but assessment failed, the giant rat seemed unaffected. 
Kong had shot yet another arrow in succession, which left the rat squeaking in agony. The target had become paralyzed, immobilized until the next attack for 10 seconds. Kong then took out a bunch of arrows from his inventory, with a smug look on his face. By paralyzing the rat with an arrow and firing the poison arrow, assessment was successful. The giant rat is poisoned. Kong kept on continuously striking the rat with arrows, and their status effects added to the continuous damage. The ferocious giant rat lay down, covered with arrows, as its gaze fixated on Kong. Kong grabbed his shield, ready to hit the giant rat. He thought of this battle as child's play. System alert, the giant rat has been weakened. Damage will be more effective. But now things had just got real. Kong focused on what was about to come next. The rat's health had reached a certain level, it was about time. Berserker mode is activated when health drops below 20%. Kong was reminded of the horrors and casualties when the giant rat entered berserker mode. Coming back to the present, the giant rat was enraged, it had entered berserker mode. Kong readied himself as the second phase began. It was a head-on battle now. The rat threw a huge claw, which was blocked by Kong using his entire body. Blood came out from his mouth. Kong took 8 damage. With his current strength, Kong could not handle the rat. To defeat this towering rat, he decided to base his strategy on his best stat, agility. Kong attacked the rat with speed, using his shield, leaving the rat shocked, mouth wide open. The rat looked at Kong and noticed that he was not there. Kong charged at the giant rat from the back, using his shield. System alert, you have dealt 7 damage to the giant rat. The rat screamed in pain and managed to throw a huge uppercut, but Kong blocked it by putting his body weight and leaning on the shield. Kong took 7 damage. Finally, he dealt 7 damage to the rat, and the giant rat fell down. The rat was now desperate, trying to bite our hero Kong, to which he was barely holding onto life by blocking with his shield. Kong took his sword out from the inventory. System alert, you have activated apnea. You gain the freedom of breath for the next 10 seconds. Kong sliced and diced the giant rat, dealing continuous damage to it. But the rat managed to land a claw strike on Kong with a big squeal. Kong took 24 damage. He realized that at this rate, he could only take a few more hits. Therefore, he tried to finish it off as fast as possible. Kong rushed in with his sword and took 25 damage, he activated the dodge, so the next attack was dodged, and he struck the rat once again in the process. As claws came flying in, Kong performed a counter. The enemy took significant damage. Kong pointed the sword and stabbed the rat directly in the chest. System alert, you have dealt 20 damage to the giant rat. With the last hit, the giant rat was defeated. As the battle ended, Kong was bombarded with system notifications, you have defeated a challenging enemy alone. Agility permanently increased by 2, mana permanently increased by 3, your strong strike has been activated, strength permanently increased by 2, agility permanently increased by 3. Your level has increased, you have achieved the best condition. You have defeated the first floor boss and obtained one random stat increase potion. You have understood the hidden elements of the first floor, secret reward, designated stat increase times 2. Kong drank these potions while he sat over the defeated giant rat. With the designated stat potion, Kong had increased his strength stat by 2. Kong then looked at his current stats, level 4, health 155, mana 15, strength 17, agility being the highest at 30. Kong wondered if having these stats on the first floor was ridiculous. He then remembered that he had also unlocked a skill, counter, mana cost 5, proficiency 1%, counterattack an enemy's attack, dealing significant damage to the enemy. After checking everything, Kong lay down and suddenly remembered what happened to the solo mode first floor basic strategy he posted on the community. He opened the system window and had a look at the community post with a grinning face. As Kong opens the community tab in the system window, he notices something strange in the comments about the solo mode basic strategy. Players were arguing in the comments about Kang's methods. Li Sang, with her healthy pair of melons, looked shocked as she was reading through the strategy. However, what surprised our boy Kong was the state of the community. In his previous life, everyone was devastated in the labyrinth. No one was talking about his strategy back then, there were just desperate posts. But in this life, people were posting positive results. Li Sang even managed to reach the fountain of life and thanked our boy Kong in the comments. Everybody in the community was wondering, where did our boy Kong go, and when would he post once again? Kong noticed that the flow was changing little by little. In the next scene, Kong stared at the entrance of the second floor and wore his martial artist's glove, ready to enter the second floor. Kong made his way through the labyrinth's floor stairs and noticed that the power here was not very strong. 
Finally, the second floor quest began with the system alert, defeat the boss on the second floor and proceed through. The rewards for the second floor were a mana enhancement potion for beginners and a secret hidden reward. As Kong opened the system window once again, he was bombarded with notifications. The notifications were filled with gratitude from the players, thanking our boy Kong and asking for more help. Kong was perplexed by the sheer amount of messages that he had to respond to. Kong Jun Hyok requested to speak with our boy Kong Taysen. As he accepted the request, they were transferred into another dimension where they could speak. Kong Jun Hyok expressed his gratitude towards Kong and thanked him for his guide for the first floor. Kong did not expect that people trapped in the labyrinth would undertake extreme challenges just by reading the posts in the community. I had no choice, Kong Jun Hyok replied nervously, it was either to follow your advice or die of starvation. He replied, you know it too, if you don't go into the labyrinth, you can't get food at all. There was no answer from people who entered the labyrinth. Then he asked our boy Kong to give him some food, but Kong did not respond, and our boy asking for help seemed kind of desperate. At first, our boy Kong was thinking about running through the labyrinth and devouring everything that he comes across, but in that critical time, he noticed that even if everyone was frustrated at first, as Li Sang reached the Fountain of Life, others believed they could do it as well. He asked how many people succeeded in the big rat hunt, to which the boy in the red vest replied, it's just me and Li. Kong was surprised, as Li Sang was the first person to clear her solo mode, but he was seeing this guy for the first time. Maybe in the previous attempt, he recklessly fought and died. Kong thought to himself, since he won against the big rats, he must be similarly talented as Li Sang. He then decided to call him an irregular, who had survived thanks to his post. He also told them that an NPC would test your results, and how he would treat you would depend on your behavior. The boy in the red vest asked Kong if he was alright. The red armored Kong continued, No, brother, you are giving us too much information. I appreciate your help, even though we are breaking through the labyrinth together, we are in a competition now. Our boy Kong looked uninterested. The red armored guy continued to praise himself, saying that he would surpass our boy Kong in the future. As Kong hit the guy in the forehead, he said, You are talking nonsense again, and what kind of competition is this? He added, We are all humans facing the same impending destruction of our planet. The reason I am sharing various information with you is simple, to prevent you from getting lost in strange or dangerous places. You know it too, right? There are a lot of people who died after following my strategy, Kong added. The red armored guy seemed to realize Kang's point. Kong wrapped up the conversation and walked on the second floor of the solo mode. The first floor was just the tutorial, it was said that the second floor is the true beginning of the labyrinth. With a serious look, he stood in front of a building. Goblins, carrying knives and shields, were ready to ambush him. Kong opened the door with a kick, and a system notification appeared. Goblins with a bow appeared, goblins with swords, and a goblin with a shield appeared. The goblins then charged at our boy Kong. Kong took out a bow and arrow with a smile on his face, ready to face the goblins. Kong stood ready to face the formidable goblins, armed with their weapons. As the goblins rushed at him, he swiftly retrieved an arrow, preparing to confront the group. Their limited intelligence led them to attack in numbers. Kong took aim and fired, striking a goblin squarely in the chest. The wounded goblin screeched in pain, while another managed to block the arrow with his arms, rendering him paralyzed. A third goblin, carrying a shield and a knife, charged at Kong. He skillfully blocked the attack with his own shield, leaving the goblin shocked. In a matter of seconds, Kong pinned the goblin to the ground with his shield and finished the job with his dagger. The remaining two goblins, witnessing the fall of their comrades, lunged at Kong with their long swords. Kong, however, remained calm, only noticing the shiny swords they wielded. As the goblins closed in, Kong swiftly retrieved a wooden staff from his inventory, and as fire began to accumulate within it, a deafening explosion echoed throughout the room. In the midst of the chaos, Kong admired his new sword and shield combination. Another notification appeared, Rusty Sword, Attack Power plus 2, it can be used somehow. Followed by, Wooden Shield, Defense plus 3, it is small but can block most attacks. Kong proceeded to open a door leading to a room filled with the Crimson Aura. As he observed the intense aura, a red system alert appeared, announcing the discovery of the Altar of Rekiratus. Kong received a permanent intelligence boost of 1 and a mana increase of 2 as a first discovery bonus. It was revealed that the Labyrinth's gods had various personalities, some favoring or opposing players. Some gods even regarded players as mere plaything. Kang's attention was drawn to a giant door statue of Rekiratus, 
hinting at an even darker and more formidable power beyond. Another notification appeared, Altar of Rakiratus, an altar created by Rakiratus' servants, the gateway to godhood. Kong decided to accept a subquest from Rakiratus, which marked the beginning of his challenge. Rakiratus was delighted by Kang's determination. A crimson glow materialized in front of Kong, forming a warrior in full body armor. This armored figure was Rakiratus' servant, and Kong was given a system alert, Rakiratus trial, defeat Rakiratus' servant, fake. The servant possessed overwhelming power and swiftly attacked Kong, inflicting 25 damage despite Kang's attempts to block with his shield. Realizing that a shield was futile, Kong drew his own sword and prepared to unleash a two-sword style technique. The clash of their blades resounded, and Kong managed to push the servant back. However, he realized his opponent was much stronger than anticipated. Kong decided to change tactics, creating distance between them. After a quick turn, Kong charged at the servant, delivering a series of powerful blows, totaling six damage twice. The next attack left Kang's sword lodged in the servant's armor, so he discarded the blade and landed a powerful punch to the gut, dealing an additional four damage. Drawing upon the weapon art he had learned from an old man, Kong stayed close to his opponent, preventing it from using its full strength. Rakiratus watched in amazement as Kong skillfully engaged his adversary. Kong temporarily withdrew to catch his breath, and a system alert indicated that Rakiratus had manifested his power, reducing his area of influence. In the heat of battle, Rakiratus unleashed the full potential of the armored servant, boosting his intelligence and skills. Kong was taken aback, barely managing to land a blow before the servant's power was elevated to its maximum. The system alert announced a significant development, our boy Kong had encountered Rakarata's servant, and this time, it was no fake. The armored guy took his sword out and assumed a fighting stance, ready to face our boy Kong, unleashing a powerful crimson aura. With his stamina running out, Kong noticed that the fake label was removed from his opponent. He then took a fighting stance as well, prepared to face the fully powered armored guy. In the heat of the battle, he realized that the earlier method he used to damage wouldn't work anymore, as his opponent had gained intelligence. In the meantime, Kong barely managed to block the attack with his sword. The armored guy then attacked Kong with a vertical swing. Kong was barely holding on and kept on taking damage despite blocking his opponent's attacks. Kong was struggling, as even the movements of this thing had changed. Then, with a powerful blow, Kong was sent flying by the armored guy, who was closing in for yet another attack. Kong took 25 damage, as his back smashed against the wall, and blood started to come out of his mouth. Our boy was really struggling at this point. However, he gritted his teeth, and managed to stand back up. Kong wiped the blood from his mouth. He realized that in the labyrinth, every movement and action is evaluated. After a certain level, every capability is described as a skill. As Kong finished his train of thought, the armored guy gave a puzzled look at our boy Kong. The armored guy looked at the powerful fighting spirit emanating from Kong. Kong, with a determined look on his face, realized that in terms of words, his opponent was miles better than him, but he had another trick up his sleeve. He had summoned the wooden staff from his inventory. Kong then cast a fireball spell at the armored guy, from a very close range. However, the magic attack was nullified by the armored guy with a single slash from his sword. To his surprise, Kong had disappeared from his line of sight. As the guy looked puzzled, Kong managed to get behind him, ready to launch a full swing from behind. Finally, Kong managed to deal six damage to Rakarata's servant. The armored guy rushed our boy Kong with another attack. However, Kong was unfazed by it, so he activated a skill. The next attack was blocked. In quick succession, the armored guy went in for another slash, dealing 15 damage to Kong. With eyes full of determination, Kong activated his non-breathing attack. As the battle continued, Kong managed to land several attacks on his opponent, and took 11 damage himself in the exchange. As he was attacking his opponent consecutively, he acquired a skill for consecutive attacks. Kong then hit his opponent with a fireball attack on the head, dealing serious damage. Rakarata's servant had been injured with a burn. As the battle continued, Kong had remaining mana of only 5, and his stamina was at 70. Kong realized that he had reached the point of no return, so he charged head-on to attack the armored guy in a face-to-face -face battle. Kong jumped up with both of his swords at the back, leaving his frontal area vulnerable. Capitalizing on this weakness, the armored guy struck his swords through Kang's chest. It was a fatal blow, as Kong had taken 80 damage from this attack. The skill holding on was activated at this point, and the deadly attack was nullified. All the damage was reduced to zero for one second. By creating this scenario, 
Kong pushed both of his swords against his opponent's neck. He did not stop and kept on applying his maximum power, going beyond plus ultra. Kong had finally managed to behead the armored guy as his helmet lay on the floor. Kong finally took a sigh of relief. The spirit of the armored guy commented, it was a great fight, brave one. System alert, you have won against Rakarata's servant. Rakiratus was satisfied, to which Kong said, satisfied. What a cheater. Changing the quest all of a sudden in the first place was petty. A golden aura appeared around Kong with a bunch of system notifications. You have gained an enormous amount of experience. You are moving on to the next level. You have evolved into your best form. You have single-handedly beaten a strong opponent. Your spiritual ascension has been activated. Kong then opened his status window, to see how much stronger he had gotten. Kong noticed a huge increase in stats, plus 30 in stamina and 5 in mana. It was a lot. Kong checked his status window once again. For a reward from his previous life and death battle, system alert, you have passed the ordeal of Rakiratus. Rakiratus desires to give you a reward. Kong noticed a crimson aura in front of him. Rakiratus presents you with a reward. You have been rewarded with Rakiratus' ceremonial sword. Kong could not believe his eyes. He was surprised with the sword, and the fact that he managed to receive it at the second level. Since Kong had passed a hard trial, an additional reward was given. You have acquired a passive skill, evidence of struggle, mastery 1%. You have proven your fighting spirit. This could be strengthened from a fight with an enemy. As Kong was standing there with Rakarada's crimson sword, he saw an orange notification pop up. Rakiratus was offering him an apostle's contract. Kong contemplated the apostle's contract, searching for an explanation in the notification box. Carefully considering, he debated accepting Rakarada's contract. Reflecting on God's behavior in the Tower of Gods, Kong entered deep thought. Sweating, he faced Rakarada's, the god of death. With limited information, Kong realized Rakarada's sought to make him a puppet. Our boy firmly refused Rakarada's contract. Surprisingly, the notification box persisted presenting a subquest on killing second and third floor enemies. Deciding against it due to Rakarada's betrayal, Kong turned down the quest. Speechless, Kong reluctantly accepted the subquest as Rakarada's insisted. Rakarada's, amused, smirked at our protagonist's choice. In the next scene, we return to the old man's shop. Curious, he questioned my swift return. Kong needed to make a purchase, for gold coins were tossed, securing costly potions. As I stashed the items, the old man spotted my sword. Informing me, the old man speculated that Rakarada's, the pervert, was fixated due to a love for combat. Kong, surprised, inquired further. The old man, acknowledging Rakarada's, revealed he knew about the god. Kong then probed about the apostle's contract. Drawing from his cigar, the old man asked if Rakarada's truly offered an apostle's contract. Refusing it himself, citing a lack of explanation, he couldn't provide more details. With a serious demeanor, he admitted being just a store owner, unable to disclose tower secrets. The eternal store confinement, he explained, resulted from the binding contract. Concluding the visit, Kong bid farewell promising to return to the old men next time. In the upcoming scene, Kong activated the system window to engage with his waifu and the red guy. They wore somewhat disdainful expressions when I inquired about their encounter with the old guy. The red armored guy disclosed that the old men not only spat on his face but also ignored him completely. The old guy emitted an immense aura that left the red guy frozen in the same spot. Our waifu shared that her charms had no effect on the old men. Despite this, the shameless red armored guy didn't back down. He persistently begged for rewards, but his attempts were in vain. Kong had an epiphany that to secure better rewards in the tower, one must display more courageous actions. Our waifu contributed to the conversation by mentioning she was still confined to the first floor. The red armored guy also conveyed that almost no one had successfully cleared the floor until now. Having gathered both of them, Kong instructed his waifu and the red armored guy to listen carefully and unveil secrets of the first floor. Our waifu was on the verge of excitement when he disclosed that the level's boss was a giant rat with an attack power of 3000. As Kong prepared to leave, he warned them to be cautious against the formidable boss. Motivated, both the red armored guy and our waifu geared up to solo clear the first floor. Kong reopened his system window, marking the beginning of the subquest. Now, Kong stands on the next floor, a peaceful and quiet environment, ready to stir up chaos with a wooden shield and the crimson sword. Jumping into the new floor, Kong faced goblins hiding behind walls and trees, ready to ambush him. With loud screeches, the goblins attack. Kong raised his crimson sword, activating a new skill as the system alert signaled evidence of struggle. In one swift move, Kong critically struck all the goblins, 
landing like a frog on one in apparent distress. Using the skill brought mental clarity and a surge of power. Eyes closed, he blocked the surprise attack from behind and effortlessly pushed away an armed goblin. The once serene tower now echoed with goblin blood. Having defeated all the goblins, Kong noticed something peculiar, an undiscovered golden door. Inside, he found a giant tombstone. System alert, you have found a tomb of a warrior. As Kong recoiled in shock at the startling sight, a system alert pierced the air, you have discovered the warrior's grave, positioned before the ancient tomb, another notification materialized, your intelligence has been permanently increased, Kong, standing in awe, absorbed the newfound knowledge, gently tapping the time-worn tomb, Kong shielded his eyes from the intense yellow light that radiated from within, out of the brilliance emerged a cute white ghost adorned with a red scarf, greeting Kong with an irresistibly charming smile. Bewildered by the unexpected encounter, Kong barely had time to process the spectacle before the white ghost hurriedly retreated to the tomb, bidding a fond farewell. A purple question mark materialized above Kang's head, symbolizing his complete confusion regarding the unfolding events. Unfazed, Kong tapped the tombstone once more, only to be surprised as the white ghost reappeared briefly, darting back into the tomb with astonishing speed. Frustration etched across his face. Khan, now extremely annoyed by the ghost's whimsical behavior, appeared on the verge of violence. Finally, Khan touched the tomb once more, and the innocent ghost began to emerge slowly from the grave. Suddenly, in a swift motion, Khan seized the white ghost, causing it to tremble in fear at the unexpected turn of events. Khan, driven by frustration, squeezed the life out of the white ghost causing it to quickly deflate in his grasp. Despite Kang's firm grip, the cute ghost managed to break free and flew out of his hand, visibly annoyed. It boldly declared that Kang was unworthy of the ghost's quest. Finally, the cute ghost decided to unveil its origin story, disclosing that it was once a player like Kang. Now, however, it was trapped in a ghostly form within the confines of this tomb. With mischievous delight, the ghost teased Kang, asserting that compared to his former player self, Kang was just a weakling a nobody in the grand scheme of things. Kong, astonished by this revelation, contemplated the fact that this ghost, unlike the elderly man he had encountered earlier, was once a player. Yet, he found the ghost's aura lacking the grandeur he had anticipated. Unfazed by the ghost's banter, Kong sternly demanded it to cease its chatter and simply provide him with the quest. In response, the ghost yelled back in a cute manner, advising Kong not to act like a bad-mannered person. The ghost continued its tale, revealing that it was trapped in the tomb, bound to give quests to players. Kong, wearing a puzzled expression, listened as the white ghost declared it wouldn't grant its quest to just anybody, further deepening the mystery surrounding its enigmatic character. Annoyed by Kang's persistence, the white ghost started flying in circles, urging Kong to leave, insisting that it would not bestow any quest upon him. Having reached his limit with the antics of the white ghost, Kong was prepared to leave. However, as he turned away, the Rakarada's crimson sword in his possession sparkled with an intriguing radiance. Witnessing the sparkle, the white ghost, now relieved, bid farewell to our boy Kong. Simultaneously, a sudden realization struck the ghost like a bolt of lightning. The cute ghost's eyes widened as it noticed Kong carrying the prestigious crimson sword, the very blade of Rakarada's. A paleness overcame the ghost as the truth dawned upon him Kong had successfully cleared the Rakarada's trial. Aware of Kang's formidable strength, the ghost's demeanor underwent a rapid transformation. It began to act giddy around Kong, recognizing the newfound power in their unexpected companion. However, despite the cute ghost's pleading, Kong stood firm, expressing his reluctance to undertake the ghost's quest. In an attempt to sway Kang's decision, the white ghost disclosed its past as an excellent warrior skilled with the sword. The ghost narrated how, while confronting a formidable adversary on an upper floor, it faced defeat. Seeking respite, it retreated to the tenth floor to rest and regain strength. Unfortunately, his story took a tragic turn when he was unjustifiably killed on the tenth floor while he was peacefully asleep. Kong, puzzled by the circumstances, questioned how a mighty warrior could be assassinated on the tenth floor. 
This inquiry, however, only managed to annoy the cute little ghost. Fuming with anger, the cute ghost declared that only death would satisfy his thirst for revenge. As the ghost concluded his intense monologue, Kong shifted his attention to the wooden door in front of him. Upon entering, Kong found himself confronted by a horde of goblins, all clad in armor and armed with weapons and shields. Adopting a stylish pose, Kong charged his magical bow and arrow, preparing to face the goblin threat. With a single well-aimed arrow, Kong unleashed an electric shock that electrified all the goblins in the room. Undeterred, Kong charged towards another goblin, brandishing his sword and striking the creature with a powerful blow. At this point, Kong, seemingly not taking the encounter seriously, toyed with the poor goblins, displaying his superior prowess in the face of their feeble attempts. Kong, having had enough of the goblin confrontation, decisively launched another arrow into the midst of the remaining foes. The remnants of the defeated goblins now lay scattered on the floor, victims of Kang's merciless onslaught. Perplexed by Kang's decision not to finish off the incapacitated goblins, the white ghost expressed surprise, questioning Kang's motives. Curious about Kang's intentions, the ghost inquired if Kang was attempting to acquire a new skill. In response, Kang affirmed his pursuit of skill development, challenging Kang. The cute ghost, sensing Kang's growing seriousness, asserted that obtaining a skill of that nature was an impossible feat. The ghost, flaunting its experience, circled around Kang, boasting that it had reached the 85th floor without acquiring skills similar to Kang's pursuits. Seizing the moment, Kang grabbed a goblin and proposed a bet to the ghost. If Kang failed to obtain the skill he sought, he would become the ghost's puppet and follow its commands, even to the point of death. In response to Kang's bold challenge, the ghost emitted a somewhat nervous sigh, surprised that a newcomer to the tower dared to challenge its authority. Demonstrating confidence, Kang and the ghost formalized the bet. If the ghost lost, it pledged to share all information with Kang, removing any withholding of knowledge. Sporting a confident smirk, Kang warned the ghost not to renege on the agreement, emphasizing the importance of keeping one's word in their unusual wager. The white ghost, thinking victory secure, let out a big, evil laugh, believing the bet with Kong was already won. Fantasizing about making Kong walk like a dog on the floor and be called master, the cute ghost reveled in joy. Imagining all the dirty deeds he could make Kong do until his demise, the cute ghost soared through the air with delight. Flying toward Kong, the ghost asserted there was no point in trying, urging Kong to surrender. Kong, undeterred, queried about the skill battle. In response, the cute ghost affirmed knowledge of the basic skill, where parties agreed to fight without interference. Kong disclosed plans to obtain a similar skill, prompting the ghost to dismiss it as a lie, deeming it impossible. Striking the somewhat relieved goblin, a system alert emerged. You have obtained the conditional active skill forced battle. Witnessing this, the once confident white ghost was shocked to a degree as if life had left its body. The skill, forced battle, proved extremely overpowered in group fights, serving as the main skill to eliminate all sorts of debuffs. Sweating profusely, the cute ghost confronted Kong, who displayed his system window showcasing the newfound skill. The poor ghost, flabbergasted at this development, had its eyes glued to the system window, wondering how Kong obtained such an overpowered skill. Kong revealed that not everyone possessed the skill, and its learning conditions were comparatively easy to achieve. He confidently asserted knowing how to unlock insanely powerful skills as well. In a confident demeanor, Kong reminded the ghost of the bet it made. The cute ghost, showing a defeated look, acknowledged losing the bet and prepared to reveal everything to Kong. Admitting Kang's victory, the ghost disclosed that, unlike other NPCs in the tower, it had no story restrictions, allowing it to share any information with Kong. Kong, with a bold face, instructed the ghost to cut the crap, emphasizing that its job was to properly answer questions and nothing else. Visibly angered by Kang's assertiveness, the ghost clearly did not appreciate being talked down upon. Maintaining superiority, the white ghost informed Kong that forced battle was a good skill, but queried if he knew the skill leap. Confidently, Kong replied, Yes, I know, but you don't have to learn leap, just learn large leap. Surprised, the ghost asked, What's large leap? Kong scoffed, remarking, Oh, so you never learned this skill, ha. Huh? Visibly annoyed, the cute ghost admitted Kang's superior knowledge of skills but emphasized the importance of discoveries and rewards over skills. Curious, the white ghost questioned Kong about his actions. Kong revealed he was trying to discover a secret by removing bricks from the wall. A brick emitted a bright glow, triggering a system alert, 
you received a powerful premonition. Khan picked out the glowing brick, leaving the little ghost completely dumbfounded. Kane's detection skill reached about 20% proficiency as he discovered a hidden secret room. Examining the roof, he noticed several pointy spears, wondering if they were traps from goblins this time. The ghost warned Khan, cautioning that the traps were set up randomly and extremely difficult to break through. Advising Khan to give up in return, the ghost's words hung in the air. Khan first discerned the sequence of traps, arrow traps followed by a pitfall trap, culminating in walls that guarded the treasure chest reward. Taking the on your mark stance, he emitted a powerful blur aura, leaving the cute ghost shocked. In a whoosh, Khan disappeared in a single instant, a force that even blew away the white ghost. Already in the air, Khan skillfully sliced through a multitude of arrows with his sword. With agility akin to the Prince of Persia, Khan ran swiftly, executing a wall run to evade the pointy spears. Landing gracefully, he wasted no time, rushing forward at maximum speed. The poor ghost, dumbfounded once again, wondered if there was anything Khan couldn't do. In a serious demeanor, Khan noticed the walls closing in, almost touching him. Clenching his fist, the theme music of One Punch Man started playing in the background, for some reason. With a single punch, Khan obliterated the thick walls, leaving the white ghost with a jaw-dropping expression. Khan explained that the walls were crafted by the goblins and differed from the labyrinth's walls, reminding itself not to say anything. The white ghost watched as Khan pulled down the lever of the secret room. From the treasure chest, Khan acquired a spring-imbued ring, boosting the host's mana by plus five. Dumbfounded by Kang's power yet again, the ghost couldn't help but ask, Who the hell are you really? Confused, the ghost received an enigmatic response from Kong. Will you understand if I said it's my second time? The white ghost, puzzled, replied, Second time? Kong dismissed it, saying to forget it if it couldn't comprehend. Kong realized the ghost didn't understand the concept of regression, explaining that to obtain the artifact, one had to go beyond the 85th floor. In the next scene, Kong opened the system window as 10 days had elapsed, signaling the time to converse with comrades. Inside the communication window, players discussed strategies to defeat the big rat, sharing insights gained after facing it 200 times, finally discerning its movements. As Khan made his entrance, both our waifu and the red-armored guy greeted him warmly. Curious, the red guy questioned why Khan switched from a private window to a public communication window. Khan explained it was to efficiently convey information to everyone. When Khan inquired about their progress, the red guy expressed that it was barely manageable. From those who reached the spring of life, only half could successfully hunt. Upon Khan asking about themselves, the red guy admitted to fleeing after a brief encounter with the giant rat. Our waifu shared a similar sentiment, acknowledging her current lack of strength against the giant rat and actively seeking alternative strategies. Coughing loudly to gather attention, Khan assumed a serious demeanor, revealing the purpose behind gathering the solo-level players, to discuss skills. The red guy, raising his hand, questioned the relevance of skills at their current level. He argued that learning new skills seemed pointless when struggling to clear level 1 with low stats. Waifu added that even if they had learned about obtaining skills upon entering the tower, they wouldn't know how to apply that information. Despite their skepticism, Kong insisted they listen, emphasizing the information's importance. Another player earnestly thanked Kong, but he urged them to listen first before expressing gratitude. All solo players listen attentively, Kong began by introducing the easiest skill, reduce pain. Pointing to his arm, Kong instructed them to stab a sword into it, all the way through. With a dead serious expression, Kong asked if they had worn out blades, guiding them to puncture it to the bone to unlock the skill. A frightened look swept over the entire room, visible on everyone's faces. The anxious group of players hesitantly replied, questioning if Kong genuinely wanted them to harm themselves. Kong quickly responded, pointing out that the fountain of vitality was right next to them. So what was the issue? Elaborating further, Kong clarified that by engaging with the formidable rat in such a condition, they could unlock a skill called Unyielding Resolve, allowing them to combat while disregarding injuries. This disclosure left the group of players alarmed and bewildered, pondering if Kong intended for them all to face severe consequences. Undeterred, Kong assured he would continue, urging everyone to pay attention. Next, he explained how to attain the skill Unbreathe. He suggested jumping inside the fountain of vitality and holding their breath until just before they reach a critical state. The room was filled with extreme unease. Continuing, Khan elucidated the skill Endure, which neutralizes attacks that lead to severe consequences. To acquire this skill, they had to engage with the substantial rat 30 times while at 1 HP. Apprehension and disillusionment among the players kept escalating after hearing Kang's revelations. 
realizing that acquiring skills required extreme actions, the concerned players understood they could not undertake such challenging feats. Kong assured them that he wouldn't force anyone, emphasizing it was their choice whether to undertake the extreme methods or not. Realizing he was the sole regressor among them, Kong understood that, for the others, life had been about drinking chicken and eating beer while comfortably playing video games. Living in such a relaxed manner made the extreme measures Kong proposed seem too much to ask for. Our waifu, searching for alternatives, asked Kong if there really was no other method. Kong regretfully replied, No, I'm sorry but there isn't. Even the red-armored guy and our waifu displayed disbelief, a reaction Kong noticed in an instant. With a sigh, our waifu and the red guy agreed to give the insane methods a try, shocking the group of players behind them. Protesting, they asked if the two were crazy and questioned the authenticity of the information. What if all this is just a lie? They exclaimed. Both of them visibly frustrated replied, why would he suggest that? He's managing everything perfectly on his own and you guys have already benefited from Kang's fighting strategies too. This left the other group of players in a state of discomfort, but Kang was genuinely pleased after hearing such heartfelt responses from our waifu and the red guy. The red guy expressed his willingness to try acquiring the unbreathed skill. Kang cautioned him, assuring he would be fine if he exited as soon as he saw the system window. The group of apprehensive players were astonished by the red guy's readiness to undertake such a task. As Kang bid his farewell, he encouraged them to work diligently promising to share information about other skills when they were prepared. As he returned to the tower, Kong noticed the white ghost in front of the system windows, clearly displeased with him. Kong explained to the ghost that sharing information was important, but the ghost remained indifferent, urging Kong to clear the floor quickly. They stood in front of the gate, prepared to hunt the boss of the floor. Uncertain, Kong asked if it was truly the end of the second floor. The ghost confirmed and instructed Kong to hurry. Kong opened the red door, facing whatever challenges awaited him with confidence. Inside, a goblin wielded a peculiar staff emitting purple magic. A wild goblin charged at Kong at full speed, with another goblin trailing behind. Kong blocked the attack with his wooden shield, sustaining no damage. He then forcefully slammed the green goblin to the floor, freeing it from life's sufferings. However, the cute ghost was displeased with Kang's fighting approach. In the next scene, the mage goblin cast a magic skill with its purple staff. The ghost warns Kong, emphasizing the need to deal with the mage goblin first, or else he would be at a massive disadvantage. Kong confidently replies, I know that, relax, I've got it. Kong remains confident in his actions as the mage goblin throws purple magic at him. In the scene, Kong gets hit by the purple magic as he makes no attempt to dodge facing it head-on. Resulting from this, Kong shuts his eyes, enduring the effects of the purple magic. Upon opening his eyes, he finds himself in a different place, surrounded by the corpses of zombies. All the zombies crawl towards him, blaming Kong and trying to make him feel guilty. Kong, enveloped in a red aura, remains unfazed by the words of the accusing zombies. Looking back, Kong notices the zombies already climbing on him, and to his horror, he sees our beloved waifu dead and covered with injuries. She asks why our boy didn't come to save her, leaving Kong somewhat frightened. While crying with sorrow and regret, our waifu asks, why did you leave me alone to die? In the next scene, a tsunami of zombies engulfs our waifu. The tsunami now approaches Kong, ready to swallow him too. Kong appears to have given up as he is drowned within the pile of zombies. Suddenly, Kong opens his eyes and confidently declares, sorry, but this kind of nonsense doesn't affect me at all. The cute white ghost absorbs Kong as he is seen being enveloped by the purple magic. The mage goblin is seen amplifying the power of his spells. Kong is muttering something from within the purple spell, which is not quite audible. Angry, Kong opens his eyes and says, Get lost now. Kong raises his crimson sword, breaking the spell, and a system notification pops. You endured with iron will. The white ghost is surprised as Kong has managed to endure the mental attack. The mage goblin makes weird noises, astonished at how Kong broke the spell. Undeterred, the mage goblin activates the skill madness again, but Kong ignores it this time with iron will. Kong flicks away the incoming spell with his hands, asserting that it won't work now. Worried, the mage goblin activates another spell called Cure. However, the spell has no effect on Kong, as mental attacks are now completely ineffective against him. Kong grabs the mage goblin by his neck, crimson sword in the other hand. Having endured numerous magical and mental attacks, Kong obtains two new skills, 
magic resistance and mental resistance. He finishes off the mage goblin as there is nothing left to learn. Our cute ghost is shocked at how Kong managed to endure a mental attack with sheer willpower, realizing that not even he could do that in his prime. The ghost had planned to control our boy, revealing information little by little, but now sees Kong as an uncontrollable nutcase. Who the hell is he? The ghost wonders. After emerging victorious against the second floor boss, Kong acquired a mana increase potion of low grade, bestowing a permanent boost of 10 units to his magical reserves. As he descended to the third floor, Kong added a rudimentary thief's tool to his inventory, capable of disarming any trap with its humble yet effective design. The cute ghost displayed visible annoyance, yet Kong, unperturbed, consumed the man increasing potion, anticipating sustained enhancement in his magical prowess. Navigating to the third floor prompted a system alert, urging Kong to defeat the upcoming boss for further progression. Initially, Kong ventured to the old man's shop, harboring aspirations of swift financial gains. The cute ghost found amusement in Kang's interaction with the grumpy old man, who acknowledged Kong accepting the ghost's quest with an audible display of laughter. The old man cautioned Kong about the cute ghost, branding it a bothersome nuisance, advising not to let its influence sway him. A heated confrontation ensued between the white ghost and the old man, facing off in a clash of opposing viewpoints. Kong sighed in exasperation, witnessing the senseless altercation between the two NPCs. The escalating skirmish abruptly halted with the resonating sound of numerous weapons cascading to the ground. Intervening, Kong instructed them to cease their argument, diverting his attention to unloading an abundant inventory of weapons for sale. In a transactional exchange, Kong opted to acquire studded gloves, strategically enhancing his attack capabilities by a noteworthy increment of two. Additionally, he invested in a bronze shield boasting a formidable defense rating of plus five, leaving Kong visibly content as he wielded it with a satisfied demeanor. Adding to his arsenal, Kong procured a pendant known as the Pendant of the Strong One, effectively bolstering his attack prowess by an additional plus two. The cute ghost, taken aback by the seemingly exorbitant prices of these acquisitions, couldn't help but be shocked, perceiving the transaction as potentially resembling a dubious scam. The persistent tension between the cute ghost and the grumpy old man lingered, persisting at a heightened level, even as Kong intervened, urging them to cease their dispute before announcing his departure. Undeterred, Kong continued his journey to the third floor, where the scenic surroundings captivated his attention with their breathtaking beauty. Curious about the animosity directed towards the old man, Kong inquired of the white ghost about the source of his disdain. The ghost, with an annoyed tone, retorted, questioning what there was to like about the elderly figure. The white ghost, in a tone tinged with caution, warned Kong against placing trust in the old man, suggesting that the seemingly grumpy character might turn against him at any given moment. Further unraveling the mysterious background, the ghost revealed instances where the old man had betrayed and turned his back on players in the past. Kong, absorbing this information, assured the ghost that he would keep it in mind, but his contemplation was abruptly interrupted by the looming shadow of an enormous monster. To his surprise, the monstrous silhouette materialized into a group of goblins wielding magic staffs and swords driven by a fervent desire to meet their supposed deity as swiftly as possible. Baffled by the goblin's apparent eagerness for self-destruction, Kong delivered a formidable blow to one goblin's chin, sending it soaring akin to Team Rocket's escapades in Pokemon. Sporting a devilish grin and hands casually tucked in his pockets, Kong ruthlessly dispatched the goblin as its companions scampered away. Kong, visibly irked by the perceived feebleness of third-floor monsters, unleashed a massive bomb decimating nearly all goblins in the vicinity with a single explosive display. The overwhelming power displayed by Kong even terrified the white ghost, who witnessed the spectacle in awe. Swiftly and efficiently, Kong cleared the area of goblins at a remarkable pace, leaving both the ghost and the remaining monsters astounded. Despite Kang's rapid progress, the white ghost expressed trepidation, questioning the sensibility of such haste. Kong, undeterred, justified his actions by claiming to be fulfilling a quest, Rakurada's mandate to exterminate all monsters on the second and third floors. Intrigued yet puzzled, the ghost inquired about the nature of this quest, only to discover that it hadn't received a similar mission despite completing Rakurada's trial. Meanwhile, Kong nonchalantly brushed off magical attacks from goblins, treating them like mere nuisances. The white ghost, utterly flabbergasted, witnessed Kang's sudden recollection and posed a query about his familiarity with the Apostle's contract. In a grave demeanor, the ghost acknowledged that it appeared Kang had been offered an Apostle's contract by the God of Death. Seating itself atop Kang's head, 
the cute ghost contemplated where to commence the elaborate explanation. Whirling around Kong, the ghost asserted its right to divulge information, emphasizing its state of being already deceased and tethered to the tower by magic. Unveiling the tower's origin, the ghost narrated the Grand Mage's struggle in creating it and the subsequent revelation of his plans to the gods. The tower, a conduit to the abyss, beckoned countless warriors to brave challenges and life-threatening battles orchestrated by the gods. This elaborate scheme would culminate in their premature demise a spectacle relished by the entertained gods who wholeheartedly embraced the concept. With fervor bordering on obsession, all the gods eagerly endorsed the mage's endeavor, allocating significant time to craft this labyrinthine tower. Seated deep within the tower's recesses, the gods meticulously scrutinized entrance, conducting trials and assessments to gauge their inherent value. In instances where the gods harbored a distinct interest, they extended the coveted apostle's contract as a testament to their favor. Facing this revelation, Kong sought the ghost's insight, questioning whether this intricate system was inherently benevolent or malevolent. Should you choose to embrace the role of an apostle, abundant abilities await, bestowed generously by the favoring god who might even exceed their own gains. However, this boon comes at a price, the surrender of your soul to the god, and the disdain of other gods who harbor a distaste for apostles. Each god within the tower craves something distinct adding complexity to the relationships between mortals and deities. Rakaratas, the god of death, is particularly contentious, earning enmity from numerous gods who perceive his actions as a disgraceful aberration. Once ensnared in the Apostles' Covenant, obedience becomes paramount, refusal of a divine order is an inconceivable transgression. Contemplating the consequences, Khan leaned towards avoiding the Apostles' path, recognizing that the tower presented an alternative, a wish granted upon its triumphant completion. Recalling Waifu-san's granted wish, Kong speculated on whether she sought an item facilitating time regression. Contemplating Waifu-san's wish, Kong speculated that she might have aspired to rescue Earth, explaining the bestowed item for time regression. Nonetheless, Kong found himself engulfed in a bewildering state of anger and confusion, grappling with the inexplicable discrepancies that eluded comprehension. Mulling over the devastating events on Earth, Kong pondered whether Waifu San aimed to extend her salvation to her homeland. Transitioning to the next scene, Kong is seen opening a trap with the assistance of magic keys. Upon successfully disarming the trap, Kong acquires the skill Disarm Trap, activating it at a mere 1% proficiency. Kong applies the Disarm Trap skill to the walls all the while being observed by the white ghost. A yellow beam of light shoots towards Kong, accompanied by a system alert that states, you failed to disarm traps. Simultaneously, the ghost perceives this as a somewhat pointless activity. Initiating a shout, the white ghost recalls Kang's previous ability to discover a secret room in a single attempt. The annoyed ghost questions the necessity of using skills when brute force could suffice. Kong expresses uncertainty about the malfunctioning skill, stating that he doesn't know why it's not working. He adds that he was unaware of a secret room on this floor. Kong also mentions, I don't know where, how, or when something useful will drop, so I'll be taking everything I can. The ghost is genuinely shocked by Kang's diligent attitude. Observing Kang's earnest efforts, the white ghost realizes the kind of man Kang is. The ghost reflects to himself that this attitude is what he lacked, leading to his demise before. Yawning, Kang finally secures the reward, and the proficiency of the disarm trap skill increases to 7%. From the secret room on the third floor, Kong obtains a twisted ring that boosts strength by three. Kong, having defeated all the goblins on this floor, leaves behind a mountain of their lifeless bodies. Now, the only challenge that remains is the boss of the third floor. Maintaining a positive attitude, Kong stands prepared to confront the boss. The white ghost reminds Kong, it's a goblin floor, you know what boss comes next. Kong confidently responds, yes, I know. Entering a beautifully adorned room marked with stones. Kong and the white ghost feel a strong wind as they approach the boss. The boss goblin lets out a loud screech, its long fangs and saliva dripping from its mouth. A system alert announces, Goblin Chieftain appears, as the formidable boss roars loudly. Without wasting any time, Kong draws his crimson sword and charges directly at the boss. Utilizing his magic staff, the goblin chieftain activates a powerful wave. Evading the powerful attack from the boss, Kong sprints sideways, remaining unscathed. Rushing towards the boss, Kong swiftly activates another wave in quick succession. To counter the boss's incoming attack, Kong takes out his own magic staff while in full sprint. Activating the skill confusion, Kong disarms the boss and makes it levitate in the process. As the goblin chieftain is enveloped in the skill, it emits weird and uncomfortable noises. With another swing of the staff, 
Kong deals more damage to the boss. The boss goblin is visibly angered after receiving a series of blows from Khan. The goblin boss unleashes its full force, attempting a powerful swing at Khan. However, Khan swiftly disappears from the range of the goblin's attack. From Kang's perspective, the staff seems to approach him at an incredibly slow speed, allowing him to gently poke the boss's attack. The goblin alters its attack pattern, launching a horizontal slash. Khan effortlessly dodges this attack by leaping high into the air. On his descent, Khan lands a deadly blow on the goblin chieftain, dealing fatal damage. At this point, the white ghost is already yawning, remarking, it happened as I accepted. As Khan steps on the defeated goblin boss, a system alert pops up, confirming that Khan has successfully hunted the boss of the third floor. Khan is bombarded with system notifications, revealing that all his abilities have been upgraded. As a reward, Khan obtains a low-grade vitality increase potion gulping it down in one go. He also acquires the worn-out wooden staff that the goblin chieftain used in the fight. The little ghost comments that Khan got lucky, as it's rare to find items containing the power of magic, even though it is faint. Why is it lucky? Khan inquires. The ghost replies, the staff allows you to use magic. Shocked by this revelation, Khan exclaims, wait, I can learn magic? The white ghost is even more astonished, saying, wait, you didn't know you can use magic? If monsters can use magic, so can you. All this time, Kong had believed he could use magic through magic items, similar to Waifu Sam. He asks the ghost, how can I learn magic? The white ghost explains, it's simple. You either discover the concept on your own or learn it from someone else. Kong initially thinks learning from someone else is impossible. However, he realizes that maybe he can learn magic from the NPCs. Now it all makes sense to Kong since NPCs in the solo mode are former players themselves. Kong considers that maybe, even after clearing the solo mode, Waifu San might not have found an NPC to learn magic from. Dismissing the thought of learning magic now, Kong is urged by the cute white ghost to hurry up and move on to the fourth floor. Kong intervenes, suggesting that before that, he should go to Rakaratas to receive the prize. Opening the system window, Kong notices the third floor clear award, level up rewards, and other prizes. However, he starts sweating when he realizes there's no notification for the secret room clear award. He believes something is hidden on the third floor. EHH, screams the perplexed white ghost in shock. The ghost asks Kong, you already defeated the boss and got the secret room award? Could there be two secret rooms? Observing the goblin markings drawn on the walls, Kong wonders if there could indeed be two secret rooms. Kong asks the ghost if it knows about this secret room but the ghost replies that it couldn't even find the first secret room, let alone a second one. As Kong continues to observe, he notices something peculiar about the nature of the paintings on the wall. He realizes that the wall paintings are all looking at the same place. Activating the skill disarm trap on the point where all the goblins were facing in the wall, Kong investigates further. As a result, Kong discovers a huge hole inside the boss battle room. The white ghost is dumbfounded and asks, how did you do that? Kong answers that the walls seem to be made of the same material as goblin traps, so they broke. As Kong looks inside, he wonders what in the world the goblin hid so deeply. Inside, there's a faint brown-colored goblin resting in a giant chair. A system alert declares, you have encountered the previous goblin lord, Hagi H.A. Kong is amazed, as it's his first time seeing a monster with a name. The white ghost is worried, asking, what on earth is a lord-class monster doing on the third floor? The white ghost is sweating bullets with fear. The lord-class monster reaches towards its giant sword. Its eyes bulge out, and despite having nails longer than Orochimaru's, it tightly grips the sword while remaining seated. The lord-class goblin speaks, I do not resent you. You two are nothing, being dragged around like toys for their pleasure. However, I am in existence given a role of a monster here as it menacingly raises its sword. In the very next second, with a single attack, the Lord Goblin slashes a giant red swing. Kong is terrified by the Lord Goblin's power as the sword is centimeters away from reaching his neck. And this is how this chapter ends. Kong is sweating heavily, finding it hard to believe the extent of the damage caused by a single sword swing. All the marbles on the roof were swiftly chopped away by that one attack. As it turns out, Kong managed to survive narrowly, thanks to activating the skill sliding. The sword attack just grazed above his head. Terrified, Kong loudly wondered, how can a single strike be so powerful? Without sliding, I would have been dead by now. In the midst of his thoughts, Kong realized that the goblin Lord Hokage was about to unleash another attack. The Lord Goblin Hokage was gearing up for yet another potentially devastating attack. Left with no alternative, Kong boldly rushed towards the Lord Goblin Hokage, brandishing his crimson sword at him.
their swords clashed with a resounding heaviness, echoing like the explosive force of a nuclear bomb. Even at his utmost power, Kong found himself unable to move Lord Goblin Hokage for even an inch. Struggling to hold his ground, Kong could barely keep his footing as Lord Goblin Hokage twisted the grip of his sword. To Kang's surprise, the swing of the sword resulted in him being completely flung out of the manga panel. Overwhelmed by Lord Goblin Hokage's strength, Kong pondered, my strength stat is 37, on easy mode, yet it was sufficient for me to easily conquer the 69th floor. Barely halting the momentum of the last attack with his sword, Kong admitted, I can't handle him at all. Even the cute little ghost remarked on Kang's predicament. Yet, Lord Goblin Hokage was far from finished. While Kong grappled with his struggles, the goblin leader prepared for another impending attack. In that very moment, Kong contemplated the advantage he might have in close combat considering the Lord's weapon was a large sword. In a swift motion, Kong successfully closed the distance to the Lord Goblin, both combatants poised for an impending clash. Praising Kang's initiative, Lord Goblin Hokage remarked, Not bad, but do you think the idea that just crossed your mind has never actually been attempted before by anyone? A system alert blared, Lord Goblin Hokage initiated a powerful attack. The proximity Kong had closed using the sliding technique was now a perilous situation leading to his potential demise. With a frustrated sigh, Kong exclaimed, Damn it. Yet, a devilish smile graced his lips just as the impending hit was about to land. The impact of the Lord Goblin's formidable attack struck Kong forcefully. Another system alert chimed in, You received an intense blow. All movements will be slowed for 10 seconds. Never before in the story had our main protagonist endured such a relentless thrashing after regressing. With his movements slowed, Kang's legs felt noticeably heavier, adding to the challenge he faced. Realizing he was at a disadvantage, Kang thought in frustration, Damn it. I can't even retreat in this state. I have to endure this for 10 seconds. And so, the countdown commenced. 10 seconds. Despite the odds, Kong pressed forward, heading straight for the head of his adversary. Aware that dodging was not an option, Kong activated his counter ability, ensuring that his opponent's attack would be met with an automatic counterattack. The clash of their swords echoed as they collided in a battle of strength and resilience. The Lord Goblin cast a menacing gaze at Kong. With just five seconds until the movement debuffs end, Kong prepared. Ignoring the ticking clock, the Lord Goblin Hokage initiated another attack. Struggling, Kong could barely keep his eyes open. In a move like the Matrix, Kong narrowly dodged the attack. Only three seconds remained until the movement debuff lifted. But, unlike the Matrix, Kong lost his balance and fell. Kong looked up, spotting a giant sword falling down. Kong activated the skill slide, escaping the barrage again. Kong bled and suffered 48 damage. As the timer hit zero seconds, movements were gone. Kong quickly hopped out of danger. The deadly goblin glanced to the side. He noticed Kong had jumped behind him. The pale ghost exclaimed, that goblin isn't a foe you can face. For now, escape and leave this floor. We'll return when you're stronger. Despite Kang's panting, he insisted, and oh, I must complete this. In surprise, the ghost questioned, what? It scolded him, that's a lord, you're aware it's unbeatable, right? Raising its voice, the ghost declared, the monster won't just disappear. Kong, determination in his eyes, boldly stated, if I prioritize safety, I'll gain nothing. When the floor reward comes, it's sure to be reduced. Kong clarified, we can move between floors freely, but... When the player advances, second floor rewards shrink, experience and gold drop to a fifth, special awards vanish. With courage, Khan stood up, saying, T.O. claim all the rewards on this floor, I must. With newfound courage, Kong rose to his feet, declaring, so, in order to secure all the rewards on this floor, the white ghost, now worried, shouted, you are too arrogant and reckless, you have always been careful so far, but now you want to challenge him? Kong responded, I have no idea what you are talking about. Everything I have done so far was to create this situation. He continued, I do not care about survival because I am just doing it to increase the risk of the challenge as much as possible. Our fearless Kong, devoid of fear, in the system notification now understood Kang's intentions. A system alert declared, you are now facing an opponent against whom victory is impossible. Despite this, your mind remained unwavering, and your fighting spirit soared. Your will increased, and all stats were boosted. You would not waver during battle, equipped with eyes that could detect your opponent's weak points. Confidently, Kong believed the third floor would not present an enemy impossible to defeat. There's definitely a way to handle this. As Kong contemplated, he noticed that the Lord Goblin still hadn't descended from his throne. The ghost also caught on to Kang's realization, the Lord Goblin lacked legs. 
Kong concluded that the Lord Goblin couldn't get off the throne, giving them a chance. Acknowledging Kang's bravery, the Lord Hokage Goblin respected his refusal to retreat. So, from now on, I will actually be serious with you for once, declared the Goblin. In a cocky tone, the Goblin added, How will you face me now, warrior? Violating the wall with his majestic hand, Kong activated the skill UNBREATH, gathering all his strength. Kong prepared for a powerful punch. With a resounding BAM, Kong shattered the wall in front of him with a single punch. The entire roof began to shake and collapse. Marvelous, exclaimed the Lord Goblin as he observed everything about to tumble down. However, with a single attack, the Lord cleared all the debris falling upon him. The Goblin leader remarked, Good job, but unfortunately for you, it doesn't hurt. The collapsing rubble should be falling on you, Kong. Undeterred. Kong raised the magic staff to activate the skill confusion. The Lord immediately found himself covered in the spell of confusion. Kong then began to summon fire with his magic staff. Arrows and fireballs surrounded the Lord, but he remained unfazed, wondering if they would even hurt him. The spell nightmare failed to affect the Lord Goblin. The Lord Goblin Hokage swung his sword, asserting, However, you cannot hurt me like this. With a powerful roar, the Goblin Hokage swung his sword once more. The extremely overpowered Lord Goblin Hokage was shocked as Kang's attack penetrated his chest. Thrusting his sword deep into the Goblin Lord's back from behind the throne, Kang left the formidable adversary baffled at how he survived the falling roof. Menacingly, Kang touched the throne and activated the skill, forced battle. Drawing his arrow, Kang became immune to all attacks except those from the throne. Upon touching the throne, Kang felt the skill forced battle activate between him and the throne. As a result, the Lord Goblin went flying away with his throne. The Lord laughed out loud, exclaiming, Ha ha, ha ha, you are able to use skills in that manner. Impressive, O oh warrior, the Lord expressed gratitude to the gods, loudly screaming that this was his final battle with Kong. The White Ghost was watching the fight from the back, and even it felt it. Kong was now charging the Lord Goblin head-on, using his overwhelming stats to win. So even when facing a strong opponent, the White Ghost thought that if it was Kong, then maybe. The Lord Goblin Ghost launches a series of slashes at our boy Kong, who is still trying to close the gap. Kong blocks this attack with his sword, and a loud clang happens, even sending the ghost away with the shockwave. The Lord Goblin lets out a scream as Kong manages to finally counter him. The Goblin remarks, that was great, but if you cannot close the gap, you would not be able to deal any damage. The Lord launches two thick slashes from a distance, leaving Kong no time to react. But Kong does not intend to move at all, even shocking the White Ghost with his decision. Kong takes those giant slashes head-on, directly on the chest. The pulverizing power attack managed to forcefully blast through Kong at an alarming rate. Kong received a whopping 462 damage, triggering the automatic endure skill. Looking like he was barely gasping for air, Kong took the intense damage head-on. The Lord Goblin was stunned at how Kong still didn't die with that hit, and immediately launched another attack. We find out that the Endure skill instantly cancels any fatal attack and makes Kong briefly invincible for one second. Kong, steeled with unwavering determination in his eyes, braced himself for yet another attack. During the fleeting one second of invincibility, Kong managed to land a precise sword attack on the Lord. The Lord Goblin was screaming in agony from the last attack, as a fountain of purple blood poured from his shoulders. In the meantime, Kong downed a recovery potion in one gulp and savagely plunged his sword deep into the Goblin. But to his shocking surprise, the Lord Goblin wouldn't let go of Kang's hand and viciously kicked him straight in the gut. It was now or never for Kong, so he brought his sword down furiously once more. Kong had finally managed to overpower the Lord Goblin, and now sat triumphantly above him. Even the Lord Goblin was awestruck at the outcome, as Kong sat above him, panting and victorious. The Lord Goblin shed tears of admiration, praising our boy Kong, impressive. Oh warrior, this was followed by a system alert. Kong had triumphantly defeated the Lord Goblin Hokage. Kong was exhausted from the battle, remarking that it was finally over. As a result of this grueling battle, Kong received powerful new skills and had already leveled up twice. He opened his system window to check on what new skills he had unlocked. Hmm. System alert. Kong received an increase in soul quality and the skill Power Strike. Power Strike was at 1% proficiency, and the damage of this skill increased proportionately to mana used. Kong also received the skill Acceleration at 1% proficiency, with a mana usage of 5. It allowed Kong to swiftly close the distance to a target. He also received the Secret Reward. Proficiency Increasing Potion, which he saved for now. Kong flashed his necklace of the master at the adorable white ghost, 
as this necklace increased all stats by 3. So far, Kong had reached level 12, with 430 health, 75 mana, with his attack and defense being the lowest. Kong remarked that at this rate, he would surpass his previous life stats before reaching the fifth floor in solo mode. The white ghost was still staring at Kong in awe, whispering, you, but then it waved it off, and even Kong wondered what the white ghost was up to now. The mischievous white ghost said it was nothing and suggested they move on to another floor now, but Kong said they should grab the Rakarada's rewards first. Kong, with the help of the stairs, made his way laboriously back to the second floor. Khan was now inside the Rakarada's altar, with the white ghost at his side. Looking back at the white ghost, Kong asked, Why are you so scared, little ghost? A foreboding red mist started to accumulate in front of Khan. With a system alert, you have passed Rakarada's trial. Rakarada's is very satisfied. Kong realized that Rakarada's knew the Lord was hiding on the third floor and gave him this trial with that knowledge. Rakarada's sent another sly request for Kong to become his apostle, which Kong immediately refused. The influence of Rakarada's decreases, and as a reward, Kong obtains a protective shield along with the skill the continuous trigger. Kong opens his system window to inspect the shield stats. The shield provides him with a substantial 430 additional health, effectively granting Kong two health bars. Shocked, Kong realizes the limitless possibilities of having two separate health bars. Rakarada's bids farewell. Looking forward to the next meeting, as Rakarats vanishes, Kong notices that even the red mist dissipates. Kong questions the white ghost about its reluctance to approach. The ghost reveals to Kong, you have no idea what kind of terrifying existence Rakarada's really is. In the next scene, Kong steps onto the fourth floor, knowing that defeating the boss is the key to progress. Recalling from his previous life, Kong remembers that the fourth floor in solo mode is the orc's domain, as Waifu-san mentioned. Kong cautiously opens the floor, aware that the upcoming orcs will possess both extreme power and some level of intelligence. Upon entering, he spots a giant, glowing white altar radiating with magical energy. A system alert pops up. You have now discovered the altar of Balathazar. As Khan expected, this is a path connected to the god Balathazar, allowing the god to exert influence through this place. The white ghost informs Khan that Balathazar is the god of victory, neither entirely good nor bad. Another system alert follows. Balathazar wishes to test you, who has visited his altar, and Khan willingly accepts the trial. A subsequent system alert notes. Balathazar revels in your decision. He is reading your experience. Khan ponders as the cute ghost reveals that since Balathazar is the god of victory, he will read Kang's memories to determine his worth. After reading Kang's memories, Balthazar proposes an empowered trial for Khan. Again, Khan questions, mentioning he already received one from Rakaratas. The ghost responds, Well, it makes sense. There's no way Balthazar wouldn't like you. The ghost advises Khan that it's fine to accept the quest as other gods won't break their contracts like Rakaratas did. The white ghost gazes at Khan, pondering the decision he would make. Our boy Khan, of course, accepts the quest, greatly delighting Balthazar. As a result, Balthazar's area of influence shrinks, having gained agreements from the residents of the fourth and fifth floors. Now, Balthazar begins to change the fourth floor. As the ground starts to reshape, Khan and the white ghost fall down. Khan maintains his balance, leaving the white ghost dumbfounded and yelling, what the hell is going on? The entire fourth floor is now levitating, undergoing a transformation. Khan gazes at this surreal sight, wondering, is it over now? Even the white ghost witnesses this phenomenon for the first time. Without hesitation, Khan makes a run towards the red door, leaving what lies beyond as a cliffhanger. Khan is shocked at what he is seeing in front of him right now. The labyrinth has changed into a straight line closely resembling the Temple Run game. The ghost reveals that Balthazar is involved in making the tower, so we can say this is not surprising. The little ghost is shocked. Hey, you are going already, says the ghost. Khan gives a hero response. It's not like anything will change if I keep staring at it. It is best to check out things quickly. A giant orc awaits him as Khan enters the first room. In the system alerts Khan, a sword-wielding orc has appeared. The orc takes a menacing battle stance and Kong now understands what residents of the fourth floor agreed meant these orcs. Kong holds his sword high, his battle stance to confront the orc, but Kong blocks the attack, and only four damage is dealt to Kong as a result. He notices that he has full HP, but the HP of the shield has been dropped instead. Now Kong leaps into the air, slashing the orc's big arm biceps, but the orc immediately counters with the swing of his own. Our boy is wondering, in his previous life, the orc would be defeated, 
but now it was tougher, wondering if it did something, the ghost is also in awe, realizing Balthazar had set up a 1v1 until the end to achieve victory, as the battle progresses, Kong activates the skill power strike, and with his next blow, Kong finishes off the orc with a single power strike, even the orc is satisfied with this honorable battle, and passes away happily, finally, Kong is victorious against the sword-wielding orc, Kong smiles because there are only 9 rooms left, and he gets going, Kong again breaks no sweat and remains victorious against the sword-wielding orcs, and his level also increases, as our boy Kong takes his sword out from the orc, he is already done with 5 rooms, and only 5 are left, Kong looks at his HP bar, which is full after leveling up, and even the shield health is full, now Kong enters the 6th room, and here is an orc wielding a spear, the orc manages to dispossess Kang's sword with his single strike, even Kong was shocked, but in the next moment, Kong activates the skill counters, automatically counter-attacking the opponent, Kong wonders why the orcs are so weak, they would all die in a single attack from our boy Kong, he thinks maybe the reason why he is overpowering them is that the orc lacks skill, Kong tries to mimic the movement of the spear-wielding orc to copy his skill, but just as he thought, by only copying, he would not be able to gain skills, Kong wonders how the orc was able to learn spear-wielding technique, as he was wondering, the little ghost chimes in, do you want to learn swordsmanship, Kong answers, I do, but why ask so suddenly, the ghost replies hastily, it is nothing, let's go to the next room quickly, in the seventh room, Kong defeats the orc wielding a giant axe, in the eighth room, Kong destroys the orc using a boxing technique, without struggling, Kong has already managed to reach the room of the boss, the tenth room, there was a giant red door in front of the boss's room, now that Kong thinks about it, he wonders how he would be able to find the secret room on this floor, Kong decides to look for the secret room after he is done with the orc boss, at the same time, he is now facing against the orc boss, system alert, an ORC fighter has appeared, as Kong takes his battle pose, he hears the sound of someone desperately crying, when he looks at where the crying comes from, he notices a girl begging, save me, save me, the scene reminds Kong of a scared cat, as the little girl is crying, questioning why things suddenly happen like this, the little ghost yells, why are you here, you were alive, the crying girl looks back, ha, huh, sir warrior, the girl throws herself at our boy Kong and, with no hesitation, requests to be saved, the girl, panicking, explains, the labyrinth suddenly started to shuffle violently, and I ended up right next to the orc, meanwhile, the white ghost can't hold back his laughter, Kong does not bother and goes straight to face the boss, while the ghost and girl get acquainted, Kong remarks that this orc would not even look at the girl, as he has his eyes set on me, Kong activates the skill acceleration and faces the boss seriously, the boss orc swings at our boy Kong, but he dodges the attack swiftly, now Kong activates the skill strike, dealing massive damage to the orc boss, the attack makes the orc bleed, and it enters a berserk state as a result, the orc lets out a massive roar, showing its ugly, massive teeth, with a single attack in its berserker state, the orc boss manages to push back our boy Kong, meanwhile, Kong activates acceleration once again, this closes the gap between him and the orc, throwing the orc boss off guard, along with acceleration, Kong activates the skill power strike on top of it, resulting in sending the orc boss flying away, the girl is shocked by the level of power displayed by Kong just now, with his last attack, Kong managed to destroy the boss of the fourth floor and leveled up as well, the cute girl found this impossible, how can Kong, while still being on the fourth floor, defeat the orc boss so easily, our boy handsomely looks back at the girl, asking, what are you, the girl is already kneeling at our boy Kong, replying, I'm a player, what else would I be, our boy bends down and once again asks, and what about you, what are you, she reveals that she entered the tower to learn more about the mysteries, Kong, surprised, says, magic, the cute girl answers, you must have come from a world with no magic, how strange, the cute girl continues, not everyone can use magic, you need innate talent, I had no talent but wished to learn magic more than anyone, the cute girl conjures magic at the palm of her hand, she reveals that this is the reason why I entered the labyrinth as she conjures her spell, the cute girl introduces herself as Lilis, she is the one who conjures magic, she conjures up a beautiful night sky, and both she and Kong watch the beautiful view in awe, this is the first time Kong has seen someone casting magic from their hand, the cute girl thanks our boy Kong but unfortunately, there is no way she can repay him, for that, she is sorry, the girl adds, I am already broke and have nothing to give, but Kong interjects, give me the magic power you have, the cute girl is amazed at what our boy Kong just told her, Kong boldly tells her, magic, I wish to learn that, 
Even the adorable girl is momentarily silent due to Kang's request to learn magic. The girl apologizes to Kang, acknowledging her inability to grant him magical abilities. Kang expected this and suggested negotiation, but the ghost interjects, proposing teaching magic instead. The ghost, coming to the rescue, convinces the girl that sharing basic magic won't harm her. The ghost adds, isn't it enough in return for saving your life? The girl nervously agrees. Well, that's true. The ghost emphasizes it's not bad for her. The ghost asks, till what floor have you managed to clear? Embarrassed, the girl replies, only the ninth floor, beyond was too difficult for me. The ghost reveals Kong as the one descending beyond the ninth floor, acknowledged even by gods. The labyrinth changed due to him. The ghost adds that with magic, Kong would indeed be able to save many lives further down the floor. Thus, the ghost states that it will ultimately end as an opportunity to learn magic that you have not previously acquired. The girl was genuinely shocked at the unforeseen prospect of learning a completely new kind of magic. After bamboozling the girl with intriguing facts, the white ghost asks the cute girl, have you reconsidered your decision now? The cute girl, now brimming with joy, enthusiastically shouts, now that I've thoroughly thought it over, great, I will teach you. Even the girl is noticeably shocked, asking the white ghost if she has become more extroverted than before. But the cute girl discloses that she was forcibly chased out of the place where she was initially positioned, so she won't be able to teach magic immediately. The girl requests Kong to meet her in the secret room of the sixth floor, to which Kong nods in agreement without hesitation. The cute little girl then claps her hands, skillfully wielding her magic wand with a gleam in her eyes, and starts to gradually disappear with an invisible cloak, all the while smiling and saying, see you on the sixth floor. The ghost realizes how this girl had ingeniously managed to clear the fifth floor. It was, perhaps, with the assistance of an invisibility cloak. Kong is genuinely amazed. Wow, so, that is magic, thinks Kong. Afterward, Kong gives the white ghost a more profound glance. Kong asks the white ghost why it was suddenly assisting him. The ghost, embarrassed, yells, what, am I not allowed to be nice? Or what? Our boy Kong wonders why the white ghost changed its behavior after he hunted the Lord Goblin Okage. The ghost explains itself, thinking of it as me recognizing potential in you, Kong. The cute ghost adds, I will be assisting you from now on and won't be dead weight, so forget it. Our boy Kong is urged by the ghost to move to the next trial quickly, but Kong nonchalantly sits down, telling the ghost to let him eat first. Kong finds out from his system window that our waifu San and the red guy cleared the first floor. While chewing on a black leg piece, he notices only two of them attempting to learn skills, as he instructed them. Now, Kong decides to organize the things in his inventory. He retrieves a scroll of engraving from his inventory capable of engraving a special power onto equipment. This scroll was the reward from the secret room of the fourth floor. Luckily, the task was just finding Lily. Without delay, Kong uses the scroll on his ceremonial sword of Rakaratas. The engraving was a success, granting him passive recovery of 5 health upon killing an enemy. On attack, there is a chance to push the target. Bingo! Kong is content with the new abilities of the sword of Rakaratas. Finally, Kong descends down to the fifth, with the cute ghost following closely behind, and like every other floor, we again enter the shop of the old man. The old man speaks, back already. The floors sounded chaotic. Was it another trial? Kong replies with a nod. Kong decides to sell everything he has to the old man first. However, an item in the old man's shop catches Kang's eye. Kong inquires with the old man if he may inspect that bottle containing yellow powder. The item is termed the power of blessing, and rumors suggest it can bestow blessings. The old man informs Kong, as it says, it can grant blessings, but no one knows if it is true. The old man reveals some bathed in it to increase their luck, and some incorporated it into their equipment, but it had no discernible effect. Kong asks the ghost if it knows anything about it, but the ghost replies that it doesn't have any information. In the past life, many were drawn to the word blessing and purchased it. However, since it had no effect, they dismissed it as trash. That was until Kong stumbled upon secret discovery of this thing. The old man discloses that he acquired these items at a bargain and has only three of them. Kong promptly responds, I will buy all of them, leaving the old man in a state of shock. The old man hands over the expensive bottles of blessing to Kong. Kong stores the powder in his inventory and bids farewell to the old man. Kong reveals to us that the genuine power of blessing is a subtle control over chance. The old man urges Kong to return soon as he makes his way. When questioned about the powder by the ghost, Kong informs him, you'll see what it does soon. Meanwhile, 
Khan receives a system alert, informing him that Balthazar is genuinely satisfied with your result and is enthusiastically looking forward to rewarding you. The little ghost acknowledges Kang's impressive feat, emphasizing that gods are willingly prepared to cut away significant portions of their range of influence solely to grant him favor. Kang ponders whether his range of influence holds such paramount importance. The little ghost, clearly agitated, retorts, influence, what a ridiculously stupid question, the only thing gods care about is maintaining and expanding their influence, the gods, the little ghost adds, are unwilling to sever their influence even for their most loyal followers, and, at best, offer only minimal rewards, the white ghost, aiming to drive the point home, tells Kong, do you finally grasp the extent of the value the gods are placing in you? The cute ghost adds her perspective. That is truly something to take pride in. Unbeknownst to Kong at that moment, he perceives the situation as merely the completion of a quest and the receipt of a reward. Kong responds to the unfolding revelation with a cold demeanor, asserting, to me, it remains nothing more or less than a reward. Finally, Kong steps into the first room of the fifth floor, where an orc fighter eagerly awaits his arrival. Kong astutely observes that the monsters exhibit increased strength compared to before and unhesitatingly launches into an attack. The orc effortlessly blocks Kang's attack, displaying formidable defensive skills. Meanwhile, Kong activates the passive ability of his enhanced Crimson Sword. This action not only blows the orc fighter away but also creates an opening for a subsequent attack. Kong then triggers the skill Powerful Strikes, successfully landing consecutive attacks on the orc fighter. However, the battle is far from concluded. Kong prepares for another round against the resilient orc fighter. Their weapons clash in a continuous exchange, and until now, the orc remains evenly matched, going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Kong. Over, in the next instant, Kong skillfully seizes an opportune moment and lands a fortunate hit on the orc fighter. Finally, with the assistance of a well-executed power strike, Kong successfully obliterates the orc fighter. Kong acknowledges that the strength of the first orc fighter on the fifth floor is comparable to the boss orc on the first floor. Kong contemplates that if the initial orc displayed such formidable strength, the final orc in the last room would likely be immensely overpowered. Our boy wears a grim smile on his face, anticipating the challenge that lies ahead. The sound of Kong fighting with the orc fighters echoes throughout the fifth floor. Kong got his hand sore after fighting boss-level orc fighters one after another. He realizes the orc fighters are getting tougher as he comes out of the fifth room of the fifth floor. But Kong doesn't lack motivation and grins because as soon as he clears this floor, he can learn magic. Thinking of magic, Kong asks the white ghost, how does he know Lilis? The ghost replies, A.H., that shorty? The ghost reveals to Kong that as long as you remain inside the labyrinth, your lifespan becomes unlimited, and she was already here when he first entered the labyrinth. The ghost says, just like before, she was about to meet her demise on the fourth floor in front of the orc, and the ghost's first meeting with the cute girl was him saving her as she was so pitiful. Kong wonders, wait, how long ago was that? The ghost replies, well, if you take the outside time into account, maybe 100 years. So this girl has been inside the tower for well over 100 years and still has not been able to learn powerful magic yet. Poor girl. The ghost tells Kong that he did help her a little but could not believe that she was still alive. Kong realizes that the characters inside solo mode are not NPCs and have a life of their own. Meanwhile, somewhere else in the tower, we see goblins noticing a door slowly opening. The goblin is confused, wondering who the hell is throwing rocks inside. The puzzled goblin looks at the stone going out of the door. As it was chasing the stone outside, our waifu san was waiting for an ambush. Waifu san shuts the goblin's mouth with a cloth and brutally defeats it. Our waifu san squeezes the goblin, and it is struggling for an escape. Waifu san lets out a few. Using this strategy, she had managed to kill all the goblins. Waifu san then reveals in the chat that she managed to defeat the boss goblin of the first floor by burning it alive and closing the door. The red also adds that he managed to discover something very cool. But Kong warned him in the meantime, telling other gods are fine but don't get involved with that backstabbing racker. The red guy almost wet his pants as he received Kang's warning. Both our waifu and red guy expressed their gratitude to Kang because of whom they were still alive. Witnessing all this in the community chat, an ugly guy was gritting his teeth. The ugly guy started to talk trash in the community with the backing of his goons. The ugly guy posted, stop being so cringe, and over exaggerating, Kong this, Kong that. Our waifu san was pissed as someone belittled her beloved Kong in the community chat. The ugly guy was from easy mode 
and he told them to stop over-exaggerating their achievements, resulting in an all-out war in the comment section. Even the red guy can't take this anymore, reading all the hate comments in his system window. He fights back, shouting, how dare you say that? In solo mode, all the monsters are terribly strong. But the ugly guy instigated this matter even more by insulting the red guy. Then who told you to choose solo mode? Meanwhile, Kong was looking at all the chaos in the comment sections for his community window. Kong realized that there were no deaths in the first month in easy and normal mode. So he thought that maybe that's why the ugly guy was being cocky. The players in the easy mode player were already jealous and hated the solo mode players by reading their chats of reward and skills. This continued over time, and after a month, they showed their true colors. Kong is well aware of this because the same thing happened in his previous life and is happening now as well. And the creator of such hate and jealousy was the same ugly guy that did it in the past too. The ugly guy has now crossed the limit. He said that the skills Kong is talking about, defeating a rat in 1 HP. Oh H my god, this is all nonsense. Kong smirked. He can roughly see how desperately this guy is trying to instigate a fight. Even in his previous life, everyone had noticed this event in the easy mode. Kong had confronted the ugly guy by telling him to stop creating hate and targeting other players. The ugly guy cringed very hard, seeing himself getting confronted like this. Even then, the ugly guy began to get completely pissed and dared to grab Kang's collar. Kong realized this ugly guy must have already created a guild and conquered the easy mode as Kong is not in the easy mode this time around to stop him. In order to control the masses, the ugly needed an enemy, so he chose solo mode people as that enemy. In the tower, people on different modes cannot meet the players of the other mode, so the ugly guy thought people from the solo mode cannot retaliate against him. But Kong was about to scare the life out of the ugly guy in the community window. I will see you in one month. With a single message, Kong had sent shivers down the ugly guy's spine. For now, Kong closed the community window and ran to face the final boss of the fifth floor. The big red door awaits Kong leading to the boss's room. System alert, the final boss of the fifth floor, Orc Vice Chieftain Lartan, has appeared. Our boy Kong took out his sword, scoffs. Oh, it is not a lord, but the ghost warns Kong, a vice chieftain is not weak either, and most players fail to defeat him. But the cute white ghost says, but if it is you, it will be fine. Kong nods back in agreement as he walks toward the vice chieftain Orc. The vice chieftain surprisingly speaks, it says, Oh, Grand Warrior, I thank you for your fighting spirit. For once, the gods did something useful for us. It continues, my companions, whom I take pride in, must have already passed away, right? Kong nods to confirm. Kong told the orc that they all passed away with a smile on their face. You guys value battle more than life, right? Asked Kong to the vice chieftain orc. The boss of the fifth floor replied, if that is so, then there is no point in just killing you. He clenched his fist, revealing, they were nothing but slaves imprisoned in this tower. A proud battle, you say? We don't even know when we will be freed. But the floor boss now speaks in gratitude. However, you not only freed us, you gave us honorable deaths. Yet we would want to stomp you, that is impossible. The fifth floor boss, charged with excitement, says, I cannot allow that. He yells, I would not allow that. You must offer me an honorable death. Oh, warrior, show me your true power. In his monster voice, he roars, grant me a fulfilling death. The final boss orc activates two skills, charge and rage, screaming Grarder. Even the system is telling Khan, your enemy is extremely strong. But Khan, unfazed, does a cool pose with the sword ready to attack the final boss of the fifth floor. Despite all that bravado, the boss was quickly defeated by Khan, barely conscious and, with his last breath, he thanked our boy Kong for a great fight. Even in his last words, the orc boss acknowledged that, despite weaker swordsmanship, he got beaten because of Kang's impressive skills. Furthermore, he mentioned the exceptional movements made by Kong were truly impressive. Haha, <laughs> it was an honorable fight, and with his last breath, the orc boss was defeated. Finally, our boy Kong cleared the fifth floor, successfully completing Balthazar's trial. As a result, the god reduced his area of influence for Kong and rewarded him with the Belt of Fighting Spirit. It has the passive ability to recover 5 health and mana each time Kong was victorious. Additionally, Kong obtained a new skill, proof of victory, in reward. It has 1% proficiency. This skill can continuously increase one stat. Remarkably, our boy chose mana, so this skill increased mana each time Kong became victorious. What a broken skill. Balthazar even offered our boy Kong an apostle's contract, but Kong had no interest in that and rejected it immediately. Delighted by his choice despite of begin rejected, 
Balthasar is looking forward to the next meeting. In the next scene, Khan and the White Ghost saw something spawn beside them. There were now two chests in front of them. Upon opening the first chest, he obtained a decorative sword with a plus 5 attack, the same attack as the Rakarata sword. The White Ghost remarked that Khan had received the rewards from the secret room without doing anything. The knife had a passive ability to store health, so Khan sliced his hand and 20 out of 500 health was stored in the sword. From another chest, he obtained the robe of dark vaulting. It could maintain stealth for one second and had a one hour cooldown. Just like the cute girl, Khan disappeared with a whoosh. Sound. As long as the enemy does not have a detection skill, this robe would not let anyone find you. Khan had a look at the entrance to the next floor, telling the white ghost, shall we go? As Khan made his way, he carried two swords in both his hands, skillfully wielding them in a manner that resembled the two sword techniques of Zoro. The white ghost also noticed this and started to sing his own praise, boasting to Kong by saying that he was exceptionally skilled with the sword. In fact, he was previously known as the sword master. Intrigued, Kong asks the ghost if it could teach him swordsmanship. However, the ghost replies, you are not ready for that yet and you would die at your current strength if you learn my swordsmanship. Undeterred, the White Ghost assured Kong that his swordsmanship was a high rank skill. Encouraging Kong to focus on climbing the floor, he added, I will teach you later. Kong enters the sixth floor, filled with swamp and greenery, holding the promise of a reward, a scroll of engravement and a secret award. The floor, however, was filled with swamp making it tricky to pass through. Additionally, the monsters on this floor were not affected by the swamp at all. Meanwhile, two unlucky lizard monsters were staring at our boy as if he were delicious food. The green lizard monster showed its ugly fangs, declaring a war cry. Then, the two unlucky lizard monsters charged at Kong with tridents. Kong menacingly looked at the lizard monsters quickly rushing in with their speed. Swiftly, he took out his magic staff from the inventory and cast a powerful skill, Fireball. The ugly lizard monster was hit with fire, while the other lizard was out of range. The sound of blazing flames echoed throughout the floor, and Kong managed to roast all the lizard monsters in his way. In the next scene, Kong dashed at another lizard monster, grabbing it by its throat. With a forceful smash onto the floor, he dealt a significant amount of damage as a result. Kong brutally defeated the lizard goblin using only his hands and his mana increased by one for every victory. While Kong was telling the ghost that his new skill made his mana increase overpowered, we see a terrified lizard monster trembling at the sight of Kong. From the sound of trembling, Kong looks back to find a terrified lizard monster. Kong, striking a cool pose, asks the lizard, what are you doing? Come here. The poor lizard monster lets out a loud roar of shame and is destroyed with a single blast from Kong. Nonchalantly, Kong makes his way forward, leaving behind piles of dead lizard monsters. The little ghost is now bored with how easily Kong defeats monsters. Kong adds, I have defeated so many powerful monsters, the normal ones are nothing. The little ghost tells Kong to look over there. It turns out the cute little girl Lilis left behind a hint to find her. Kong then presses the bulged out stone, and a series of steps appear out of the walls. The cute girl happily greets Kong, saying, You guys are here already, welcome to my secret room. Haha, ha. Lilis is now sitting in her chair, reminiscent of your English teacher when she is angry that you did not do your homework. The ghost asks Lilis, what are you doing? She replies that she was posing like a great mage, full of excitement. As the ghost tells Kong not to indulge in her madness, she was ready to tell them everything about magic. Our cute Lilis explains, you cannot learn magic directly like a skill, you receive it from others or earn it from the gods. She further explains that magic can do things that skills cannot, and that is the overwhelming value of magic. Also, our cute Lilis makes a smug face, saying, since I am teaching you magic, I am the master, and Kong, you have become my apprentice. Kong acts along and replies, yes, master. The white ghost yells at Kong to stop doing it. Our cute Lilis shows a fire spell, explaining, magic is a mystery, isn't it, Kong? Kong tells her that he only sees a flame, but Lilis remarks, that is because you are from a world with no magic. Finally, Lilis spills it out. The way to learn magic is to make a contract with a god of magic, and in her case, the god came directly to her. Lilis is now blushing, remembering the first time she learned magic. It was beautiful. Kong asks if he also needs to make a contract, as he is already paranoid from the apostle's contract. But our Lilis taps Kong on the face, saying, don't worry, 
dear, when I am here, she conjures magic with her hand and puts it straight on Kang's body. A system alert confirms our boy Kong has learned magic, which was transferred by Lilith just now. With a bright smile, she explains that inside the power, a person with magic can grant their teachings to a person with no magic. Another system alert chimes in, you can now use magic, and it has 1% proficiency. Right now, Kong could only create sparks. Lilith conjures flames at her hands once again and asks Kong, now tell me, what does it look like? Kong notices a blue flame enveloped by a purple flame, acknowledging it is clearly different. Our boy Kong feels something that he had never felt in life. He says, so this is what magic feels like. Lilith yells, great, now that the preparations are done. I will teach you various ways that you can obtain magic. She explains, the easiest way is to extract it from an object that contains magic power, like a magic tool or staff. Kong took out two magic staff from his magic inventory right away. Our cute girl Lilis casts magic extraction and takes the magic out from the staff. As a result, Kong obtains two magic skills, fireball and mental attack. With a whoosh, Kong casts the spell fireball, resulting in a ball of fire in his hand. As Kong gets the feel of casting magic, our Lilis is already praising him, saying, you are doing a good job. She then explains, the first way to learn magic was to let someone with magic directly teach them, like they did before. The second was with the help of a god's contract, which Kong does not fancy at all. She then explains her deal, she will first learn magic from god by offering items and teach it to Kong. He agrees to this arrangement. Our girl Lilis is glowing with happiness as she can learn new magic. Kong asks Lilis if he can then learn her invisibility skill now. Lilis scoffs, it is possible, but there is a price for that. She explains, that this skill was given to her by gods, and she needs an offering to have God's permission to transfer the spell. Kong asks Lilis, then if I need to learn a spell you don't know, I need two offerings, right? Lilis nods in agreement. Only weapons and equipment of high value or unique class can be offered as tribute. Then, Kong takes out an avalanche of weapons and shields from his inventory, asking, what about these? Lilis replies, this might work, but all this would not amount to even a single spell. Adding, this is magic, simple quantities won't work, you need something of value. Kong then asks about the item he obtained from Lord Goblin Hokage. She replies, this might get you a beginner spell. Kong then shows his Rakurata sword, saying, what about this one? She replies, it might work, but the god will probably grant a low-level skill to screw Kong over. But Kong adds, this is Rakurata's sword, the god might give something high rank. Even Lilis is frightened by hearing that name. Kong then takes out the worn-out wooden staff, asking, what about this one? Lilis is finally sparkling once again, replying, this might grant you a beginner spell. Kong, why is it the same as Lord Hokage's item? She replies, the gods like items related to them, so a magic staff is more valuable, and takes the staff. Our girl Lilis starts praying again and asks Kong, which spell do you want? She activates her magic, and the staff now starts to float in the air. She then warns Kong, invisibility is high tier, so it might not work, but every other spell is fine. Lilis explains that Kong already has two of her skills, so feel free to choose any other. She tells Kong about her spell, and the last one is a skill called Provision Production, which creates water and porridge. Kong chose the Provision Production spell immediately, surprising our Lilis. Kong explains that he can come back here anytime, and for now, he was tired of eating goblin meat. Lilis then tells Kong to wait for a moment and casts magic with her wand. A concentrated green light conjures above Lilis' head as she is chanting the spell. An eye-shaped entity appears above her head, which is probably the god of magic. Kong is alerted by the system, you feel an intense gaze. Both the white ghost and Kong wonder, is the god laughing right now? The wooden staff that was offered now started to blip from existence, like Spider-Man in the endgame. Kong obtains the provision production skill. It costs 5 mana and can create little amounts of food and water. Our girl Lilis is surprised at how easily the god of magic granted his permission as this magic was not beginner level. The white ghost explains that this boy Kong seems to be the chosen one, as he was favored by so many gods. Lilis asks Kong whether he wants to learn any more skills from her. Kong says, yes, I don't have anything to offer for now, so I will be back later. Our girl bids her farewell to Kong, saying, see you next time and don't forget to bring amazing stuff next time. Kong bids farewell as well, alright, got to go. I will see you again next time then. Kong steps out into the swampy sixth floor. He then conjures the fireball skill from the tip of his finger. With a single whoosh, Kong destroys all the swamp, saying, this is a much more convenient way to use magic. The ghost tells Kong, 
because of me, you can now learn magic, you should praise me more, you know, the white ghost also looks at what Kong is looking, noticing an increase in the HP of the protective shield, as the ghost is telling Kong to hurry up, Kong then starts to take off his shirt, since the ghost was a freaking grown man before, he is speechless at what he just saw, the ghost starts yelling, what the hell on earth are you planning to do, this around Kong by taking your clothes off, Kong says that he is doing this because he has something to learn, the little ghost lays down lifeless, saying, you took out all the defensive equipment just to learn a skill, Kong glances at the lizard monster approaching him from behind the trees, the lizard monster swiftly turns its gaze toward Kong, in the lizard monster's eye, Kong looks like a delicious meal served on a plate, it cannot take it anymore and starts to rush toward our boy Kong, Kong pays close attention to the tip of the trident coming his way, and as it is about to hit Kong, he manages to change its trajectory, Kong receives minor scratches from this and takes damage of 20, then a system notification reveals what's going on, Kong received less than half damage and got the skill sturdy, the attack did not reduce any HP, so Kong obtained the continuous trigger skill, complete nullification of the first attack, even shocking the white ghost, the lizard monster pissed from the embarrassing last fall finally stood up, and charged at our boy Kong once again, pointing his trident at him, as the trident penetrated Kong, the skill complete nullification of first attack activated, resulting into Kong taking no damage, with his bare hands, Kong grabbed the lizard monster by its neck, then he threw the lizard monster like a frisbee, it was defeated with just a single throw from Kong, with a grin, Kong asked the white ghost how was that, the ghost answers in amazement that was a crazy skill right there, the skill of complete nullification is what enabled Kong to defeat the s rank monster before regressing, so, no matter how powerful the attack is, it completely negates all damage, this skill is so handy that even s rank monsters cannot counter it, the ghost asked Kong if he could have obtained this skill without the protective shield, well, it would have been a lot more difficult, said Kong, Kong then uses the knife of self-harm to recover the HP of his protective shield, in the next scene, Kong explains to the white ghost that the protective shield helped him learn other skills, the ghost then asks Kong whether they are going to the next floor or not, to which Kong replies, not yet, I have only obtained the nullification of just the first attack, hearing this, the white ghost remarks, no way, is there also complete nullification of the second attack and beyond, the white ghost cannot believe how Kong could learn this skill and asks Kong a question, saying, if Kong gets hit twice, you will receive 40 damage, and the protective shield has only 25 damage, as a result, you will receive direct damage to your health, however, Kong takes out the power of blessing, saying, I have this to solve that problem, and then he starts to pour the powder of blessing on himself, after emptying the bottle of powder of blessing, Kong smashes the door open in front of a lizard monster, however, the white ghost is still not sure if this powder will help Kong learn the skill, at the same time, the lizard monster charges with his trident, Kong just takes the attack, activating the skill of complete nullification of the first attack, watching from above, the ghost wonders how Kong will manage to take two more attacks and receive less than 40 damage, the lizard monster, now pissed, charges again, so, on purpose, Kong takes the first attack, receiving only 17 damage, and 18 HP is left on the protective shield, the white ghost is shocked at how the damage from the lizard monster's attack went down from 20 to just 17, since lots of factors like accuracy, evasion, defense, as well as luck, are involved in an attack, according to the system, damage taken has a 10% range, so if the attack is 30, the range of damage is 27 to 33, and it is purely left to luck. Kong takes the second attack, resulting in zero HP left in the protective shield, so by using the power of blessing to increase his luck three times over, he managed to receive the minimum amount of damage, since Kang's health did not decrease from the last attack, he learned the skill of complete nullification of the second attack in a spectacular way. In the next instant, Kong disappears from the lizard monster's sight, then he lands a massive punch from the side and at the same time lands a powerful kick in the gut, resulting in the lizard monster completely disappearing into the sky, Kong nonchalantly says he forgot to control his power, then we see Kong focus on the heart of the lizard monster, in a single instant, Kong penetrates the heart twice, finishing the monster with a single blow, and with that, a system alert pops, telling Kong he accurately struck opponent's vital points and obtained the skill vital point strike, we find out that, in order to learn this skill, Kong had taken down a bunch of lizard monsters, the ghost reveals that the skill vital point strike is a powerful skill, and at 100% proficiency, 
it deals three times the attack damage on every hit. Now, all that was left of the sixth floor was the boss of that floor, but before entering, Kong activated the provision production to have some food and water. While Kong is eating the porridge, the white ghost, curious, asks Kong how it tastes, to which Kong replies it tastes like nothing. After that, the white ghost randomly asks Kong if mental attacks will stack, to which Kong answers they do but the next attack will start only after the first effect is over. At the same time, Kong came up with an idea and ignited the spell Fireball. We then see a flashback, where Kong had asked Lilis, in the labyrinth, magic is considered a type of skill, right? She answered yes, while it is different, but you are closer to beginning correctly. So, with that knowledge in his head, Kong cast the Fireball magic separately and tried to combine them together with his hands, but the fire went out and nothing happened. The ghost reminded Kong that what he was trying is high-level magic. He added that if it was that easy to cast high-level magic, then there would be no ranks. Then, Kong cast three Fireball spells simultaneously in front of him. Then, he threw all the Fireballs at the same time. It resulted in an explosion as expected by Kong. So, now Kong is wondering if he creates a similar effect like he did with the skill. Will that enable him to learn new magic in the same way as learning a new skill? Meanwhile, the white ghost is bored and asks Kong if he is not tired by now, to which Kong answers, not at all. Kong casts fireball in both of his hands, thinking that the fireballs won't combine, and before he gives them an order, they just stay there side by side. So, with the help of his new insight, Kong casts the spell fireball forward, then, he closely observes the fireball. While observing, he noticed that the power while staying and the power while in flight are different in the fireball spell. So, Kong thought, will this work? Hearing this, the white ghost asks, what work? Then Kong drank the recovery potion to completely recover his mana and started to sprint while casting fireball in his hand. In the very next second, he tossed the fireball spell and then started to chase it down. With his quick speed, Kong rushed and managed to arrive in front of the fireball spell he previously cast. While in front of the spell, Kong cast another fireball in his hand, and then he threw the spell. The white ghost was left flabbergasted as he thought, can they combine? As Kong is experimenting with magic, we are again reminded of the flashback where Lilis had confirmed to Kong that he was closer to beginning correctly when he said magic is a type of skill. In the present moment, Kong was moving toward the approaching fireball with another fireball in his hand, and as a result, both fireballs collided with each other, which ended up combining with each other, forming a giant firewall. In this way, Kong continuously cast the fireball spell. That resulted in a massive explosion, whose shockwave even threw him away. The white ghost just could not believe what he was witnessing with its eyes. It witnessed that, in this way, Kong had managed to learn a new magic spell, Fire Blast. After successfully learning a new spell, our boy is already facing the boss of the sixth floor, and, he is already closing in on the Lizard Man fighter. Without missing a beat, Kong activates the skill Fireball, and launches it directly at the boss of the sixth floor. So, the Lizard Man warrior crosses his trident to block the blazing hot Fireball, but Kong does not let that happen by activating another skill with a snap. The boss Lizard Man struggles with the mental attack cast by Kong and tries to shake it off by leaving its defensive stance. As the Lizard Man is barely keeping up with the mental attacks, at that very moment, the fireball is about to collide with the Lizard Man, and with a loud explosion, Kong deals some massive damage to the boss. Without giving it any time to recover, Kong once again spams the same combo. The Lizard Man stands no chance against Kong as he keeps on spamming his skills. Even the White Ghost feels pity at the Lizard Man, as he witnesses the Lizard Man boss having no answer against Kang's mental attacks and continuous attack. And with that, the helpless boss of the sixth floor finally falls down. Until now, Kong was using magic as support, but with his newly unlocked abilities, Kong could easily clear the lower floor with magic alone. For clearing the sixth floor, Kong obtains the secret reward Staff of Kalahart and the basic reward scroll of engravement. The Staff of Kalahart has the passive ability of using only one mana per skill cast, and he also obtains a fighter's necklace, which is weaker than the Lord Goblin Hokage's necklace. After which, Kong decides to go back to the cute girl's place to learn a new magic spell, as he has enough loot from clearing the sixth floor. Kong then hands over the necklace to our girl Lilis, and then she starts to cast the magic spell. Our girl successfully makes the offering, and with that, 
Kang obtains a new magic spell, a frozen arrow, we then find out that they are staying inside a room at the top of the tree. It is a safety zone clear automatically after Kang clears the floor. Kang activates the magic spell, and a blue arrow summons in his hand, and then the ghost starts to murmur something with Kang, which is followed by a bit of awkward silence afterwards. Then the white ghost tells our girl Lilis to come outside for a bit. While outside, Kang demonstrates his new magic spell causing a massive blast. This leaves our girl with a jaw-dropping expression, while the ghost explains to her that without the help of anyone, Kang was able to learn a new magic on his own. Our girls then ask Kang how he was able to learn a low-rank spell Fire Blast, because even after spending more than 100 years, she was able to learn only one low-rank spell Invisibility, and Kang asks her back is it that difficult? Still ranting, the girl adds of course it is difficult because it is magic and especially the difference in rank is insane between beginner and low-level magic. About to cry, our poor girl still cannot believe how Kang could do it on his own. So, to cheer her up, Kang tells her how he learned this spell. A few moments later, our girl is now twitching. The ghost remarks that should be a proper reaction as our girl lays down as if the soul has left her body. When Kang asks her if she is really unable to do it, she immediately gets up and explains that there is no way other mages would be able to do that. However, she then thanks Kang, as he showed her that there was a new way to learn magic, and she wants to do a few experiments of her own. And finally, they depart, bidding farewell to each other. Now, Kang is going below to the seventh floor, and on the way, he opens the system window. Kang has reached level 18. His protective shield HP goes up to 39 and mana has increased to a staggering 104, and at last, the window remarks that the target is in peak condition. At this point, Kang realizes that his current stats have finally surpassed the stats of his previous life after clearing easy mode, and the system notification pops. You have now entered the seventh floor. Since our boy's time is about to come to an end because the tenth floor is not that far away, Kang asks the ghost so are you gonna teach me your swordsmanship now? The white ghost nods in agreement and explains. He is going to teach Kang the imperial sword art. Then he says that he is from the Carved Empire, an empire that reveres power. That's why they consider weak people as useless. He then reveals that their family is the same. And he even had to get rid of his own brothers and sisters so that when he ascended the throne, there was only one brother alive and that is how he was destined to rule his land. But nevertheless, it is his one and only world, and now even if he wants to go back, he cannot, so that is why he is leaving behind a trace of his world. And while moving on, Kang then goes to an open area, deeming it a good place to learn his swordsmanship. Then the white ghost explains that what he is about to teach is a sword art form, and the speciality of it is in strength while completely ignoring defense. The best form of defense is offense, so this swordsmanship neutralizes the enemy. The ghost then asks Kong what he will do now, implying if he wants to learn or not, to which Kong replies by saying he has no reason to refuse. Then the ghost gently taps Kong, and he continues reciting a spell in his humanoid form. Then a system alert chimes in, you've met the owner of the Sword of the Scarring Storm, you have obtained the high rank skill the Sword of the Scarring Storm. After completion, the ghost tells Kong to check it out. On looking, his system window shows that the high rank skill, the Sword of the Scarring Storm is at 0% proficiency. So the white ghost explains that normally proficiency is at 100%, but since he has passed away, the proficiency is at 0%, meaning Kong has to work on it. Still, the ghost wants to help Kong as much as possible and tells him to listen up. The white ghost then instructs how to move while Kong follows the instructions. Then Kong moves his sword, ending up in a weird stance that even leaves ghosts disappointed. Seeing Kong struggling for the first time, the white ghost remarks, How am I going to teach you at this rate? Then the white ghost explains to Kong that it is not that he doesn't have talent, it is just that the swordsmanship requires more experience which Kong lacks. So as a result, Kong questions if experience is the same as proficiency, to which the ghost replies, yes, it is a type of experience. So at this point, Kong remembers that he obtained a proficiency increasing potion after defeating the Lord Goblin Okage, and the fact that he still has not used it yet. Therefore, he takes out the potion from the inventory. It has the passive ability to increase the proficiency of a skill by 5%, and then Kong drinks the potion. This leads to a system alert, which tells Kong that the skill of the Sword of the Scarring's proficiency is increasing. Looks like Kong has a better grasp of this high-level swordsmanship now. So immediately after, Kong grabs his sword, and even the ghost notices the sword aura and techniques displayed by Kong. From the ghost's perspective, it looks like he is watching his old self-practice in front of him, and just as he used to raise his hand to the sun, in the same way, 
Khan raises his Rakarada sword. After practicing his new fancy moves, he tells the ghost that it worked. As tears fall down from the ghost's eye, he says, so this sort of method also works, thanks. Khan then asks, did you say something? But the ghost goes back to his usual self and says, "Ah, uh, no, I did not say anything. In the next scene, the old man asked why Khan was purchasing junk like that. While listening, Khan did not speak and just looked at the rusty sword which had attacked plus one. Without wasting any time, he said goodbye to the old man. Now back on the lizard man floor, sounds of swords clashing were heard, which occurred because Khan was smashing those tridents with the plus one attack sword. The ghost figured out that Khan wanted to practice the sword of the scarring storm by practicing against the monsters with a rusty sword as it made it a lot more difficult to kill them. The lizard then charges at Khan, but Khan can already see the monster's movements by using his future sight hockey. By that, I meant the Sword of the Scarring Storm. Khan, with two sword-style techniques, schools the monster. In the process, he stabs the lizard man and does a two-sword-style finishing move just like Zoro does to finish off the monster. However, the ghost says it is not accurate, and you should move your wrist by three centimeters. Khan, thanks to the Sword of the Scarring Storm skill, Khan cleared the seventh floor almost just like that. The ghost was now actively instructing Khan as he was constantly fighting. While fighting, the ghost suggested making all movements attacking, even when dodging. Listening tentatively, Khan did as he was instructed. Finally, after grinding all day, our boy was now asleep. With a touch of sadness, the ghost just stared at Khan, thinking that Khan is really an unusual one. This guy spends 12 hours every day battling and spends another 6 hours practicing movements of sword art. Then the ghost thinks, what kind of life Kong had lived so far. Regardless, the ghost likes that Kong is a crazy one. And like that, in the morning, we see Kong with some stone in his hand. It turns out Kong was tossing the stones in the air. And with a single deep breath, he was slashing the rocks in the air. It had a subtly visible cut when falling on the ground. However, after practicing the sword art technique for four days, this is what he could do now. And now, after practicing the sword art technique, he can fight like Tanjiro with observation hockey. A single lizard man unfortunately runs into Khan. Khan glances at the lizard man. Even the ghost was wondering what Khan will do. He, our boy, closes his eyes. And one step at a time, he moves his feet forward, emptying his mind. He is now using the sword art technique. In the next moment, Khan already feels the presence of the lizard man. Suddenly, in a blink of an eye, he is slashed. And in the same moment, followed with a double cross attack. But strangely with Kang's attack, it summons a water attack from the backside. He quickly ends the lizard man. As a result, the Kong sword of the scarring proficiency goes up to 3%. After the fight, the ghost reveals that the water skill just now is called Wolf Fong and it is the first sword of the sword of the scarring storm. While the ghost could teach Khan other swords, the opponents were too weak before that. Even at the tenth floor, the monster could not withstand it. And then the white ghost praises Khan that he had learned the first sword so quickly. After all the battle, Kang's high rank skill, the sword of the scarring storm, reaches 12% proficiency, with another alert mentioning, a sword art has been passed down from a ruined world. Now, only a single person has learned it. Meanwhile, somewhere in the lower floors, Waifu-san was really chewing the goblin's meat. It looked very difficult to chew, and it made her want to puke. Our Waifu-san was missing the meat from Earth. She likes long sausages and cheese pizzas. At the same time, a system notification managed to shock her. It was time for a special mission quest, return to Earth. For one week, everyone was about to return to Earth and they needed to return only after surviving. Everyone in the chat was excited to go back to Earth. They all love this new special quest, but the red guy does not think that it is necessarily a good thing. Everyone went aggressive on the red guy. How dare he say it is a bad thing? So the guy explained, the reason they were there in the first place was due to monsters. When they first appeared, they were capable of destroying entire cities. This made everyone in the room go silent for a moment. Watching the system window, our boy is well aware of the buzz of going back to Earth. And then, he summoned his new magic spell, Frost Arrow. Curious, the ghost asked, why are you glancing at the community window in the middle of creating magic? To which Kong responded, saying, I will be going out soon. The ghost asks if he meant going back to the lower floor, but Kong corrected him, saying, no, not there. And straight after that, he shoots the Frost Arrow at the wall, freezing it completely. So, for now. Kong assured the ghost that it will find out where Kong will be going out, but in the meantime, I will speed up breaking through the labyrinth. However, the ghost was confused about what place Kong was talking about. In the next scene, 
our boy has already opened the reward from the secret room of the seventh floor. He obtained the reward rune of agility. It had the ability to increase your agility by 10. Kong was so overpowered at this point that the boss of the seventh floor, the elite lizard man, was defeated without even breaking a sweat. And for defeating the boss, he obtained the item Scruffy One's earring, which increased the mana by 10. His next reward was the sleek leather armor that gave bonus defense. So, after collecting the reward, he went back to our girl Lilith's place to learn the new magic basic search. It had the ability to determine the position of objects for now. Our girl was about to burst into tears as Kong managed to already learn all her spells, and on top wanted to learn more new magic. So after gaining everything from the seventh floor, finally, Kong went down to the next floor. After seeing it so many times, the white ghost was kind of annoyed by how often Kong was checking his community board. Therefore, Kong answered it was nothing. He was just wondering why the one noisy that always slandered others was so quiet. But it turns out the ugly guy was losing his marbles, terrified of how he will face Kong when they return back to Earth. However, our boy Kong was eagerly looking forward to one week from now. But the white ghost had no idea what was to happen in a week and was getting more and more irritated. We then see Kong entering the 8th floor where little islands are floating, and immediately after, a bird monster is already screaming at Kong. Above him, the bird monster was already flying down to launch an attack, but with the help of the wall, our boy jumped straight into the air. Kong was so fast, the monster could not keep up, and with a single hit, the monster was immediately defeated. While landing, Kong remarked that these monsters were so easy to hunt, and it seemed useless to practice swordsmanship against them, as they are mere animal-type monsters. Anyways, our boy was already planning to clear this floor as soon as possible so he created a spark with his finger, and following that, Kong was just spamming fireball and frost arrow combination at the flying monster, defeating them with ease. To Kong, it was as convenient as walking. And finally, he discovered something peculiar on this floor. Turns out, our boy had discovered the altar of Dmon. The white ghost explained to Kong that Dmon is a god of a test, and he enjoys watching people struggle, realizing their own weakness. And with a system alert, Dmon wishes to test the one who has arrived at his altar. So with a smile on his face, Kong accepts the subquest. Now it started, water started to fly above the altar, and it transformed into a wall of water. The wall was designed to let anyone escape after accepting the quest. Finally, a black liquid started to come out of the altar. The liquid took the form of a warrior and rushed at our boy. By instinct, Kong moved back to maintain some distance. But as he moved, something surprised him. Turns out, his opponent was approaching at a very slow speed. So with just a basic attack, Kong passed the first trial, which increased his agility by one. He then noticed the black liquid coming out once again, spawning once again, ready to battle. His opponent had become faster than before, but to Kong, it was still very slow. So Kong effortlessly defeats it. The system notification confirms. Kong passed the second trial. As a reward, the strength stat was increased by one. So during the fight, the fight ghost explained that his opponents just now had the average strength of the first and second floor players. Meaning, with every opponent gives you the idea of the strength of players in each floor. And with a smile, Kong now wanted to check what his strength was. Easily, Kong passed the third trial, increasing intelligence by one. Similarly, he passes the fourth trial, increasing his agility by two. He then blocked an attack with his sword to check the strength level of his opponent, who managed to use a skill. So Kong activates his own skill, Frost Arrow, which his opponent tries to block. But upon contact, the opponent's defense shatters. And with a single spell, the sixth trial was cleared. Your mana is increased by two. He also noticed that each time he defeated an enemy, his mana recovered with no restrictions. So because of that, Kong went all out with spells clearing the seventh trial, which increased strength by three. Then Kong activated his spell, Confusion, followed by the Frost Arrow, defeating it in an instant. Now the eighth trial was cleared, and as a reward, his mana went up by three. And with that sound of silence spread through the surrounding, as nothing was coming out now, the white ghost burst out in laughter. It was hilarious, and Kong inquired what it was. Turns out the god can test the strength of the player up to the eighth floor only and the god did not want to lose his area of influence to further continue the quest. Kong remarks that other gods were fine with losing their area of influence to test me. Why is this god different? So the ghost explains it to him. That is because you are different. This god wanted to see his potential without losing his area of influence. But the altar is silent for now. Kong thought that it was talking to learn so he might hurry climbing down the labyrinth. So right after he said that, the altar finally moved. The god of Testmon now offered him an empowered trial. 
So, from now on forward, Kong is facing the shadows of the higher floor, and the shadow of the ninth floor takes his form. In the next instant, Kong barely blocks its attack. The power which Kong feels is at shocking levels. However, Kong defeats it and gets plus 4 strength as a reward. And then the skill spiritual increase activates on its own, even surprising Kong. While another shadow is forming, Kong asks the ghost what these things are. Turns out they are the souls of players who failed to clear the tower. In the next scene, the shadow shoots some arrows at our boy. So, to counter it, Kong activates the skill Fire Blast. A huge fireball then makes its way towards the shadow. At the same time, Kong activates the skill Madness, blasting the enemy. Then we see Kong using a frost arrow to defeat another shadow, clearing the tenth trial in the process. So according to the ghost's explanation, Kong figures that each shadow has its own unique movements and fighting style. Meanwhile, Kong battles with the upper floor shadows at intense speeds. Kong is now fighting the thirteenth floor shadow which shows various skills and with a fireball, Kong defeats the 14th floor shadow. Now, the 15th floor is having a go at Kong. As the fight goes on, Kong notices that the shadow has already reached his level or possibly above his. However, while they are sword fighting, Kong fires a cheeky fireball, blasting the shadow away. Then, Kong activates acceleration and power strike, swiftly defeating the shadow as a result. As Kong defeats the shadow of the 15th floor, all his stats considerably go up, which Kong thinks is crazy. While fighting, Kong figures that until now, almost 60, stat points were awarded. The white ghost remarks, all this because of you, crazy genius. I wonder how overpowered you will be after this is over. At this point, Kong is trying to beat the shadow of the 18th floor, but the shadow is quick and dodges Kang's attack. Then it dashes towards Kong. Turns out, the shadow manages to stab Kong, and the skill complete nullification of the first attack activates. With the next attack, he passes the trial. Meanwhile, the white ghost comments that there is no chance for the enemy to counter complete nullification of the first attack if it doesn't know it beforehand. While below, Kong is already struggling against the shadow of the 9th floor. Then, a system alert chimes in your opponent is an enemy who is impossible to beat. In the next scene, our boy activates the skill's craving, contempt for the strong, an impartial duel, emitting a powerful aura. With these skills activated, he once again clashes with the shadow. But the shadow is really powerful, it activates the skill assault. However, Kong already knows the weakness of this skill, it cannot be stopped midway. So to counter it, Kong activates the skill acceleration and power strike, stabbing the 19th floor shadow in the process as well as defeating it. Kong realizes that he barely managed to defeat the last shadow with his skill, but from now on, that won't be the case. Finally, the shadow of the 20th floor appears in front of our boy. Immediately, the shadow activates the skill of absolute victory. Kong, however, is turned on by this opponent, remarking things should be like this. Then they simultaneously charge at each other. Loud noises of their swords clashing echo loudly on the floor. When the shadow manages to land a hit, Kong activates Deflect to dodge the attack. However, the shadow manages to land a hit with its elbow, injuring Kong. So, to counter it, our boy activates the skill Madness, but the shadow activates the skill Backlash and becomes immune to the Madness skill, resulting in Kong receiving all the damage. Kong is brutally injured at this point, and is amazed the shadow used a skill that even Kong had not known. By activating Acceleration and Power Strike, Kong clashes once again with the shadow. Yet, he cannot finish off the shadow and takes 210 damage in return. Since it is an emergency, Kong activates the Road of Dark Vaulting, disappearing from the sight of the 20th floor shadow. And from its blind spot, Kong bids farewell to the shadow, finishing it off and passing the 20th trial in the process. As a result, all of Kang's stats go substantially up, but he is left gasping for air. And to his shock, Kong hears splashes forming another shadow. Turns out the trial is not over, and the shadow of the 21st floor starts to appear in front of him. The shadow of the 21st floor emits an intense aura. Even Kong is trembling with fear now. But with a cheeky grin on his face, Kong gives up and says, this is as far as I can go, Omen. So then finally, Omen's trial is ending. He is silent about the results. After completing Omen's trial, his stats rose to unprecedented levels. While on the 8th floor, he was already capable of breaking through the 20th floor. Finally, 
Ullman granted him a reward, Ullman's area of influence was shrinking, he received the right of validation as a reward, along with an additional reward for clearing an empowered trial. Additionally, he received the skill proof of limitations at 1%. When facing an enemy of the same rank, all stats are increased by this skill. Like all the other gods, Ullman offered him an apostle contract, which he immediately refused. Then, the petty god shot him for refusing. However, Ullman promised another meeting. Our boy was currently at the 20th floor level, so he decided to share all the strategies up to the 8th floor on the community board. In the next scene, he was already opening the secret room reward of the 8th floor, which was sturdy ankle guards. With his current power, the boss of the 8th floor was no match for him. Then, he opened the reward for defeating the 8th floor boss. It was a rune of Marnius there is a chance that it can grant an attribute to a weapon. He also obtained a secret discovery reward, exploiting touch. Whenever you damage an enemy, you absorb health equal to a set percentage. It was his first time getting a skill from a reward chest. After clearing the 8th floor, they proceeded forward. The ninth floor monsters were fully armored hobgoblins. All of the hobgoblins charged at him at once, but of course, he easily handled all of them. He then wondered how these goblins were stronger than the lizard man monster. So the white ghost pointed out that they were trained hobgoblins. They must have a leader. The Lord Goblin Hokage he faced before was a former goblin lord, and the current goblin lord resided on this floor. Then he faced the ninth floor boss, a hobgoblin chieftain. It tried attacking him with a mental attack spell, but he activated his invisibility to disappear from its sight. With a slash, the boss of the ninth floor was easily dealt with. Once again, he observed the markings on the wall, all pointing towards the same direction. Using the skill Disarm Trap, he found his way to the current Goblin Lord, who was sitting on an iron throne. This was the Lord Goblin Root R.A. It asked, were you the one that killed the former Goblin Lord? To which Khan agreed. The Lord Goblin said that since he was defeated by a warrior like him, he must have died with a smile. He thanked Khan on his behalf. Then he asked the Lord Goblin, why did you drag down the former Lord Goblin from his position? The Lord replied, I am going to lose my life someday anyway. Shouldn't I leave my mark behind? I did it because it felt better to die as a goblin lord. He noticed that the lord goblin had done it out of greed. Then the lord goblin took his fighting stance, ready for battle. Without wasting his time, the lord said, Let's fight, oh warrior. Their weapons clashed, producing a very bright spark, but our boy was too overpowered at this point. In the midst of the battle, the lord goblin acknowledged that he was inferior to Kong in all aspects like sword art, stats and skills. Then it retreated, putting some distance between them. The Lord said, even if there's no chance of victory, I shall do my best. Then, to honor this fight, he took out his most powerful attack, the second sword of the sword art technique. The result was obvious, the Lord Goblin flew way back from the impact, crashing into the wall. Then, as a reward, he got spears which had plus ten attacks double of Rakarada's sword actually. The system alert also confirmed his victory against the Lord Goblin Root R.A. Then he asked the White Ghost, shall we head back for now? In the next scene, he had learned the spell Curtain of Cover, it can hide your body presence. Then he went back to the shop and purchased all types of potions with all his wealth. They moved down to the 10th floor, the time to depart with the White Ghost was coming near. In the meantime, he had got a boot of swiftness in the Frostlight Sword with plus 11 attacks as a reward from the 9th floor. Now, we have officially reached the 10th floor. It also had a floating island at its base. The White Ghost reminded Kong that soon it would be over. It hovered over in front of him, saying, You do remember my quest, right? Kong replied, Yes, I remember. You want me to take your revenge by killing the person that killed you. Then the White Ghost thanked him for the fact that it could leave behind a trace of his world within Kong. The Ghost, being emotional, said, My world is ruined and I am also dead. We are finished. Leaving behind a trace was my role. He noticed that the white ghost was already saying farewell in advance, as who knows what will happen later. Two huge feet with long toenails are running. The feet are seen to belong to a big ogre that belongs on the 10th floor charging towards our main character. He grabs one of the ogre's huge fingers with his hand ready to thwart its attacks. He throws the ogre to the side with ease, slamming it against a wall and defeating it. The ogre's body is seen lying down on the ground as the system notifies of its defeat. Our main character starts making his way to the secret room on the 10th floor. He starts disarming the traps inside and his disarm trap skills proficiency rises by 2%. As he is disarming the traps, the ghost that has been following him wonders why he is delaying things as he is increasing the proficiency of the skill instead of breaking it open. 
His check comes back successful and he obtains a blue ring which provides 10 mana as he removes it from a skeleton finger. They arrive at the floor boss's giant red door. The ghost tells him that he will find its killer after they have defeated the boss and entered the hidden room. After defeating the one in the hidden room, the quest given by the ghost will end. He uses the rune of Marnius and the scroll of engravement which gives the chance to obtain a weapon and engrave a special power on a piece of equipment respectively. Our main character uses the two aforementioned items on the frost light sword which increases its attack by 11 and gives it the power called the light dwells within which has a small chance of inflicting the slow condition when countering an enemy. He is decently impressed with the power and asks the ghost if it is an existence associated with the labyrinth. The ghost tells him that he is technically connected with the labyrinth due to being dead and tied to his grave. The ghost tells him that it is free right now because of Taysan and that his root existence has not changed at all. Taysan tells the ghost that he was wondering something due to the ghost being tied up to him. The ghost is confused and asks Taysan what he is talking about. The space cracks in front of them and a portal appears with the two looking on. Earth is seen through the crack as the system notifies Taysan that it is time to return to Earth. The screen notifies them that a special quest is starting and tells them to brace for impact as they are being taken back to Earth. He closes his eyes and prepares to go back as they are seen teleported back to Earth. The sea of stars keeps shining during the occurrence of these events. The scenery changes to a beautiful sunny day in a town on the Earth between some mountains. There Taysan wakes up with the sun shining on his eyes as he lies on a road. He recognizes the familiar scent of grass which is different from the labyrinth smell and notices the strong smell of asphalt. He remembers that he got teleported back to the same spot as during his previous life. The ghost has gotten teleported as well and asks where they got dropped. The ghost is confused as he had never heard of this place in the labyrinth and asks again where they were while flailing his arms. The place smelled nasty as it had been over three months after the events had started. Our main character looks through the store and starts to pick up a blue can. He grabs the ham as well as another can of sweet corn. The ghost looks on in disgust as Taysand uses fireballs and cooks them over his sword. He eats the meat after cooking it on the sword and exclaims in delight as the ghost is surprised by his choice of cooking utensil. The ghost looks around the store as he has not seen Taysand's world before. Taysand continues explaining that by the system's judgment, the player's ownership is prioritized. They walk out as Taysan tells the ghost that he is not sure of the ghost being treated as an item as it is a living being. The ghost tells him to forget about that stuff and questions him what the things in front of it. Taysan explains the ghost about cars as it had questioned him about it since cars were abundant there. The ghost asks whether the tall buildings belong to any religious cults to which he replies to the ghost that they were normal buildings. Taysan asks the ghost about something in the sky as the ghost looks over. The sky is cracked and a huge hole is in the sky with some clack smoke escapes the hole. A green slime-like creature with multiple eyes is dripping down the sky and Taysan continues telling that these creatures continuously trod down to earth. It whips out its many tentacles and sneakily attacks him from behind. He grabs its tentacles with no effort at all as the ghost looks on. He asks the ghost about the creature flailing in his hands. The ghost takes a hard look at the creature and wonders if it is a divine race. The ghost feels that the creature is different and tells him that the creature is an outer. It explains that it is difficult to determine whether there is an existence going out of its way to do something like this. Taysan listens to this with a concerned face. He roasts the creature in his hand with the fireball spell. The system notifies the player about the start of the special quest which tells him to arrive at the Anyang City Hall alive. The ghost is impressed that at least there was a guideline. As they keep walking, the ghost notices that the area is empty. He wonders how many would press a choice that appeared out of nowhere as most would go into hiding hoping someone would come to rescue them. He thinks that this is the result of it as he walks over a corpse. Another corpse is lying in front of them completely eaten by maggots and flies. The ghost asks him why he was walking so slowly as he could go a lot quicker. Taysan tells him that he has someone he needs to meet. The ghost asks whether it was the people he was teaching in the community chat and Taysan replies they were not whom he was searching for and guesses that he would meet them soon enough anyway. He stops in his tracks in the middle of the road. A familiar face comes out behind a wall and greets him. He asks Taysan whether he also got the quest to go to the city hall. He introduces himself as GM Jungian, a player from the hard mode, and offers Taysan to go to a group of survivors together as Taysan remembers his past life. He grins happily after being able to meet Jiam again during this life as Jiam looks confused. He accepts Jiam's offer as the two walk over. 
Taesan and Gun walk together to the group of survivors. Gun greets the survivors and asks if they are all okay with a group of people warming themselves around a fire as they murmur. The people are relieved to see him back and one of them tells him that nothing has happened so far. He introduces Taesan to them as someone he considers to be a normal mode player and asks them to get along with him. The people murmur about seeing him for the first time and chalk it up to there being too many players in the normal mode to remember them all. Jiam claps his hands to bring the crowd's attention. He tells the crowd that they have already gathered all the nearby people and they should start heading towards the city hall. The crowd wonder even if it is a quest what would happen to them if there was a monster on the way. Gun reassures everyone that he will protect them in times of need. The ghost flies over the crowd and wonders why they are all so weak. Junjian leads the march. As they keep walking, the ghost wonders why Taesan went out of his way to meet up with Gun and mix up with a bunch of such weak players. One of the crowd points at something while scared and tells Jungian to look at it. It turns out to be a green monster as Junjian hides from the monster's line of sight. He tells the crowd to stay behind that rock as he sneaks up forward to slay the monster. Taesan recognizes the monster as F rank monster, which can be dealt with easily even by the ones from easy mode. Right now, the only ones who can deal with these monsters are the hard mode players as Jungian blocks the monster's strike with his shield. He slashes the monster quickly, defeating it. He tells the crowd to follow him as he has already beaten the monster. The others are relieved by this and look on happily. This event occurred again as Taesan looked on. During their march, all the monsters that appeared were dealt with by Jungian. The rest of the people would hide and only appear again if the area was safe. While Jungian was fighting, another monster appeared near the place where the crowd was hiding. It attacks them and they begin to run away from it, scared. They feel helpless as Jungian is preoccupied with another monster. They call for Jungian as Taesan picks up a piece of stone to throw. As the monster is about to reach somebody who is running away, the monster disappears. They are confused as to where the monster went as they could not even see any damaged window and are happy to have survived while the scene shows a hole in the ceiling with blood splattering on it. Jungian returns sweating and asks them if they are all okay and where the other monster went. One of them tells him that it could have been defeated but it just disappeared. Jungian refuses to believe the monster's disappearance and wonders who killed it as he was the only hard mode player around. He looks through the crowd to see Taesan looking calm and wonders if he has defeated the monster. He continues wondering as he realizes Taesan's name as well. He shakes his head to remove that thought. He tells the crowd to start moving again as they still were quite far away from the city hall. It is explained that Jungian kept clearing out all the monsters that appeared first while Taesan secretly handled all the monsters that appeared later. The march continued as the ghost was annoyed at them. The ghost said angrily that even if these people were at lower levels, they could still work together to defeat the monsters but they just kept running away. The ghost is seen extremely angry as he says this and insults the people by calling them pathetic worms. The ghost is frustrated that these people have no intention of doing anything by themselves let alone fighting and risking their lives. The ghost is completely furious at this point that these people entered the labyrinth as that was an insult to all those who have entered the labyrinth before. Taesan gets relieved that no one else can see the ghost as this is also his first time seeing him so angry. The ghost wonders, depressed, how these people survived for so long. Taesan whispers to the ghost not to be angry and says that he is the weird one and these people chose the easier mode unlike him. The ghost is confused by this talk of an easier labyrinth and tells Taesan that only one labyrinth exists in the universe which surprises Taesan. He tells the ghost that they need to talk. He tells the ghost about the different modes and how the monsters are set up differently and has the same shape up to floor 100. The ghost tells him that the labyrinth he knew is not divided up as the labyrinth always returns to normal when a god has separated the dimensions for a while. The ghost feels that whoever created this labyrinth just copied and pasted the original labyrinth awkwardly as a structure with a lot of buildings coming out of it is seen during the explanation. He thinks about how only F-rank monster have been sent their way as if it was a way to test them as A-rank monsters could be sent right away to kill them. He remembers the A-rank monsters that he previously faced and feels as if they were being controlled. He mumbles softly a quote that says gods enjoy it when the mortals work hard. The ghost is tired of looking at the weak ones and asks Tace and if they can just run to their destination which he replies and tells the ghost that there would be no point in going to their destination first as there would be nothing else to do. He asks Taesan why not help the people straight up instead of hiding secretly and doing it as Taesan likes helping people. He responds to the ghost saying that he does not like helping people which shocks the ghost. 
the ghost asks him why he was working so hard to help the people if he didn't like it. And he says that he does not care if the others die or not, but Jungian's mental state will collapse if they die, so he is helping them as well. While the crowd and Taesang keep marching, he remembers his past life. Their Jungian is seen in the ruins all alone. He had also led some people in his past life as Jungian of the past fell to his knees in tears. He had arrived at the city hall all alone as no one else could survive that he led. There is a sunset in the city where monsters can be seen walking through the destroyed roads. The scene cuts to a woman from the crowd eating a disgusting piece of meat. The crowd is hiding in a building while eating the meat when one says that the meat is disgusting. They feel that they should have brought supplies from the convenience store. They notice Taesan sitting in the corner eating some ham with his knife. A large figure approaches Taesan and he looks up while chewing. He demands Taesan to hand him over the food, mistaking him to be a normal mode player, and tells Taesan he should be able to recognize him. He wants to beat up Taesan when they return to the labyrinth if he doesn't hand him the food and threatens that if Taesan does not comply, he will become enemies of the Athens Guild. Taesan remembers while eating about the Athens Guild that tried to control the labyrinth while bullying others. Lee is furious at Taesan for ignoring him and takes a stance to fight. A voice asks them to stop. The voice belongs to Jungian as he appears before Taesan and Lee to which the latter tells him to go away as it is a personal matter. As Lee tries intimidating Jungian as well by telling him that they didn't have to follow him, Gun grabs his face. Lee struggles to push Jungian's hand off his face as he panics and had assumed that he was a pushover who did not know anything. Gun tells him he already knew what they thought of him and tells him that he can say what he wants but not cross the line. He pushes Lee against a wall hurting Lee quite a bit. He lets go of Lee's face which finally allows Lee to breathe again as he falls to the floor coughing. Jungian tells them that he can always toss someone like Lee aside any time they cross the line. The others look at Gun with fear. They are scared to see Jungian act like that as Taesan watches in silence. Night falls and a crescent moon rises in the night. Jungian is near a fire-keeping guard. Taesan calls out to him and asks why he is guarding when he should be the one who is the most tired. Taysen approaches him and tells him that the others are scared of him and are worried that they will be tossed aside if they go too far. Jungian tells him that there is nothing they can do as there will be dangerous situations and if everyone is to survive together, they need to follow his instructions. A flashback is shown of him fighting a monster while the others look scared. He continues saying that because of Taysen the opportunity appeared for him to show it. Taysen asks him why he needs to go to such lengths which confuses Jungian. He tells Jungian that if it was only him, he could reach the city hall easily, which makes Junjian speechless. He continues telling Junjian that he should know as a hard mode player that those who are fated to live will live and to die will die. Taesan asks him why does he continues to obsess over lives that will die anyway. This annoys Jungian. He is baffled at how he can even say something like that as he starts to get up. He has a strange feeling about Taesan as if he has already seen countless deaths as Taesan is looking at him with dead eyes. He detects Taesan's eyes and feels that he is not a normal mode player. He is scared and sweating profusely as he grabs his sword ready to defend against Taesan's attack and asks him who he is. He whispers that this is the first time Gun's eyes look like that and turns away and replies to Gun by telling him that he has an objective right now and he will tell him when they reach the city hall. He looks at Taesan while sweating hard and breathing heavily. He sits down and stares in silence as Taesan goes away and wonders who he is. The scene changes to morning. Jungian wakes them up and tells them it is the next day. He tells them that within the next two hours, they will reach the city hall and the crowd is delighted as he tells them to hurry. They keep marching like the day before. There was one thing that they overlooked. The first was that the monsters only attacked the people that were going towards the city hall as three monsters were seen approaching the crowd. Gun tells them to stand behind him as they exclaim that there is a monster. The crowd are scared to see the three monsters. Jungian tells them all to run away. The people start running away while pushing and screaming. Taesan thinks that Jungian can face two of them but three was impossible for him. A child is about to get caught by the monster. Suddenly, Gun jumps in front and blocks the attack saving the child. He activates the unbreathing attack skill that allows him to freely attack for 10 seconds without needing to breathe. He slashes one of the monsters in front of him as the other scuttles forward to attack him. He uses his sword to protect himself from the monster's attack. He notices a small pouch thrown in front of him as he is being attacked. The pouch contains the powder of calmness which explodes and creates a barrier any time it touches a monster which explodes on impact. It creates a shield that repels the monsters away from good. 
Good is hopeful as he feels he can endure a bit more and buy them time as he turns around to tell the crowd. He is surprised to find the crowd still there but creating a huddle. He is shocked as to why they are not moving as he notices two more bug-like monsters appearing before the people. He realizes that they have been surrounded. The people beg him to save them with teary eyes. He looks at them and wonders why the monsters are trying so hard to finish them. He is scared and wonders if he should run away alone. He bites his teeth hoping to think of an answer. He thinks that he could make it if he just ran as his speed and strength is on par with the monsters as the scared people look at him. He starts getting sick and is holding back vomit. He does not want to throw away all the people who believe in him as he holds back his vomit. He blames himself as the people followed him there and feels that he should not have brought them here if he was ultimately going to let them die. He wonders what choice he should make there as he looks at the people in front of him. The crowd question Gun on what was wrong as he looks hopeless. He wishes that only he could die for them. Jungian is a good-natured guy but not to the point that he would risk his life dying for others as he clenches his hand at not being able to do anything. Taesan asks him what he is going to do. He is startled by the question by Taesan. He glances at him. He asks whether Taesan will criticize him as he faces his back to the monsters who scuttle towards him. Taesan brings out his frostlight sword and tells him that he will not criticize him no matter what he chooses and tells him that he is just curious as to what Gun will choose. Good is shaking as he does not want to run away and thinks that if only he was stronger. He sheds tears down his cheek as he feels that he would be able to save everyone if he was stronger. Suddenly a monster attacking him from behind is cut. He falls as another two monsters are also sliced extremely quickly by Taesan. Taesan feels that this much is enough to pass as a hobby. The others including Gun look at him with shock. A large red monster appears behind Taesan's line of sight. It appears with with mouth open with two other red monsters about to attack Taesan. He opens his eyes and punches the monsters with ease, creating a hole in them. He tells them that they should start to head for the city hall. They finally arrive at a big building which is the city hall. People finally meet their loved ones again at the city hall. One of the people there says that their group is the largest one to arrive at the city hall. They realize that Gun must have protected them for them to reach this far and quickly discover that he is a hard mode player. He tries telling them that it wasn't him when he is stopped by the hand of Taesan. He shakes his head at Gun. Gun takes credit and tells them that it wasn't much as a person comes over to guide them to the hall. They open the door and go inside. Taesan notices a lot of people have entered the hall and filled up the city hall. He notices that out of a total of 500,000 around 100,000 have survived so far. Sunlight reaches a plant in a room. Taesan is leaning on the wall. A bottle of water is offered to him as he opens his eyes. It turns out to be Gun offering him a bottle of water as thanks and calling him Mr. Taesan of solo mode. He accepts the water bottle and praises him on his unbreathing attack skill who thanks Taesan for helping him in learning it. He tells Taesan that he could not trust the community even though he learned the skill from there and believed it to be impossible. Taesan tells him that he did it because he wanted to. He gives credit to Gun for being able to gather them all together to save them as Gun gets touched by his statement. He grabs Taesan's hand and says no. Jiam tells him that he deserves thanks for his useful information on skills as well as for being his savior. Taesan is so surprised by this that he spills water on the floor. Jiam wants to follow him and will obey all of his commands as Taesan throws the bottle in his face and tells him to stop saying that stuff and act normally. Jiam starts idolizing him and calls him amazing which causes Taesan to rethink what he used to feel about Gun as he used to think that he had a friendly disposition but it was never as it is now. A lady comes over towards them and calls out Jiam. Jiam recognizes her as Kim Huyan, who is revealed to be a hard mode player. She tells him that she came to explain the current situation and asks who Taesan is. Taesan recognizes her as a lead figure in the hard mode as he was acquainted with her in his past life as well while Jiam introduces him as a solo mode player and she recognizes him as the person who spoke a lot in the community. She explains to Jiam that around 100,000 people have gathered in the city hall and the problem was that only 1,000 can fight against the monsters. They are surprised and ask why there were so few as she explains that most of them were from normal mode or easy mode and continues saying that their food reserves are also running low as well as their places to sleep were low. Jiam is surprised by this as he asks her was she not the one who would be running things as Taesan looks on. She mentions that Choi Junghyuk of easy mode was going wild claiming that he would be running things which rattles Taesan. 
Jiam asks her who were the hostages to which she replies that they were Li Tion and Kang Jun Hyuk with them being seen as hostages in the flashback. Taesan is annoyed as to why those two were the ones to be caught. She tells him that they were already captured by the time she had arrived as Taesan feels that some other problem must have occurred as they were strong enough to defeat even Jiam at this point. Jiam asks her if they could do something about it and she replies that as no harm was done, she had planned to keep watching before getting involved as Taesan refuses to comply with those orders. This is surprising news to Kim. She tells him to stop and asks him what he was trying to do and he tells her that he wants to get rid of Choi and asks her where he is currently. She asks him if he is going to commit a crime and tells him not to use violence. Taesan challenges her to hell him why not to as the world had already collapsed and the laws had no more meaning as he faces her face to face. She gets fearful but still tells him not to as it is wrong to kill people and they need to keep order. Taesan thinks that she is still the same as in his past life. Taesan goes into a flashback where he remembers her for sticking to order as the flashback shows her on the floor bleeding and Taesan walking towards her with Jiam on his knees crying. He remembers her perishing during their third return which happened because she tried to follow her own set of justice. Back to reality Kim is getting ready to face him and thinks of him as a dangerous person on around the same level as Jiam who might murder as she reaches for her sword. She thinks she can just block his attack for now as she is suddenly hit and lets out a scream in pain. Taesan punched her dealing 22 damage and knocking her out as she fell flat on the ground. Jiam yells at Taesan asking him why he would do such a thing as he tells him to watch calmly. He puts pressure on his feet such that they cause the ground to crack. He continues charging up. He leaps off and disappears leaving behind Kim still knocked out on the floor and Jiam looking after her. He wants to stop Choi Junghyuk this time as well. Meanwhile, Choi is seen atop a building sighing as he looks down. He revels in his authority. A person is seen inside Scrawny and begging Choi not to torment his family. Choi tells him that he does not want to while showing him the contract and tells him to pay up for survival. Through the window, he hears a roar and wonders what that noise is. He looks outside to see a dragon charging up a beam while the city is in ruins and he is shocked to see this. The next scene is inside the labyrinth where Choi is running away from a monster. Another player steps in to help him out and defeat the monster. He asks Choi if he is okay as Choi asks him why he saved him to which he replies that people should help each other out during these times. Choi laughs and acts like he agrees with him. In the next scene, he is seen robbing the other player after killing him as he calls them stupid. He realizes that he could make people go crazy in the labyrinth as there were no rules and order and since it is a tiny place. He wants to win over all the high-level players kill or appease any opposition and throw some reward to the ones he wins over as he is shown throwing some dolls to the ground and breaking them, the dolls representing other players. He wants to control the labyrinth. He's ecstatic to have others follow his order as it gives him an exciting feeling. The captured ones call him a coward for doing things his way. The scene shifts to the two being tied with chains to a pillar and Lee Taehyun tells him that he would have been dead already if he did not use dirty tactics. He sits down on his chair and admits to them that they are strong and admits to being lucky. A flashback begins of Choi getting teleported near the city hall and being able to get there safely without meeting any monsters. He is seen fighting a solo mode player and pins them down. These players were weak in comparison to the easy mode players as he could beat them easily. He notices that they are weak as they can only focus on survival. The flashback ends with him abusing the other player. He remembers being shocked when his current hostages arrived as they were strong. The flashback shows him threatening to kill the other solo mode player if they did not comply as Lee Taehyun is backed into a corner because of this. He calls them stupid for obeying him so easily. He points to his head and tells her that they should not have fought him whether he had a hostage or not and calls them naive for being used by other people. Taysen asks if that really is the case as he gets close to them. He blasts the door open surprising Choi. Choi looks over and as the dust settles, he sees Taysan walking towards him. He curses at Taysan and asks who he is as the hostages look in awe. Taehyun recognizes him as Kong Taysan as Kong looks calm and ready to fight. He starts walking towards them. Choi feels intimidated by him and feels that Kong is dangerous. He feels hostile intent from Taysan and does not want him to get anywhere near Choi. Hoi looks terrified as Taesan takes a step forward. He threatens to kill the hostages kept elsewhere if Taesan comes too close as he brings out a remote. Kong Taesan gets interrupted as he is about to talk by someone telling them to wait as everyone looks at the door. 
Jiam and Kim walk inside the door with Jiam supporting her. Kim tells Choi that if he does kill them, even she will not be able to remain calm and Jiam asks him what he wants. Choi sighs. He tells them that he wants safety and authority and as long as he has it, he will keep the hostages safe. Kim tells him that an easy mode player like him will never have authority and calls him ridiculous. Choi tells Kim that even though they are strong, they have never led anyone before which he has done and boasts that he controls an entire mode by himself, being the easy mode. He mocks her leadership quality by telling her that at most she has led her study group and that she cannot ignore his experience. Kim remains silent not knowing what to answer. He thinks of them as babies that are going against him and thinks of them as being naive as they could kill monsters but not humans. He believes that even Taesan cannot go against him as he cannot attack Choi in front of others and has no choice but to bend to Choi's will as he holds the remote. Kong tells him to stop being delusional as the remote in his hand disappears. Taesan smashes the remote to pieces as Choi is bewildered by this. He wonders when Kong took the emote as he could not see it with his eyes. Choi knew that as he had wronged others in the past, it could always come back to bite him back as he fell to the floor watching Kong destroy the remote. Kong looks at him with disdain. Suddenly the terrified Choi clicks a button inside his pant pockets and curses at Kong. Then a large pile of steel beams fall directly onto Taesan's head. The others look on in horror as the beams fall directly on top of him. Choi believes that Kong Taesan is done for as these beams could do significant damage to those with high defense stats. Before Choi can even finish his train of thought, multiple screens open up from the system showing Taesan taking zero damage in all of them. This makes Choi baffled as the others look surprised as well. The screen continues showing zero damage taken as Taesan appears from below the beams. Choi gets extremely terrified as he calls out for his men to come out and end Kong Taesan as he walks out from under the rubble. The door opens and two people holding swords arrive. A lot more people follow behind those two all holding swords. They rally behind Choi and get ready to face Kong Taesan. Taesan brings out his sword as he prepares for combat. Kim tries to rush over as she senses what is about to happen while Jiam holds her back. Taesan tells her that he knows what she is feeling as he is surrounded by the people of Choi attacking him and tells her that there is no use in protecting people like Choi. He begins his attack by slashing the sword. He goes through them and slashes them all, killing them while the blood splatters on Choi's horrified face. All of his men are lying on the ground as Taesan tells him that Lee Taehyun and Kang Junhyuk may have lost to these many people. He continues as he tells Choi trembling in fear that it was not the same case for him as he gets close to Choi. Meanwhile, everyone else is relaxed, some even bored. The cute ghost yawns as there has not been any news as of yet. A loud sound of the crash catches its attention. Everyone down below witnessed our boy Kang grabbing Choi, causing a mini commotion. He holds the bad guy by his head ready to drop him dead any moment. The white ghost flies up to finally see something interesting happening. Choi's life flashes before his eyes as he struggles in a compromised position. As he is trembling in fear, he questions Kong why someone like you exists. In the past, he said something like that and now he is doing the same, so pitiful that you ended up dying both times to me. This revelation leaves Choi stunned. And after that, Kong brutally pops him cold. Even Jiam and his girl are sweating bullets, seeing Kong so ruthless. He lets go off his head, bidding farewell to Choi, remarking both times you died like this. The sight of the Choi's body stuns everyone below. This causes an uproar among the people, calling Kong crazy, killer, but he looks unbothered. The crowd continues calling names as Kong makes his way from there. Then he walks towards the setting sun remembering the last time how he handled Choi. Kong was an easy mode player while Choi was the king in easy mode. After running away for months and grinding levels, he had finally managed to eliminate Choi. But now it was too easy. Gwem calls out Big Bro, catching Kang's attention. He adds things might be a bit difficult for you now. Big Sis Huyen and others are saying things about you to which Kong says it doesn't matter. Soon, they won't even be able to noisily chatter about anyway. Meanwhile, an old man slams his hand on the table. He yells we cannot stay still, he killed a person, and we must give justice under the law. The entire building is in an uproar. The old dudes pressure her into a corner in order to take action against our boy Kong. And now she's had enough, smashing the table. She says Kong had faced so many players all by himself and I cannot even handle him and you want me to punish that monster. Hearing this, the old man keeps quiet for now. But once again he adds, we cannot leave this world to be ruled by strength alone, we must oppress Kong with laws. This statement makes her visibly pissed. 
To think that the old geezer would not understand the current reality and be this ignorant is absurd. These geezers did not even go to the tower and ate all the provision food brought back by their supporters. They are good for nothing. She wonders if they were to punish him who would stand against him if this monster attacked us all then we would all die. She gulps in fear, understanding they could not even touch his hair, let alone punish him. She then comes to the realization that maybe our boy Kong knew these old geezers were good for nothing talkers. Then suddenly a system window popped in front of everyone. Even the old geezers were surprised looking at it. The special quest had started and the waiting time was 12 hours. Defeat all the enemies and protect the city hall. Miss Wioni, did you see the quest window? The monsters are coming. Since everyone was panicking, she shouted to everyone to be quiet. I will give out orders. Please be calm. Turns out the old geezers already shit their pants and ran away. This made our leader San curse at those oldies. Outside the city hall, our boy is checking his system window. Someone from behind says excuse me politely. The red armor guy and waifu San are here. He adds it's my first time seeing you in person and first off thank you, the other hostages are safe. The he awkwardly points at something. While Kong is listening, he says something like that is a hallucination right? To which the ghost answers ooh? Can you guys see me? Hello, you idiots. They recognize him from the quest, while the ghost tells I have no intention of giving you quests, so don't even bother. Meanwhile, our boy gazes at Waifu-san. This makes her flinch in fear. The sight of her previous demise flashes before Kong. While she cutely asks why are you looking at me like that, Kong faints in ignorance, realizing she is afraid of him now. He says it's nothing and nice to meet you, since there are still 12 hours of waiting time left for the wave. Kong tells them for that time I will be training you. Now, both of you draw your swords, they wet their pants hearing this. He adds Junhyuk, you are too bold, it is good to try out new things, but it is also important to know your limits. There is a fine line for that. And Lee Tion, you are too scared. Thanks to that you will be able to survive, but you will end up throwing away rewards that you could have earned. I don't want to see you die alone, that is why he sends them battle requests. In this battle, both players have equal stats. Both of them are terrified of going up against Kang. Emitting a purple aura, he says that he cannot give them answers but at least you will understand your current levels. The scared red guy adds wouldn't fighting against you be meaningless? Kong reassures them that he will not use his trigger skills and that the stats will be the same for both. You have no right to decline anyway except it. This guy gulps a big one in fear of facing Kong. But being a man, he accepted the battle even though Waifu Sen asked him if he was insane. This is an opportunity. I can prove it to him that I am not weak but sufficiently strong. Since we both have the same stats and are from solo modes, there is still a good chance. Here I come, bro. Kong similes with his sword whenever you want. Then, with full of enthusiasm, here he comes. However, Kong is standing still while he is going full strength on. With a one-handed block, Kong blocks his full power attack. While clashing, Kong twirls around his swords. This move takes the red-armored guy by surprise as Kong outplays him with the sword. And in the next instant, Kong emerges victorious leaving Waifusen speechless at the difference in fighting prowess. From the last attack, he only took 8 damage. So, they decided to keep on going. The poor guy looked in a lot of pain as a result of dueling with Kong. No matter how hard he tried, he could not block any of Kang's attacks. In the meantime, Kong closed the gap, whispering you are just a weakling in his ears. The poor guy could not hold back anymore. Filled with rage, he went for a huge swing at our boy. But as expected, he is brutally defeated by Kong, leaving him in a lot of pain. The defeat guy lays down as he tries to catch his breath. But because of his luck, the tip of the sword misses him by just a few inches. Sense, judgment ability, targeting weak points, and such physical factors make a huge difference. Your current power is not enough if you want to survive in solo mode. The defeated guy realized how such factors are important while fighting. Kong boldly declared, until you learn these lessons, I will be your opponent. Now get up. He adds, this is just the beginning. 30 minutes later, we see the sword flying along with the red armor guy. This guy is at his limit and cannot even move a finger for now, so Kong asks him, do you realize what level you are at now? With his body tweaking for the beating, he realized he sucks at his current level. This realization of how weak he is gives him a massive headache. Now time for Waifu-san, he makes her flinch saying that self-confidence is key, but you have to know your limits. Terrified, she cries out saying, I know my limits, I don't think we should fight. But Kong tells her, your problem is different, so be ready, poor waifu San can't even stand still facing Kong. Kong lunches at her, telling her to respond to this attack. Poor waifu San screams as she closes her eyes. However, with the power of her slender legs, she blocks the attack. 
and even manages to push back Kong with her fierce swing. But Kong being a chad twists his leg and counters Waifu San with his attack. She receives a heavy blow while blocking his attack for the time. She manages to hold her ground even with our boy Kong. In this scene, even the red armor guy is baffled at how Waifu San is holding her own. Now, she switched from defense to offense and even the mighty Kong is surprised at this. However, Kong lets her know her place as he grabs her by her shoulder, throwing her down like your dad when you stole money in his pocket. Victorious Kong asked Waifu San how she was as she lay defeated. Kong explained to Waifu San that she is not as weak as she thinks herself. But this does not mean that you can be too bold. This sums up their training session and Kong adds listen up I will tell you about other skills and how to clear the labyrinth so listen carefully. For now they give their full attention to Kong. This explanation continues till the middle of the night. He concludes it and urges them to share this information with other players as well. And with a serious face he tells them don't die. They are speechless rarely seeing the side of Kong. Seeing their expression, Kong asks what's wrong, to which they reply that it's rare to see the side of Kong. Finally, he tells them it's night, so go back inside and have some rest. And then they part their ways. Kong then opens his system window to see the remaining time. Only six hours if left before the next wave starts. Behind the closed doors, an armored woman is going crazy looking at all the plans. She wonders what happened. She noticed our boy standing near the window, not even realizing how long he had been inside the room. He warns her to close the windows as those with high stats can easily jump this high. Then he asks her what is the current situation, surprising her in the process. She explains that since monsters come from all directions, she divided all the personnel into four groups. Fighting inside City Hall is dangerous, so before the quest starts, everyone must go outside as planned. Kong listens attentively. She looks frustrated as she reveals that some people straight up refuse to fight and won't change their minds. Our boy boldly declares to leave one side to him and direct the rest of the personals to the other side, shocking her. She asks him if it is okay for him, I say that because I am fine with that. She thanks our boy as he opens the window. He tells her to mention not and let's meet alive again. Only 30 minutes are left until the wave starts. Everyone looked scared and extremely demotivated to fight. The beautiful leader is leading the south side of the city hall. The west side is led by the best friend San, while the east side of the city hall is led by Waifu San. And our boy Kong is alone, ready to destroy anything that comes from the north side of city hall. He meditates for a second, while the portals start to open up. Strong aura emits from the portal. System alert, special quest begins, you must defeat the enemies and stay alive. A rumble was heard across the city as Kim Huyen turned around to find something that confused her. The players noticed that a translucent green wall had appeared which had separated some players from each other. The scene pans up to show the whole city hall which has now been enclosed within the walls. A lot of rumbling is heard as monsters start to appear near the players. They notice the monsters and start to panic and beg to get saved as they start running away from the monsters. They run towards the wall as they are trying to enter the city hall and start to bang on the wall trying to get in. They push each other trying to get in but the wall would not budge. Kim looks at them and tells them not to be afraid and to come back to fight the monsters together as she starts to fight them herself. He curses a monster and slashes through it as the monster screams in agony. Another monster is seen ready to attack a player who has been immobilized due to fear as he gasps. He screams as the monster swings its tentacles ready to fight him. He screams in horror as the monster attacks him, however, the monster only deals 7 damage to Young Jun Young. Kim suddenly appears and stabs the monster with her sword to kill it. She tells the others that the attack power of the monsters is not that high and that they can survive if they are careful and calls for everyone to come together and fight as a group. The people start to believe as an old man from the crowd remembers that the rewards given out will be based on the results as the others feel that this event was actually attainable. The two talking look at each other as they make up their minds. They charge along with the rest of the crowd and start to stab and slash the monsters using their weapons. They have been completely reinvigorated as Kim looks behind, happy to have them by her side. Meanwhile, the scene changes to show a monster getting slashed multiple times on another side of the city hall. Lee Taehyung is the one skillfully slicing up the monster by herself as she along with Kang Jun Hyuk are seen fighting with the monsters themselves. Other people on that side are in awe of the strength of those two, effortlessly defeating the monsters. Kong Jun Hyuk tells the crowd that they are not that strong as Lee Taehyung nods in agreement while the crowd is confused by this response. 
Li Taehyung tells them that the actual strong one is on another side of the hall as she refers to Kang Tae-san. A splatter of blood is seen on the side of the holographic wall. The scene changes to another side where Tae-san is fighting these monsters alone. Kang Tae-san lands on the ground while holding his two swords and faces off against multiple monsters alone. He gives off bloodlust from his eyes as he glares at these creatures while dashing towards them. He slices them up as he moves through the horde of monsters one after another. As he reaches the end of the pack, he stops as the dead corpses of the monsters fall on the floor one after another. The ghost recognizes that it is too easy even though the monsters are quite a lot in number and is surprised that the other groups are struggling over something as simple as this. As Kong Tae-san walks around the corpses of dead monsters lying on the floor, the ghost asks him why the quest had not ended as he had already defeated them all. He touches the wall and tries to go to the other side. He tries attacking the wall as well while the ghost looks on. Tae-san is not surprised about the result as he had expected it to not work. The ghost tells him that the wall might be there to not let him interfere with the other groups. Tae-san tells him that they will wait it out as they are in no hurry to do so. The scene shows the other side being finally done with the monsters as a person gets on his knees, tired. They look around at each other and cheerfully yell that they are victorious give her race and high fives to each other and jump with joy. The screen message tells them that the quest is over and that the rewards will be distributed automatically upon returning to the labyrinth. Suddenly another message pops up which tells them that a special quest has started and a second message pops up telling them that a second wave will begin. This shocks the people as the screen shows the content of the quest, that being to defend the city hall from the four sides. A single monster pops out of the crack and starts to slide towards them as the people notice that only one has come out of the crack. GM looks shocked to see the monster as he seems to recognize it while someone dashes in front of him. The person dashes towards the monster as it is the only one and wants to claim the rewards for himself alone. He swings his sword with both of his arms and stabs the monster. The screen appears and shows that one damage is dealt to the monster. This surprises the attacker as the monster begins its counterattack. Half of Choi's face gets eaten as he falls to the floor. The crowd is confused as to what just happened. The monster starts to prepare an attack. Suddenly it releases a powerful shockwave towards the crowd while screaming as the people look on. The shockwave comes in contact with the crowd and annihilates them. There is panic created among the crowd as they start running for their lives while screaming in terror and people start to die left, right, and center. Ju advises them not to run away as turning their backs would only kill them in vain but he is not able to complete his sentence as he turns around to find something. He starts to shiver as he notices that the monster is starting to release another attack. He throws his sword on the floor and ducks down as a wave flies right over his head. Gun looks mortified as he looks terrified to see such an attack. He looks around to find himself between the splatter of blood as he is shocked to see this. The monster is shown again hissing as GM wonders how he is supposed to beat such a monster. The scene changes as another monster lies dead on the ground. A sword has been stabbed inside it and Tae-san feels that it is too cruel to send out a monster that can only be defeated by risking their lives while he sits on top of the monster's corpse. The people on the other side of the wall are seen unconscious, having been knocked out by the monster. He jumps down from the monster as he feels he should do what he must do with the ghost following him. He makes a stance as he gets ready to use the dash skill. He dashes through his side of the city hall as he races towards some destination. The ghost notices that the wall does not stop him from going further into their sides. They appeared before a large crack in a building with monsters facing it. He quickly swings his blade and takes the monsters by surprise as he approaches the gate. He stares at the big hole and confirms that the hole is where he expected it to be. Suddenly a special quest is given to him that tells him to destroy the vessel of the Black Swamp. He starts swinging his sword as he notices that the hole is much smaller than the one in the sky and destroying it will not solve the root cause of the problem but he wants to destroy it to reduce the number of monsters that will appear. He stabs his sword inside the crack. Something roars and blocks his attack as Taysan looks surprised to see it. A ferocious wolf-like monster appears out of the crack he notices it to be a D-rank monster. The wolf monster grabs Taysan's sword by its teeth and blocks his attack. It growls ferociously as it throws Taysan back to the ground. Taysan lands on his feet and comments that the monster is too noisy. He explains that the strength of the monsters can be judged by the number in their name that is the lower the number, the higher its rank. The monsters fought previous wave were E and F-rank monsters respectively. 
As the monster moves closer to Taysan on its four feet, he says that that monster is a D-rank one with only six digits on its name. A flashback is shown of a completely destroyed area as he explains that humans were nearly brought to extinction during waves by this monster's attacks in his previous life. The flashback ends as Taysan is gearing up to fight this monster and remembers that he could defeat this monster after his third visit back to Earth which is not the case now. He leaps forward and lunges at the huge beast that is ready to battle him. He uses both swords as the aura of two wolves comes off the sword as he tells himself that the situation right now is different from what it was in his previous life. He deals 64 and 72 damage to the monster respectively as he slashes using both of his swords directly at the monster's head. The monster picks up its claw swipes down on Taysan's position and smashes the ground. Taysan tells the monster that it is no use as he is smothered by the monster's attack. He stabs his sword on the monster's paw as the screen notifies him that he activated the complete nullification of the first attack and the complete nullification of the second attack. He freezes the monster's paw using the frost arrow as the paw gets completely frozen. The monster notices its frozen paw and brings it back, releasing Taysan who immediately leaps into action. He dashes over the monster's head as the monster is too late to respond and he tells the monster that the monster is strong and resilient. He slices the monster using his sword. The monster howls in pain when he suddenly stabs the two swords in its throat after landing in between them. He continues saying that this is nothing compared to the million health monsters that he had faced in his past life and activates fireball right at its throat. The fireball explodes in its jaw as Taysan moves back down from the monster's jaw to avoid the explosion. He lands on his hip and slides using the swords to not get any damage. He continues saying with his two swords crossed that a monster of this caliber is manageable. We travel forward an hour and Taysan is seen gulping down some recovery potions. He stands over the corpse of the dead monster and exclaims that the fight is over as the system verifies this information. He produces an icicle spearhead and then throws an ice spearhead straight into the crack. It crashes into the crack causing a loud clang. The hole starts to crumble and it disappears suddenly as it shatters. The system notifies him of his success against the monster and that the rewards will be given out upon returning to the labyrinth. He looks around for any other cracks and wonders if that is all he has to do. Then the system notifies him again that another special quest has been completed and the same thing about the reward is written there again. The ghost questions why the message popped up twice and Taysan agrees and tells him that the other directions may also be done. The scene shifts to another side as Kim is seen holding her sword pierced into the flesh of a monster and looks completely exhausted. She huffs and sighs as she is relieved that the battle has finally ended. She looks around and scans her surroundings. She wonders how many people have had to lose their lives as she kneels on top of the monster with mounds of dead people all around her and others completely wounded. Only after hundreds had lost their life that people realized that the only way to survive was to defeat the monster. Most could not even come to fight so they died a gruesome death. Kim looks depressed as she wishes that she could have done better as she is on the verge of tears. The wall starts to make a sound. People go near the wall to check what is going on. The walls go down as the people exclaim that the wave must be over for real because of the opening of the walls. Kim realizes she has to find Taysan and help him out as no one can stop the monsters alone. She starts to stagger as she is clearly hurt towards the north and calls people to be reinforced as some look on. He legs are completely shaky from fighting so long as she walks slowly while leaning on her sword as she thinks that the people cannot lose someone that important for their support. She sways and groans as she starts to fall. A hand holds her up not letting her fall. She looks up and realizes that the hand belonged to a completely unhurt Kong Tae San as he tells her that the job on the north side is finished. He praises her as he feels some improvement out of her compared to before. A lot of corpses are lying around them on the road. She comments that he is completely fine and that Kim and the others, unlike Kong, had to risk their life fighting the monster. He replies that they should have risked their lives at the labyrinth as well to be strong enough to do better. The screen congratulates everyone present for surviving and talks about the rewards being given based on their actions. The screen notifies them that they will be returned to the labyrinth in 48 hours. A lot of graves of the deceased have been made by the living as Kim tells Kand that out of the remaining 100,000 people, only 30,000 are left alive. Kim tells him that she wants him to lead the people as he is stronger and more fit to lead them as she faces him. He refuses and tells her that the people would prefer her over himself whom described as selfish. 
He continues telling her as she looks on that she cannot save everyone present and the people know that she tried her best to fight and risked her life for them. Someone calls her out from behind as she looks over. A group of exhausted and injured people ask her about what they should do now and she has difficulty in telling them what to do. Taysan puts his hand on her shoulder and tells her that it will be best for her if she gets used to people's deaths as he walks past her. She looks grim and breathes heavily due to exhaustion. She stands over a building ledge and looks down upon the crowd, ready to talk to them. As it starts raining, she tells the crowd that a lot of people died today. She continues by saying that the world that they live in now has no law and order and that the people mourning today may not live to see tomorrow. The solo level mode duo look on as she tells the people that things are not over during their current return back to Earth. She implored them to do their best to survive as she looked stern. She tells them to do it for those who have passed as people are mourning in the background with GM looking at her silently. More people are seen mourning over the graves as she calls for the people to return as strong as they possibly can to find the truth behind everything in the world. The sun shines brightly as Kong Junhyuk and Lee Taehyun call out to Taesan as they rush towards him in a hurry. Kong asks Tae if they will be back to being split up again. Taesan affirms his sentences because they are going to return to the labyrinth as he stands before a portal himself. He bids them farewell. Lee Taehyun asks him whether they will meet again. Junhyuk tells Taesan that he will get defeated the next time that they meet as Taesan and Lee are not surprised about his behavior remaining the same. Jiam calls him out and thanks him for everything and tells him that he will become stronger the next time that they meet. Kim joins the group and tells them all to survive to meet again. Taesan waves them off as he tells them those words should be spoken by him instead. He goes through the portal and he tells them that they must survive this time around. The chapter ends with him and the ghost returning to the labyrinth. We are finally back on the 10th floor, right in front of the boss room. Taesan and the ghost have been teleported back there from Earth. A screen pops up in front of Taesan as he looks on. The system notifies him continuously of his achievements and rewards him subsequently for the first wave, second wave, and the monster defeat bonus as he waits for the result. The system finishes accounting and awards him with 482 P. It explains that the P could be used for anything such as gold, stats as well as skill proficiency. Three crystals appear before Taesan which are gold, red, and blue respectively. The system tells him the conversion ratio of all the items with gold being a 110 ratio as Taesan thinks that he can get up to 4,820 gold which is quite high but it is useless in comparison to the other items. Stats are converted in a ratio of 5 to 1 ratio as Taesan calculates that he would get 96 stats which would also be a waste considering his actual stats. Finally, skill proficiency is converted in a 10 to 1 ratio which is of most use to taste San as it can only be increased by putting in time and effort. He grabs the blue crystal and chooses it. Every time a skill proficiency increases by 20%, the skill contents change. Continuous trigger detection is shown as an example with 1% giving the ability to detect the weakness of living things. 20% adds to the previous effect by occasionally alerting the user of any important information. In simple terms, the enhancement of a skill could change the skill drastically or minimally depending on the skill. As the ghost is lost in thought, Taesan calls out to him. He asks the ghost if he could hear him or not which brings the ghost back to reality and asks what the matter is. Taesan is confused by this behavior as he thinks that the ghost has been behaving strangely since coming back from Earth. He wants advice from the ghost on whether to increase the proficiency of the skill given by the ghost all in one go or not. The ghost asks if there are any other conditions as it would not be as good as moving his own body. He continues and tells Taesan that no matter how much information enters his mind, it does not matter when he has to move his body. Taesan pulls out his screen and starts to think. He looks at all the skills possessed by him as he searches for the skill that will benefit from increasing the skill proficiency. He feels that owning too many skills is also a problem as there are a lot to choose from as his eyes catch a glimpse of a skill. He lands at the skill magic whose proficiency is at 2% which only allows him to conjure up sparks currently. He wonders if he should check it out. We go back to the ninth floor safety zone where a big explosion occurs atop a tower with a spiral staircase by its side. The green-clothed magic enthusiast coughs as the room is completely smoky and she realizes that it is not the right combination. She notices a knock on her door and looks over. Taysen enters and greets her with the ghost following behind lost in thought. They talk within the building as she gasps suddenly. She is surprised that he could increase his skill proficiency by a lot at once. 
She is surprised that an outsider could interfere with the labyrinth's internal system before she could and asks him how he came across such a possibility as she could not do it as well. Taysen asks whether other people are unable to do this as well. She explains to him that proficiency is one of the major laws of the labyrinth and one can become stronger without talent but are still bound by the labyrinth's laws. She continues by telling him that even gods cannot interfere with the laws and asks how much can he increase them. He replies that he could increase it by roughly 50%. She is dumbfounded by this answer and she nearly falls off her chair with Taysan watching. She calms down and feels like that is dangerous. She warns him not to tell anyone else that piece of information as people would hunt him down for it. Taysan looks at her calmly and asks her if it is great as her reaction suggested to which she replies that people would cut off their fingers just to raise their proficiency by 1% and tells him that she is barely at 20%. She starts to explain the rest as she tells him that as the magic proficiency increases, the effectiveness of it increases. She tells him that he cannot even use low-rank skills properly with his current 2% to 3% proficiency as taste and is surprised that it could become even stronger. She continues explaining that within the labyrinth anyone can learn to use all the rank spells from beginning to peak rank but the level of magic that is used differs on the proficiency of magic as a wizard is shown using magic as an example. She tells him that he is exceptional for learning a beginner rank spell immediately as a person can only learn a new rank of spell every 20% level of proficiency. She goes on telling him about them as they would follow the same pattern from 20% to 40 to 60%. She ends her explanation hoping that it helped him make the decision. He starts to think about her explanation. The scene changes to some time in the future as Taysan and the ghost go down a staircase over to an open area. There he uses 100p to increase the proficiency of detection by 10% using the blue crystal. The detection skill could now provide additional information about the secret rooms and show the opponent's approximate stats as its proficiency had risen to 62%. His magic proficiency reaches 40% which makes him able to utilize magic properly and will allow him to control flame. He tries using fire blast which looks significantly bigger and is cast without any delay. He snaps his fingers and uses magic acceleration as he launches the fireball. It zooms off extremely fast and hits a wall, creating a huge explosion. He learns that magic acceleration increases both the speed and the power of the spell at the same time. Then he activates the frost arrow. The arrow is similar to the fireball as it's incredibly big as he casts it. Then he uses magic explosion as he throws the icicle which causes it to shatter violently causing the shards to fly around and pierce everything around it. The shards fall on the floor violently all around Taysan. Taysan looks around the room full of ice shards penetrating the floor. He grins as he gets very impressed with the two new abilities that he has gained. He finally leaves to enter the 10th floor boss room which houses a massive ogre fighter wielding a green axe. He uses the recently buffed Fire Blast Espear Lel with Magic Acceleration which hits the ogre right on its face causing 112 damage to the ogre. This momentarily halts the ogre as Taysan wastes no time and uses Confusion on the ogre and activates Magic Acceleration again which causes intense mental damage to the boss. He activates Magic Explosion finally as an explosion is seen on the boss's head. He is surprised that these skills even work with the mental attacks as the ogre trembles in fear. He tells the ogre that the fight is not over as he activates fire blast and frost arrow multiple times as the ogre is on its knees. He fires off all the spells and then casts magic explosion. All the attacks explode simultaneously causing a lot of damage continuously to the ogre fighter. The ogre fighter completely falls to the ground as the system notifies him of his victory. He has defeated the 10th boss and is granted the Ogre Ring. He feels that he can get to the 20th floor easily using the now-obtained ring as the ghost finally chimes in and tells him that magic is one of the main cruxes after all. The ghost tells him finally he thinks that he knows and wonders why someone of that caliber would go on to destroy Earth. Taysen asks him who is the one responsible for it as he glares at the ghost menacingly. Then we see an explanation by the ghost. It is explained that mortals attempt to get over their limits by undergoing trials and tribulations as an image of a battlefield in the background. A mortal can become transcendent if they reach beyond a level in a certain field through trade or faith. After they have completed their life, it is evaluated and given a domain to rule over through which the transcendent one becomes a god as an example of a person becoming a transcendent is shown. 
However, the ones who become a god through their power, when they do become one, the amount of power that they have amassed would also become fixed, as different entities are portrayed as gods. It continues telling him that the monsters invading his planet were an incredible amount, and that when any transcendent interferes with immortal, their power usage becomes massive, which is why it has never been done before, as it is a crazy thing to do. Taysan listens to its words closely. He tells Taysan that there are ones who can pull this off without using any of their power. It continues to tell Taysan that it has never encountered such an old god but has heard of some stories as they had disappeared long ago that they were known as the old gods. Taysan is surprised as he asks the ghost how they disappeared. The ghost is unsure but tells him that he thinks it is due to a war with the transcendence way back and that is the reason he could not remember them so easily. Taysan asks the ghost why someone with such power would attack Earth. The ghost replies that it does not know the answer to that question and tells him that it would still not be able to send anyone too strong as there is a limit to them not using any power. Taysan remembers the apostles sent in his past life that even Li Taehyun of his past life could not defeat and wonders why such a strong entity would appear before them. He is heard enough from the ghost and tells him that was it. They both start to go towards the secret room as they approach a door with stairs leading down. The ghost tells him that they have finally gotten this far and tells him to kill the monster inside and the quest given by him would end. Inside the room, an ogre is sitting down reading a book with a green cover calmly. He closes his book and greets them as they enter the room. The screen notifies him that they have encountered an ogre wiseman. The ogre had thought that this day would come eventually but had not expected it to be so quick and requested a final conversation from them as the ghost was annoyed. The ogre places the book atop the table as he says that he cannot hope to defeat Taysan and that if he is fated to die, he will at least satisfy the ghost's curiosity. The ghost starts to get infuriated but calms down quickly. He tells the ogre wiseman to do as he pleases, which surprises the ogre as it had not expected such an answer from the ghost as it was quite brash and proud when it was alive. The ogre searches in its pockets for something and brings it out. He brings out the weapon he had used to kill the ghost's original body. He remembers that being the reason that the ogre wiseman had not died at his hands and calls it the ghost's mistake as a flashback is shown of them talking while the ghost's former self is talking gleefully to the ogre. It tells the ghost that it has just fulfilled its duty as a monster which is to kill the adventurer as it points its blade towards the ghost. The ghost starts to get angry and wants Taysan to kill him quickly but he declines the ghost. Taysan's answer surprises the ghost as well as the ogre who had just thought of him as being the ghost's puppet and thinks of him differently. He starts to walk over to the ogre and asks him who gave the weapon to the monster. The ghost suddenly realizes something as Taysan continues to ask him about the fixed damage weapon that a 10th floor monster should not be able to obtain. He asks again who gave it to the ogre as the ogre looks on. He smiles creepily and realizes that he is the one who has changed the ghost. He asks the ghost if he can form a connection as a lot of people did dislike him when he was alive, which was not only the ogre but also the other adventurers as well. This suddenly makes the ghost realize who it might have been. The ogre mentions the guide of crime as a flashback of a hooded figure giving the ogre a weapon. It continues to tell them that it had been threatened to kill and had no choice but to accept. This makes the ghost completely infuriated and curses the guide of crime out, which causes the whole room to shake. Taysan remembers the name Guide of Crime from Li Taehyun in his previous life. The ogre tells them that they were too afraid of the ghost and decided to take the help of a monster to kill him as they were afraid. The ogre tells them that he has said everything that he needed to and surrenders. Taysan brings out his knife and points it at the ogre's throat as the ogre tells them that he is weak and has already survived for long enough by befriending many through the art of speech. However, it knows that everything comes to an end as Taysan stabs him with the knife as he looks at the ogre. The ogre tells Taysan that strength is the key in the labyrinth for him to remain unbothered by anybody and begs him to get stronger. Taysan agrees to that point while stabbing him to death. The ogre wishes him to free all of them from that place after conquering all of the labyrinth. It falls on the ground defeated by Taysan. The system notifies him of the victory against the ogre and tells him that he has completed floor 10 as well. The entities in the labyrinth have started to notice Taysan and will act hostile or friendly towards him as some entities are shown looking over him. The system notifies him of receiving the tip of disaster, the weapon which was used to kill the ghost as the knife lies on the floor. As the ghost looks at his murderer's demise, he is conflicted about whether to feel thankful or hateful. 
It then rewards Taesan as its quest is now completed. It gives him the sword called the Sword Imbued with the Blood of its Ancestors, a relic which gives the wielder 20 attack points and an additional 10 points of attack when facing a royal opponent. The ghost offers up the sword and tells Taesan that the sword has killed quite a bit of royalty, including his father, which surprises Taesan as he had not expected to receive such a good weapon so quickly. The ghost is not finished as he continues to talk. He gets furious as he is angry at the ones who put the hit out on him, calling them the ones who stopped conquering the dungeon to be too busy self-rationalizing, and a subquest is offered to Taesan. The ghost wants more revenge and the quest is to kill everyone involved with the killing of the ghost with an uncertain reward. He wants Taesan to completely get rid of everybody involved with his death. Taesan tells him that they will be traveling together, then to which the ghost replies that it is not that bad as he also gets to see how far Taesan goes. Taesan accepts the quest. The scene shifts to another place with cliffs and water below it as someone is thinking. A hooded figure is looking down from the cliffs. He wonders if there are any useful new players as he is seen to be a member of the Guide of Crime. Then we shift to a short story about a group of adventurers, tired of the labyrinth's cruelty, deciding to work together and form their group. The group is known as the Guide of Sin. It is further explained that the group chose to become stronger by leeching off the labyrinth instead of challenging it normally. They murdered anyone who was not a part of their group or adventurers who tried to oppose them. Our main character is seen crushing up some bones by stepping on them. The 10th floor boss is seen to be a skeleton knight who has just been defeated by Taesan. Its corpse remains on the ground. Taesan asks the ghost if the Guide of Sin members were stationed at the lower floors of the labyrinth, to which the ghost replies unsure of the answer. He explains to Taesan that their leaders and bosses are stationed on the lower floors while the lower rank ones can be seen throughout the entire labyrinth. Taesan realizes that he can meet with the lower ranks as he progresses. Taesan wears his gear, which was dropped by the defeated monster, which is the counter-attack bracelet, which gives plus 5 defense and gives the user a 1% chance to counter the enemy's attack, the ogre ring, which provides plus 15 strength and the dead man's ring, which is the item dropped by the skeleton knight. Even with the danger of the guide of sin, he continues to move down to the lower floors and starts moving along with the ghost. He reaches floor 12. A green undead monster appears and attacks Taesan. It is named the Rotten Ghoul. The ghoul is surprised as he gets cut down by Taesan's sword. Taesan realizes that the 12th floor houses ghouls like the 11th floor houses the skeletons. It seemed that every 10 floors, the theme of the labyrinth changed and the theme of floors 11 through 20 was undead as the floor is seen to contain multiple graves on it. Taesan feels that due to the theme being undead, he smells disgusting as he opens up a door. As he opens the door, he is surprised to see the contents of the door. The door contains a statue holding a scale as the system notifies Taesan that he has reached the altar of Maria. He thinks that the altar looks very simple in comparison to Lakataraza's altar as he goes in to look closer. He asks the ghost about what kind of goddess Maria is to which the ghost replies that she is the goddess of choice as he thinks. The ghost goes and takes Scout out of the statue properly and tells him that it does not know what Taesan's trials may be as the trials he faced might be different from what Taesan might face and tells him that the goddess is extremely powerful. He looks at the statue and thinks for a while. Then he proceeds to touch the statue to begin the trial as it would not matter to him whether the gods may be strong or weak. The system notifies him of the start of a subquest as the goddess wishes to test him, Taesan, and offers up a reward for victory. The statue starts to smile as Maria offers him an empowered trial. This surprises Taesan as she is offered the empowered trial directly and the ghost explains to him that the rumors of Taesan's strength have already spread amongst the gods and they don't have to test out his strength. He agrees on the empowered quest as the system notifies that the goddess lets out a giggle and another screen appears. The screen gives Taesan two choices and asks him which one he prefers. The scales have two choices, one being many enemies and the other being fewer enemies. As this is the first time Taesan has been given a choice to select, he does not know which to choose, thinking that the choices would not make a difference. The ghost tells him to do as the goddess says and choose whichever one he likes. He chooses the fewer types option as he is presented with another choice that asks him if he wants more freedom in moving or none as he chooses more freedom. The choices continue coming and he answers all of them honestly. The goddess seems content with the choices made by Taesan as the statue starts to smile. Suddenly, the scales clatter together as golden dust falls from them to the floor in front of Taesan. 
Taysan notices the room expanding around him. He hears some snarls coming from behind him as he turns over to look at what is making those sounds. A lot of different types of monsters start to appear as part of Maria's trial. He realizes that he has not fought with any of these monsters before him as the monsters surround him. The system notifies him that he will die if he moves out of a red area beneath his feet as the monsters stare at him menacingly. He is frustrated with that restriction as the monsters start to charge at him. He activates the unbreathing attack as the monster attacks him from all sides ready to attack him. He brings out both blades, the Frostlight Blade and the one given by Rakaradas. He jumps up and freezes the monster closest to him and performs a slash attack on the monster. He easily slices through a lot of the enemies. He wonders why she is called the goddess of choice as she had given him the exact opposite of what he had chosen as he defeats a fanged goblin-like creature. He throws the creature behind him which also hits another monster, taking them both out. He notices something casting at the side. He notices a robed skeleton casting some magic using a crystal ball that is glowing purple. He flicks a weapon towards the skeleton. The skeleton is hit straight in the head which causes it to stop the chanting as Taysan finally realizes something. He finally realizes that he has to win in the worst-case scenario and risk everything to win. He activates the proof of combat skill which makes him stronger the more battles he wins. He tells the monsters that he will show them as he charges up a big fire attack. The monsters start to rush towards him again and he releases the attack. It lights up the attacking monsters and the other monsters waste no time and try to attack Taysan. He crosses his sword to receive an attack used by a giant green ogre. The ogre swings its club down at Taysan. His foot reaches the edge of his restricted zone as he activates the power strike skill. This launches a shockwave that pushes the ogre back. The other monster takes this opportunity to attack from the side facing Taysan's back. Another robed skeleton is seen chanting something as icicle spears form at the top of Taysan's head. He grips the tail of a snake and the dragon looks like a monster and pulls it. It brings a green humanoid lizard man with it as the skeleton that casts the magic looks surprised. The attacks targeted at Taysan get redirected to these creatures as they pierce them. Taysan looks over to his side. He watches as a lot of monsters are gathered there ready to attack him. He takes his stance to fight them, comments that they are swarming as how ants do and taunts them to attack him. In the next scene, we see an exhausted Taysan who has fallen on the floor, kneeling. He looks extremely tired after facing off against the horde of monsters. He looks around the mounds of dead monster corpses surrounding him and wonders if it is over. He looks to the side and notices something approaching him as a pair of red armored legs are seen approaching Taysan. It turns out the last opponent that he needs to face is the Death Knight holding a sword and completely clad in red armor. He remembers Li Tion telling him that the 20th floor boss was the Death Knight and he notices it wearing an ornament on its neck. He wonders if the Death Knight used to be a servant, just like Lakarada's a servant. Taysan notices more monsters approaching him. As he comes face to face with four Death Knights, he wonders why there are four of them with the same necklace ornament. He brings out his knife of self-harm and slashes himself, causing him to recover 500 health as the knife drinks his blood. His sword shines brightly as he points it towards the monsters. He tells them to come at him and gets ready to battle. He quickly activates Deflect as the knights start to attack him and activates Deflect a couple more times as he barely dodges the monster's swing. The monsters attack him from all sides and he is forced to parry their swords. As he keeps deflecting the Death Knight's swords, he knows that there is a limit to blocking the attacks of all four knights at once. Suddenly, he uses the skill called Forced Battle which creates an area around him and one of the knights to battle the knights one-on-one -on -one instead of one-on-four. He activates the skill called Power Strike and lunges forward to attack the Death Knight. The Death Knight realizes that he cannot let the attack connect on him and quickly jumps out of Taysan's strike. Taysan curses the restriction put on him and starts to conjure Fire Blast and the Frost Arrow. He uses Magic Acceleration as he launches the Fire Blast and the Frost Arrow and the Death Knight starts to run away. It dodges all of his attacks. Taysan knows that he cannot face them in this manner and wishes that only he could fuse sword arts and magic as the Death Knights get ready to attack him. One of the monsters quickly lifts its sword, ready to strike him down. Taysan lets it hit him intentionally as the sword pierces his chest. He grabs the Death Knight's hand and tells it that it has been caught and he activates force to battle again. The other knights cannot enter the area due to forced battle being activated. 
Taysan uses the skill's unbreathing attack and power strike and stabs his sword straight into the Death Knight's neck, defeating it. The Death Knight falls to the ground as Taysan is victorious. Taysan is at a tenth of his health due to the previous attack and he knows that it may be impossible to use the same tactic again. The forced battle area fades away and the three remaining Death Knights enter, ready for battle. Taysan knows that in a three-on-one situation, he can no longer take any hits. He blocks two of the knights with his dual swords, one knight's attack blocked in the front and the other in the back. He knocks the third knight back. He uses the same technique as he avoids getting hit and repeats the process. He looks extremely exhausted fighting all of them at once since he had also been fighting nonstop from the beginning. He wonders if his attacks were too rough and uses Sword of the Scarring Storm, First Sword Wolf Fong, taught to him by the Ghost, on one of the Death Knights. He needs to attack in a flurry like a storm and needs to scratch at the body like a wolf while putting a lot of pressure. The Ghost notices something on Taysan as he fights the Death Knights. The Ghost notices that Taysan's movement until now was all stiff and heavy. Suddenly, Taysan closes his eyes as he thinks about making the sword more fluid while still keeping the killing intent intact. He moves his sword around gracefully while slicing the Death Knights. The Death Knights flinch at his sudden movements and they start to attack him while he still wants to make his swing softer. He opens his eyes as he has finally had a feeling of his sword's fluid strokes and he starts to swing his sword. Ghost is amazed by Taysan as he was hoping to teach him about the technique, but he learned it by himself without needing its help. He crushes the monsters with ease with his new mastery of the technique. He asks the ghost what the sword art is called. The ghost explains that the technique is called Sword of the Scarring Storm, Second Sword, Dancer's Steps. He explains that the wolf's fang is a barrage of attacks, while the dancer's steps is a fluid attack to eliminate the enemy with less rough movements and more optimized movements. The ghost asks him whether he likes the move or not, and Taysen calls the move incredible. The system shows a description of the skill as a high rank skill called Sword of the Scarring Storm with his proficiency being at 22%. Taysen thinks that he cannot call the dancer's steps stronger than Wolf's Fong as they have opposite styles and the ghost wonders if pushing him to his limits will help him grow faster. The system notifies him that he has passed Maria's trial and that the goddess Maria is extremely happy with his honest choices and results. He received the shape-shifting weapon along with the trigger skill called the Freedom of Choice as an additional reward. Maria also offers him an apostle contract, which he refuses instantly. Laughter is heard around the room as the ghost feels that the flow of power in the room has changed. Maria's absurd choice activates as one of the scales starts to pour out dark substance all over the room. The screen notifies him that he has received Maria's invitation and is given a choice. Both the choices given to him are accept invitation. He wonders what is happening as the room goes dark. He starts to spam click the accept invitation option to quickly get out of the room. The system tells him of the force choice that he has accepted the invitation. The system notifies him that the world is becoming inverted. The final notification he gets is the Pantheon greets you. Then, Taysen opens his eyes and finds out that he has been transported somewhere else. The place is completely dark with the stars shining in the sky as the ghost starts to tremble. The ghost is trembling with fear as he mutters to himself that a god inviting someone should be impossible. He is baffled at how this can even happen. Taysen looks at the ghost and watches him in fear for the first time. Taysen stands up and starts to walk. A big building in the structure of the Greek pantheon is standing in front of him and he wonders if that is the place he is supposed to be in. He starts to walk inside as the ghost tells him that he should not enter there thoughtlessly, to which Taysan replies that the gods invited him themselves and also that he wants to see the gods. As he keeps walking, he notices it as an endless corridor with jewels scattered beautifully on it. He continues walking. He then looks up to find that he cannot even see the ceiling as it is so far high. He looks up at a massive figure appearing before him and he wonders if he can call the goddess of this temple in existence from his world. A huge blonde goddess looks down upon him as he has these thoughts. The goddess is introduced to be the goddess of choice Maria who looks at Taysan and the ghost while lying down in the corridor. She tells Taysan that she is glad to have met him. Taysan's system runs confusion checks, fear checks, the instant death check as well as madness checks. All checks are cleared as the ghost gasps behind him. The ghost starts to get distorted as it coughs and wheezes. Taysan asks the goddess why she would do something like that to the guest invited by her. She giggles and then releases the ghost from the torment. The ghost huffs and coughs as it thanks her for showing him mercy. 
She stares at the ghost and tells him that it has been a while since their last meeting, which was described as an unfortunate meeting by the goddess. The ghost gulps, feeling scared. She flicks her hair and introduces herself as Mari, the goddess of choice, who forces one last choice on people who have reached that place after a repetition of awful choices. She welcomes Taysan to her temple while he looks on silently. Taysan can feel her power crawling on his skin and can sense that it is beyond his reach as he is bewildered to think that there are hundreds of existences like her. The ghost asks permission from the goddess to ask a question and she accepts his request and permits him to do so. He asks her how is it possible for mortals to get invited to the temple of gods. She answers his question by saying that while a mortal cannot handle a god's presence, that matter can be solved by the gods themselves. She stretched her arm out and pointed at the ghost. She continues explaining that the reason that no mortals were called was because they possessed no value to the gods. Then she just presses her finger on the corridor floor right next to the ghost. The floor near him gets crushed completely as the ghost watches in fear. Taysen asks the goddess if that means that he has any value as the ghost scolds him for being rude. She giggles and tells him that he does have value and that she wants to meet him directly. She tells him that among the ones who accepted her trials and overcame them, there was nobody who could complete her enhanced trial until Taysan accepted it and completed it. He asks her what would have happened if he had lied in the trial. She tells him that if he had lied, she would not have been happy at all as she looks at him intimidatingly, even causing the ghost to flinch. She tells him that the ghost did lie to her in the past and the ghost laughs shakily. She caresses Taysan and asks him if he does not have any intention of becoming her apostle. She tries to sell him the benefits of being her apostle which include getting to travel down to the labyrinth as her apostle and anything that he wishes for will become true and no one can speak against him. He bows down and apologizes, refusing her offer. She says that she respects his choice, which is not a bad choice. He requests to ask the goddess another question and she permits him to do so. He asks her how much the gods know about him, which surprises the goddess slightly. She giggles at this question. Then she says that this was not his first time and says that he had used what the snake spit out. She pities him and calls him a poor thing for going to the wrong place due to deceit, which surprises him as he asks if he was caught up in a deception. She tells him that it cannot be called anything but deception as he was unable to go to the correct place and someone made Taysan suffer there. He thinks if she was talking about the other different modes of the labyrinth and feels that she knows about it. He wants to question her again but is interrupted by her giant finger. She tells him that the question he wants to ask cannot be answered until he becomes an apostle of hers as it is a story that is their flaw. Taysan silently thinks about it. Suddenly, the temple starts to crack as something seems to be interrupting them. The temple starts to rumble and the goddess tells him that their meeting must end now as something annoying has arrived. She tells him that they will meet again later as he starts to get transported back to the labyrinth. She waves him goodbye as Taysan and the ghost fall down the hole. Taysan notices something red in the sky as the goddess taunts it by asking if it is angry and tells it that it should have moved first when it had the chance to do so. She tells it that it made her want to play around with Taysan as well. Then, Taysan crashes back at the labyrinth. At the same time, the ghost wonders what kind of entity just appeared. Both of them stare up and wonder what that was just then. Taysan thinks that he has just thought of raising his stats in the labyrinth until now to be even higher than that of Lee Taehyun and the man searching for his god. He grips his hand as he continues thinking that leveling up is his goal until he talks with the goddess. He remembers her saying that the other modes were fake and wonders if he does achieve everything possible in the real labyrinth, would he be able to face gods with the power? The chapter ends with Taysan muttering that he wants to try it.